Hey, hey, my legendary gaming crew. It's your all-time favorite host, Kronos, back with another adrenaline-pumping episode of What If. How's everyone doing? I hope you're ready for more electrifying action because today, we're diving headfirst into part 6 of What If Deku Has Video Game Powers? Can you believe it? We're still going strong, and this episode promises to be a game-changer. With heart-racing quests, jaw-dropping power-ups, and friendships that'll warm your pixels, get ready for an epic ride like no other. So, grab your virtual controllers, level up your excitement, and let's delve into the next chapter of this incredible adventure. Chapter 8 Live and Learn Pixie Bob had to admit, in just one day the Midorias had changed many dynamics within the compound, night had not been different. Night usually was spent having a light dinner and discussing the regiment for the next days, from tasks that including the maintenance of their gear, to light training in group and checking for any emergencies that might be flagged to them. This time it was different, most of their work had to be done before, like when they have the heroes in training because their attention can't be divided, sure they have Ragdoll and her quirk, but they cannot always depend on it, being prepared was the overall motto for rescue teams and rescue heroes in general. It had been Aizawa that had begun detailing the training regime, during dinner. A delicious dinner mind you, it's not that they can't cook, the four combine can cook some good food that fills the belly and invigorates the soul after a hard day of training, but there's something special about home cooked dinner made by a loving housewife and mother. A mother that was once special forces, even if she didn't ever deployed, if her files were correct and could mess someone so bad that death was a better alternative. True she was rusty, but Pixie Bob would never dare mess with Inko Midoriya, especially if she has a knife in hand. So, we start with Psychical, you are a noodle. Aizawa all but bluntly stated, Izuka for his part looked rather, embarrassed by that. But he punched someone as big as Tiger Quinn. Eri proclaimed, eating slowly and savoring the taste of homemade katsudan, a delicacy that she would come to love. That was the light enhancing me Eri. Titans are supposed to be able to do what I did with ease. There's this tale about how Saint Fortina Titan caved the head of the Kel of House of Devil with a headbutt, and he was in perfect shape, well as well an exo can be, but the point stands, getting some muscles would help, and maybe extra stamina. No hero is out of shape. Izuka reasoned. Also go for the pork, pork's life. He advised Eri, who instantly went for the piece of meat. He's right on both accounts, Tiger said with a grin. He has strength, but it never hurts to have more. The devil's on the details. There are training methods that can turn you into a massive muscle, or they can train different muscles, making you leaner. It's all about what you want. I personally would go for number two, speed over strength. Make them believe you are a speedy guy that can't take a hit and only land weak ones, only to land one devastating one. I assure you, their faces of surprise never gets old seeing. Tiger stated with a grin, digging on the katsudan. Also go for the rice, good fiber. Don't forget the soup itself. Kota muttered. And what's a kel? A gigantic four-armed leader of an army of aliens. The tallest can be at least 15 feet tall. The tallest know was Skolas the Rabbit. He carried a scorch cannon, a bazooka. He died in the prison of elders for defying the Queen of the Awoken and betraying her trust. His death was the soft prelude to what would be known as the Taken War against Oryx, the Taken King, God King of the Hive. Izuka mentioned. You promised you would end the story tonight, Eri muttered. I want to know what happened to the Worm Gods. The pussycats looked at Eri and Izuka oddly. Eri likes stories, Inko supplied, while eating her own food. Worm God, Mandalay muttered. She finds stories about eldritch beings soothing, Inko muttered. Look, it's already hard to find bed stories that don't have quirks embedded into them and change so much that there are five versions of them. I mean the Little Mermaid has at least 25 versions. How that happened? Back on topic, Aizawa stated loud enough to be heard. The physical goes to you too, Midoriya-san, he stated. I'll be blunt, you're overweight. I've seen you struggle with your breath sometimes. I don't know how you didn't collapse during your escape, but at the very least you need to lose some weight before the month's over, he said. 
You know I can melt your face, right? Izuka muttered with a glare. Oh, relax, dear. I don't mind, he is right. Inko admitted. I blame Adrenaline for pulling out that escape. Honestly, Eri Chans is in better shape than me. But you're pretty. Eri muttered, biting on the pork. Thank you, dear. But I wouldn't mind returning to a more non-restrictive form. I never struggled for air before. But that day I did. Heck, that nemesis that attacked us in our home. Had I been in top shape, I would have taken them down. Or at the least wound them further. I am so rusty. Inko admitted. Good, also, Eri. So said girl looked up at Aizawa, and he resisted the urge to pat her head and place cat ears on her head. She was just that cute. Tomorrow we test your quirk. We have to understand what you can do. The girl seemed to shrink down, not liking the idea, or downright fearing her own quirk. And now Aizawa had the feeling of wanting to punch overhaul until his head was gone into a fine red mist, then toss the corpse into a trash compactor. Do not worry, there are six adults here, five of them with experience with volatile quirks. I can shut down your quirk if it gets out of control, and problem child here can do the same if I can't, you'll be fine," Aizawa assured. Also, don't fear your quirk, it's a part of you, like your stomach and your pancreas. I'm not good at this. We noticed, Pixie and Inko stated at the same time. I don't like it, it hurts people, it hurts me. Eri muttered as she rubbed her forearms, where her scars were. Look, Eri chan, I know you don't want to deal with it, considering. Izuku admitted, knowing full damn well why she had her scars and why she was afraid of her own quirk. But if you don't deal with it now, it will become a problem, Izuku said. It's okay to be afraid, but you can't let it control you, rule you. Eri didn't seem convinced. So Izuku tried another approach. Did you know what was the first thing I thought when I discovered my quirk? Izuka wondered. I'm Dragonborn, he said. What has to do with mine? Eri wondered, so did the adults. Everything, because the first thing I thought after that was oh god I'm going to eat someone's soul and I'm going to end up fighting a dragon it was scary. Izuka confessed. Everything the Dragonborn is and was, is mine now, all the good, and all the bad and has added more powers, so grew the things that worried me. Will I end up like the Dragonborn? Always on the lookout for the next adventure, unaware of the enemies I made. Will I break like Raiden and become psychotic, just for a power boost? Will I end up like every guardian? Consumed by the darkness? Will I end up like Amara? Obsessed with the next fight on the horizon? Will I end up like Aya? Afraid of my own powers and unable to connect with people? Izuka confessed, looking at Eri. It's okay to be afraid, just don't let it control you. My life was always being afraid, even after my quirk triggered. In the Colosseum I was afraid, but I didn't let it control me. Don't let the fear of your quirk control you. It is yours, you are in control. Izuka said, reaching for Eri's hand and grasping it. Also, we will be here. Making sure you don't overextend yourself, we got a whole month to learn, so don't worry. He added with a small smile. There Eri simply looked at Izuku, then sighed, focusing on her katsudan. Okay, she said as she chewed the pork and swallowed it with a small smile. But make it safe safe, she said. Also I want to know about the beast, she said tonight, she added with a pout. Okay, we skip the worm gods tonight. Shouldn't be worried that her bedtime stories are about eldritch beings? Pixie muttered slash asked. Meh, was the apparent consensus. Or at least Aizawa's apparently as long Eri was happy and mollified, he was okay with it. As long it didn't interrupt his sleep he would be okay. Tap twice if you weren't worried he dropped that heavy shell just to calm Eri. Mandalay mentally asked, getting two taps from her team and Aizawa. To be honest it was kinda worrying he had all these thoughts, and yet he kept onward. It was more concerning now than ever. It was obvious he had his issues. They never expected them to be this deep. After that the dinner went in peace, with the odd comment of Aizawa and Mandalay about the next day training regime and the schedule for the next six weeks. Izuka would be lying if he said he wasn't excited. He'd get to train with pro heroes. How cool is that? The next day. Aizawa had seen many bizarre things in training, 
when a bunch of teens with volatile powers get huddled together in a closed environment, things tend to blow up, or melt, or float, or disappear into the ether, never to be seen, or all, at the same time. Never has he seen a noodle of a kid actually do a hundred push-ups and then start doing squats, without stopping. He has seen boys that are pretty much the definition of beefcake muscles that bulge with each movement and can do exactly this. But all that had been thanks to training, hard training, sometimes quirks that permitted them to function to a certain level. He has seen kids trying to pass their limit when it was obvious it would hurt them. At first glance the kid, Izuku would be unable to do more than 20 push-ups. He simply wasn't that well trained. It showed, he was lanky and there was some gut on his belly. It was telltales of someone that didn't do much exercise, but it was somewhat obvious his legs were a little more defined than expected of someone like him. Maybe he ran more than the norm. Yet here he was, doing squats like nothing. Of course they did warm-up exercises. It would be highly irresponsible to try exercises without doing warm-ups. And despite the kid being able to heal himself he didn't want to abuse that. It could easily become a crutch that could cripple his ability to work efficiently. He would become dependent of it. Then again he seemed that he had no choice. His quirk seemed to be always on assuring that the rest of his abilities would remain active. There didn't seem to be any way to turn them off. The projector back at the Colosseum seemed to be the only thing able to stun them. And even then it seemed that the effects his quirk and new powers had to his body were permanent. His voice remained as powerful as before. The tattoos didn't disappear. He assumed that he still was able to produce that unholy amount of specialized adrenaline but unable to tap into it, and his connection to the light was still there. His quirk was always on, and everything he would get would remain permanent. It was an oddity. Most quirks you could turn off, and in the event they could not be turned off, you could deny most of their aftereffects with specialized gear. His seemed to simply ignore all that. He seemed to have a superb control over the majority of his powers upon acquiring them, but they were weak, at least in his admission. His parasite energy seemed to be too basic. But Aizawa had seen a showcase, a digital one, of the powers at their maximum expression. Izuku assumed as well as he did that training and constant use and experimentation would make them flourish to their full power, perhaps even evolve further. In his admittance, Izuku said that what he could do with the light was something no other guardian could, mix and match powers from other classes. Hacks indeed, it sounds more like a super cheat than a quirk. Aizawa thought as he saw Izuku do his squats with ease, finishing up the 100 with the same ease. This is odd, Izuku muttered. I feel the burn, but it is not as pronounced. It might be the light, or maybe parasite energy. Aya seemed to be able to get full benefits of anything she ate. Maybe my cells are working with what I have now. Izuku muttered, bringing a hand to his chin. This alone chances everything. I could easily speed up training while having a steady source of food for my cells, but that would mean trying to identify what benefits me the most. Let's try to keep that as a last resort. Stick with normal training and be glad you can't feel the burn now. Aizawa said then he smirked. But I'm sure you will do feel it tomorrow. He added with some snark. And here I thought midnight was the sadist. Izuka muttered cupping his hands and letting a steady stream of arc energy travel between fingertips. Oh she is, I just don't wear mine as a disguise. You say it like if it was something to be proud of. Izuka muttered as he clenched his fists and let his arc energy die out. I can tell when I'm using arc energy or myopobis or necrosis. I think I can combine them both for something more devastating, but I should test it first. Izuka mentioned as he rolled his neck. Good enough for me. Tiger suddenly pipped in. Just saw your mother doing some jogging with Pixie Bob. She is determined I give her that. But she is out of shape. He added with a grimace. She's going to feel this tomorrow. Well, at least the hot springs will soothe her pains, I hope. Izuka muttered. He was not ready to see if using healing on his mother or the well of dawn would help with sore muscles. You got healing options. Mandalay said from the sidelines. Isn't that why you chose the light and parasite energy? Healing quirks are rare, even more those that heal without any backdraw to user and target. 
Mandalay said, knowing full well that the Well of Dawn was perhaps the most valuable asset Izuku had for anyone. She and her team had been exposed to it. So did Aizawa. The sheer power to heal pretty much any kind of physical wound and exhaustion was something any hero team would kill to have. And so would villains. There she scoffed. She knew villains would try to get to Izuku once they discover he is a healer. But the small detail they would learn quickly. The sword he impales on the ground to cast the Well of Dawn can be used also as a weapon. A weapon she wished no one to be on the receiving end. Fire that burns to the molecular level. She is sure that someone would have to invent a category for that kind of wounds made by that kind of fire. Enough talking, Aizawa stated. We are wasting time as it is while pondering what if Smitaria, 50 laps, Tiger will accompany you to outline the first lap, then you're on your own. Izuku nodded and looked at Tiger who simply cracked his neck and began jogging at a moderate pace. Moderate being running, one Izuku followed with ease. 50? Really? Mandalay asked to her fellow hero. He made a hundred push-ups and squats, hardly broke a sweat and wasn't breathing hard. Either the light grants him enhanced resistance, or his new power set has imbued his cells to ultra-manage energy consumption. Either case works for us. We can speed up. Aizawa answered simply. You do know there is a tomorrow, and tomorrow he is going to feel this. Mandalay stated. If he wants to be a hero, he must be willing to push himself harder than the norm. This is basic warm-up exercise for the first years. Aizawa stated to an eye-rolling Mandalay. I know that, you're just enjoying the fact someone seems able to follow your insane training regime and don't even complain. Aizawa simply shrugged his shoulders. But he was in fact happy, he didn't show it, it might somehow summon Mrs. Joke. But the fact remained, so far it all has been a strange set of events that landed one after another in a perfect shape, it made him worry, things like this tend to go crazy afterwards. Two hours later. Your kid's a monster. Pixie Bob muttered to Inko, handing her a plastic bottle filled with water. That's gasp, not a gasp, thing to say gasp, what a mother's nearby. Inko gasped as she took the water and drank it in small sips, as she was taught to many years ago in basic. Besides, she continued, taking small sips. Aren't all heroes monsters when it comes to physical? Well, we are humans in the end. We have our limits. Also, there's the fact your son's 14, Pixie stated. Most kids that are training to be heroes can't do half the things he is doing. The teens we get here, we push them to the edge, but we are mindful that their bodies can take so much, so we always switch, one day physical. The next quirks, and we repeat the process, quirks are muscles as well. You can have two quirk users with the same kind of power, but the one that uses it more will develop it further. That's what we do here for two weeks with the students of several schools. Pixie mentioned, so, not only you, eh? Inko mentioned, seeing her son practicing what seemed to be grappling moves with Tiger and Eraser Head. Nope, the top three schools send us their hopefuls. It is tiresome, and we have to clear our schedule for at least two months. But it is worth it. We are preparing the next generation. She stated with a small smile. Yeah, Inko muttered. Yet I worry. Pixie scoffed at that. Worry? Try a landslide site with a town nearby and a natural gas line nearby and then talk to me about worry. She said then sighed. But I guess this is a different kind of worry. I'm no mother, so I don't know much about worrying about a son or a daughter. Your family, you got the right to worry. But in the end you can't do much. Pixie said with a small frown. Your kid's strong, and not in the quirk sense. I read the medical file sent to us after the Colosseum raid. Your son somehow powered on against an onslaught of monsters, while having a broken leg on a cast and a strange cocktail of drugs that should have killed him, he had burn marks that should have been bullet holes. He took on a Terminator doll and lived to tell the tale. If something your son has is determination, this business is all about parts. Quirks play an important part in our job, but being smart and determined are important as well. Your son's gonna make some waves when he debuts as a hero. Pixie Bob said with a small smirk. Inko simply shook her head at that. But honestly she knew that Pixie was right. Her son was going to shake everything he came across, when the time's right. Okay, I think's that enough for you today, 
rest and go pick Eri Chan. I'm gonna set the barriers up. It's time we see what she can do. Five minutes later. Eri was nervous. She had reasons to, of course. The last time she activated her quirk, someone stopped being around. As in there were just clothes left behind. She hated it, mostly because she assumed that it was one of the reasons she was tortured. Yet, she had to do it, mostly because they were right, somewhat. At one point she would have to learn how to use it, just to prevent unwanted accidents. So she could learn how to turn it on and off at her own volition. It was expected for people to at least know how to turn their powers on and off. She at least wanted to learn how to turn it off so she doesn't cause accidents. So here she was, outside, after a healthy breakfast, and a liberal amount of apples she stood outside the house slash compound, flanked by two rock walls that formed an alley that lead to the forest near the house slash compound. Behind her stood the man that had been training Izuku. His hair made him kinda intimidating. Not in the way overhaul was intimidating, she simply knew he could cancel quirks, but there was something about him. Shaking her head Eri focused on Izuku, he was standing close to the other man, looking at her with an encouraging smile. Okay Eri-chan, the red cat lady said with a smile. Before we start anything, can you tell us what your quirk does, or a loose approximation if you can? She asked with an encouraging smile. Eri simply took a deep breath, trying to put into words what she could do. I poof people away. There was silence in the area, the four cat people, Izuku and his mom and the man who seemed to have never seen a bed, even the kid she punched was looking at her in stunned silence. Uh, what? Mandalay asked, of all the answers, that wasn't the one she was expecting. I, Eri began. Light comes out of my horn. She continued making movements with her hands. It hits people and they gone she added with some apprehension. Everyone looked at one another, Ha huh, Mandalay muttered. I see. She mulled the information she just got over. Okay, Midoriyakuin, make a ward, just in case. Izuku nodded, crossing his arms, spreading his legs, then shooting them to the sides, void light forming on his body as he formed a dome of pure void light around him. All right, everyone inside the bubble, Izuku said, Eri by her part eyed the seemingly fragile bubble. Izuka took notice of this and smiled. Don't worry Eri-chan, nothing short of a nova bomb or a thunderstrike, the Ward of Dawn will hold, it can take rockets, a full magazine of six thunderlords, and even of the full brunt of chaos reach, nothing short of all might, or orbital ordnance will bring it down. Izuka said, Eri kept looking at the bubble. Okay, Izuka said, entering the Ward one more time. His siren arms formed, now taking a violet hue, then they shot to the sides, the bubble seemed to grow thicker. I just added three extra wards, nothing short of an oversoul will bring this down, which is pretty much a metaphysical nuke, we'll be safe airy, don't worry, he said. This seemed to satisfy her at last, as she turned to the makeshift hall made for her. Will this really hold? Ragdoll wondered. You're the one that sees weaknesses, look. Izuka answered, Ragdoll seemed to take it as a challenge and actually did as so, actually blinking after five seconds. Oh my, this is pretty solid, I think it can take a punch of All Might head on and not buckle. She said, this seemed to alleviate the concerns of her teammates. As she entered the Ward of Dawn, Tiger had to actually sit Indian style because of his sheer size. Aizawa was the only one outside, but was close enough to dive in in case Ares quirk went wild. Okay kid, do your thing, aim at those trees if you can try to stop your quirk after activation, but don't worry too much, if in five seconds you haven't, I will cancel your quirk with mine. Eri nodded, but there was some hesitation, yet she nodded. She was ready. She closed her eyes, and she felt it, the sensation on the tip of her horn. Then she realizes that the feeling she always felt when she activated her quirk was way more potent and focused than before. Zum. Holy shit. She barely hears the sudden curse because she just fired her quirk like a laser. She is so surprised by this that she takes several steps back, turning back in panic. The laser died out. In shock she looked at Aizawa. His eyes were red and were focused on her. 
That was not expected, Aizawa said, deactivating his quirk. Eri blinked as she felt her quirk back into her control, if barely, and let out a sigh of relief. Problem child, you overclocked her quirk. Aizawa called out, seeing that Izuka was not in the bubble. For an instant he panicked, thinking he got hit by Eri's quirk. Eri-chan, you okay? Only to realize he had left the bubble the moment her quirk died out, and was now kneeling at her side, looking at her worriedly. I'm okay. Eri replied, leaning for Izuku, who hugged her. She let out a content sigh at his touch. He was so warm. I read that your quirks were enhanced, but I never imagined, Mandalay said, stepping out of the bubble with Inko in tow. Neither did I, Izuka confessed. I saw what mom can do. She pulled every teeth of a tyrant's mouth. I didn't put into mind that doing that to a bow would be harder than in a normal human being. And if she could do that, then Eri's own would be stronger, way stronger. He stated with a frown. Well, now it explains why her horn's so dense and strong. It has to so it can handle, firing a wave motion beam out of it. Pixie Bob muttered as she stepped out of the Ward of Dawn. What was that anyway? Did you used to do that before? Pixie asked to Eri. And no, it was like Izuku's thunders spiky everywhere. Eri confessed, rubbing her horn gently. Izuka rubbed his chin in thought. I didn't expect this. The void seems to have some compatibility with quirks. Izuka mentioned, catching everyone's attention. Back in the hospital I slipped into the Nova Warp, and somehow, I, we started to hear voices, calling for someone named Yagi. Izuka mentioned, that made the pussycats actually tense, but for different reasons. He can talk with the death? I thought I had become a medium, but after thinking it over, it is not. The Void was interacting with a quirk in the room or hospital. The Void acted as an enhancer for whatever quirk around, and we heard it. Also most Void walkers and Void light users have buffs relating the usage of the Void on themselves, devour just to start. It makes sense that while I was fighting in my mind, I slipped in the Void again, let it leak. Eri-chan and Mom had their quirks forcefully deactivated, and the Void leaked into them, enhancing the quirks in such a state. Izuka mentioned, The projector made us feel pain. Eri-chan complained about pain in her horn. So said girl nodded. Mom kept rubbing her hands together before I destroyed the projector. Inko nodded at that. And my connection to the light was compromised. I couldn't use blade mode or phase trance. My shouts were crippled at that moment, and I felt pain. Could it be that in that moment your light was doing some repairing to the damage done to their quirks? Then when the projector was destroyed, the quirks activated, now more powerful than before. Mandalay stated. It makes sense, scary sense, but it would explain how powerful they became. Also it's the fact it might be a permanent enhancement. Everyone looked at Mandalay at that admission. Eri's horn is larger than before, more than it should be in her age, comparing it to other kids of her age with horns. It's not the same, Aizawa stated. It is, Mandalay insisted. Now it is larger, sharper, denser. From a glance I can see that horn being able to punch a hole in a tree trunk, and we read the medical of Principal Honda, his knee no longer functional, every bone was pierced there, the muscles and tendons tore apart, the kneecap has a hole I can slip two fingers in. No normal horn can do that, especially considering that Eri, at the time was starved, tired and it's also a four-year-old girl, that kind of wound would be more in line to that of a full-grown bull charging at you and aiming its horns at your knees, not of a four-year-old malnourished girl. Mandalay stated firmly, the evidence is there. We cannot like it, but we have to accept it, it's the truth. And no one likes the truth, Izuku added, looking at where Eri had fired her quirk, and actually blinked, somewhat shocked of what he saw. He advanced, leaving the group behind, reaching for the end of the alley of rocks Pixie Bob had made, and stood there in shock. Something Ragdoll noted as she approached him. Hey kitten, what's wrong? We need to test Eri's quirk further, Izuku said, pointing at a spot on the ground. Ragdoll looked at where he was pointing and she blinked in shock. When Pixie Bob had made the alleyway of rocks, she had done so with the purpose of having the trees there to act as barriers and dummies, to measure the destructive force of Ares' quirk, if it was destructive enough to warrant so. 
It seemed as so, as a group of trees that had been there no longer existed, there was no trace whatsoever of their former presence, sounds the holes in the ground that indicated they had been planted. Hold a minute, Ragdoll and Azuka muttered at the same time, then looked at one another, seemingly having the same idea. I'll get a chair. I'll look for fruits. No one seemed to question why both seemed to actually enter the compound, then exit a minute later, Izuka with a plastic chair in hand, and Ragdoll with a pair of watermelons and a pumpkin of all things in her hands, and placed them with the chair, at the end of the alleyway of rocks. Okay, Eri-chan, I need you to use your cork again and shut up, Aizawa, I'm talking. Izuka silenced the erasure hero before he could say anything. We got a theory. Ragdoll stated as she pushed her team in the Ward of Dawn. We need to see if it holds Eraser Head. Make sure to stop her cork two seconds after activation, okay? Not before, but two seconds later, she stated, an odd serious tone that was her team rarely heard. Eri Chan, I need you to use your cork again. Don't worry, I just need you to fire it up and aim it at that chair and vegetables and fruits, okay? Eri looked uncertain. Don't worry, we'll be here. I just need to check something, Izuka said as he held her by the shoulders. Do this and there will be some apple slices in your future, Izuka sing-sanged, masking Eri nod with more enthusiasm. Two seconds after activation, Izuka reminded Aizawa, who was about as done with life after what had happened so far, but he relented, many didn't knew it, but Ragdoll was very observant, not because of her quirk, but it was needed. Now add a kid that can dissect quirks around her and no quirk is a secret to them. We're ready, at your pace Eri-chan, and keep the beam up front, don't move, just fire it. Izuka called it in a normal tone of voice, which apparently was the equivalent of screaming his lungs out in a death metal concert. As he made the area shake, Aizawa swore he would never meet present Mike, he doesn't need those two having a shout out. Nodding, Eri actually steadied herself. Taking a deep breath she focused, and let loose once more. Again the overwhelming energy beam, as wide as her torso, white and yellow in coloration, the beam immediately hit the chair with the fruits and vegetable. Aizawa could see the beam properly, and mentally counted to two, then he activated his quirk and deactivated Ares. The beam immediately died from the source, vanishing in a small shower of particles. It wasn't long before Ragdoll and Izuka left the bubble, Izuka giving Eri a pad on her head before heading with Ragdoll to the chair, and their Aizawa actually blinked, slow realization coming to a head. The chair remained, a simple plastic chair, white in color, everything about the chair was normal. The fruits and vegetables were another matter, the two watermelons looked, underdeveloped, small, like if they were just growing up, so was the pumpkin, they looked juvenile, barely growing. I knew it, Izuka said with a smile. This is why the Yakuza used Eri-chan, her cork rewinds, Izuka exclaimed, holding a watermelon that at one point was as big as his head, now it looked like the size of an apple, it wasn't mature. Five minutes later. Biological rewind? Ragdoll nodded at Mandalay's question. Yes, the trees that were in the line of fire were gone. They weren't vaporized, or cut down, the holes where they were planted was there. But there was no tree, the outline of their roots and base. But the ground was untouched, the ground was spotless. Ragdoll stated with a smile. Little kitten saw the same as I did, we needed to see if it affected inorganic material, like plastic. She said, looking at Izuka who was holding Eri by his lap, the girl munching on an apple. This is why the Yakuza harvested her blood and skin. By chance or by overhaul's own quirk, her blood must have the same properties as her quirk, a complete rewind to any biological material. But somehow instead of a complete biological rewind, he was able to aim it just at quirks. Maybe that's why it has so many chemicals, he needs to control it. And trigger it specifically to quirks, he can't afford to kill people with his product. His outfit is not ready for open warfare, to the notoriety. He knows he will end up losing a straight-up fight against the heroes and the police. Izuka pointed out. Then that means what? Her quirk is suited for oh shit, Pixie said with surprise. She's the ultimate healer. She can negate most, if not all wounds, she added. We can't be certain of that, 
Aizawa stated. Also keep in mind, her quirk is now on a magnitude of power that far surpassed her original output, she said it before. It was before a lightning bolt-like beam, now she has a Gundam cannon mounted on her forehead. Everyone looked at Aizawa oddly. What? He asked. Okay, Hizashi made me binge the damn show once, happy? The pussycats shared a glance. Oh, they were going to use this for blackmail. Damned the consequences later, this was just pure gold. So, Koda wondered. She can bring the dead back? Mandalay mentally gritted her teeth. It was an honest question but considering the tone her nephew had used, it was sending horrible red flags on her mind right now. I don't know, Izuka stated. In theory, it might be possible, he added, bringing a hand to his chin. But we have to consider the moral position, like we are at that moment playing God. Also, it's the fact, maybe she can rewind wounds to a biological level, but can she actually restart a body biological functions? For all we know, she could be restoring a cadaver to pristine condition, but that thing that spark of life might be too much for her to fix if it isn't there, Izuka said honestly. Also, there is the very fact of her overcharged quirk. Without control, she could rewind the body, or any biological material to their original stage. Like way before they were something, Izuka stated, looking at Koda, seeing how the kid seemed to deflate, before he seemed to hold some hope. But why? He's right, Inko said. But right now our main focus would be teaching Eri Chan control. Aizawa-san said it better. Now she has a cannon in her forehead. Learning how to turn her quirk on and off is important. The very first thing she must learn. After that she can learn how to reduce the output. It will take time. But I know she can do it, Inko said, giving Eri a reassuring smile. On the sidelines Koda balled his hands into fists and turned away from the scene. He didn't want to see this, or hear anything else. He drowned the sounds of the voices as he walked to the compound. He ignored the voice of Ragdoll as he entered. He hated heroes, he hated quirks. He hated the fact someone was talking sense into his fantasies of recovering his parents. They weren't coming back. Ashes don't come back. Three days later, unknown location. Nothing? Omega asked. Nothing, sir. We searched everywhere. We have social media completely scoped, but so far nothing. A member of the tactical division, in charge of looking for targets in case they went hiding, they were good at their job, nicknamed bloodhounds for their effectiveness. They usually find their targets within a day. The longest a target has hid from them has been a week, and by that time they had picked clues by the third day. They haven't found clues about the whereabouts of the Midorias in that exact time. It showed how serious the heroes and the government had taken security this time around. Usually their insiders would find a clue. So far not even a green hair has been found. Keeping social media, any form of it intervened was a sure way to find out when someone would inevitable mess up. Everyone mess ups in social media. They have been messing up for 200 years. That wasn't stopping in any way. Yet it hasn't yielded result. Their contacts within many places of power hasn't yielded result either. The last thing they knew was that they had decided to keep the location to a selected group, a group they could not touch, and the information of the location as hard data was locked on the safest place for that. The Hero Public Safety Commission HQ, in a massive complex underground that contained a supercomputer mainframe that was cut from the internet and contained the hero's most close guarded secrets, and was updated by a team of 12 people, by hand, no internet connection, at all, just updates of their works day by day. It was a team that not even the troop itself knew the identities of. They didn't even knew the security countermeasures outside the room, or how the team that made the updates was selected, they only knew that in the case that the room is infiltrated, the mainframe is rigged with a potent, really potent acid that it's hooked to the mainframe's memory banks. Basically, it was a kill switch that was designed to melt the brains of the mainframe to Poodle. No one would be able to get anything out of a caustic Poodle hissing and trying to burn a hole to the ground. That's how much they take security seriously, and it irked both the troop and villains. Keep me posted for updates. Will do, sir. With a grunt Omega left the room, his original default mood shifting to a slightly irritated one. 
After a while of walking the white, metallic corridors that made their base, he made it to where he was needed today, research and development. Some of the guys there said they might have an idea of what those exotic energies the Midoriya boy exuded. Might be. Might also clue them how he escaped in the first place. As the room he and his family were in had a quirk nullifier, his quirk should be dead, and the projector had been placed high enough and protected enough that not even standing on someone's shoulders would allow for its removal. They could not see the remains, as everything was shipped to Ireland, as per standard protocols when regarding them. All they had now was conjectures. Once inside the room, he spotted the people he was looking for, three scientists that were working on something on a table. They had called him to discuss the current events. They were dressed like the rest, to cover their identities, report. Omega commanded. Immediately the three stood to attention, not startled. It showed their professionalism. Sir, one of them spoke. He identified him as O4. We found a way to track the boy, he said, looking at his superior. Indeed? Omega wondered. Then out with it. It's not that simple. Another scientist, O34, stated with a frown under his mask. You see, sir, we were able to separate the exotic energies that the boy seems to exude whenever he powers up. In a sense, finding him will be like finding a lit candle in the dark. However, our current instruments can handle so much before they collapse. O34 stated. We have the most advanced tech, and you're saying it can't keep up with what the boy uses? Omega asked. Indeed. The third scientist, O66, replied. The sheer energy it exudes causes a collapse on measuring instruments. It was sheer luck that M98 very own instruments didn't cause a collapse on her main systems when she tried to do the measurements. But that's not all, he said, reaching for a table and handing it to Omega, who looked at the screen in it and frowned under his mask. What am I looking at? The most basic formula for quantum physics. And this relates how? He would regret asking that. We believe that his fire seems to be akin to the physical manifestation of quantum forces to a degree we cannot begin to comprehend, one of the scientists stated, making Omega blink in shock. Excuse me? Did I just hear that boy beat one of our Terminator dolls by weaponizing physics? In a nutshell, yes, we don't know how he was able to even make them into fire but it explained the extreme temperatures he emanated during combat, and why others and himself weren't affected the way M98 was, or the damage. We never designed their defenses against the fundamental forces that hold and govern the universe. Another scientist stated. Wonderful, Omega crossed his arms. I assume this discovery is what will allow us to track down Midoriya. Yes, you see, whenever he uses his quantum fire, he leaves a distinct energy signature. The problem is that this fire is mixed with a huge amount of other exotic energies we are yet to identify, which make us believe that while he manipulates quantum forces, other energies are involved into the usage of this. But quantum physics are the main ingredient. Again, how this will help us track him? Omega asked, annoyed. Sir, we have two methods. However, these methods will take time, lots of time, the third scientist said. The first one would be a complete upgrade to our satellite network, including hardware update that would allow us to track the manifestation of these energies whenever they are triggered, the first scientist stated. However, at of this moment we lack the material and personnel to carry such a task, as it would require us to send someone to space and temporarily shut down our network for the works to be done, which we cannot do, at all. Omega knew this better than anyone else. The satellite network they used was akin to their nervous system, bypassing the need of internet and creating their own server for communication that wasn't clogged with spams and useless junk. It was the means they kept communicated with their branches all across the world, without any means of being intercepted. I see, and the second? Omega asked. A software update to the satellites, less invasive and using their onboard systems to track our target. However, this will take time three weeks at the very least, trying to create a program that can identify and catalog quantum forces and exotic energies without suffering the computer equivalent of an epilepsy attack is hard, but we can do it. We just need time and a pair of extra hands for it to be finished at that time, or even less. 
the second scientist stated. You got them, make sure it is ready, the extra time will allow us to prepare the triples better. Omega said as he turned to leave, but was stopped by the third scientist. What is it now? Sir, it's regarding the biological components of the beta. The third scientist explained, of the three scientists in the room, he was one of the many assigned for the upgrades on the beta doll, upgrades that would follow to the remaining dolls if they proved successful. What about them? Omega asked. Sir, the remains of the main component have degraded fully. Right now we have enough for a single upgrade on one of our main dolls after the beta finish its trial run. We have to be careful on its testing runs, otherwise we risk losing it and exposing our hand too soon. He stated, making Omega frown under his mask. They degraded already? Yes, the little one in fact. It degraded by a factor of 50. By the time it was used on the beta it was already losing potency. That was two weeks ago. Today the blood samples we cloned were unusable. So were the cloned skin tissue. Cloning the clone tissue yielded. Subpar material and keeping the material on cold was insufficient. Whatever overhaul did to the girl made it so that any genetic material harvested of her would simply degrade faster than anything we have ever encountered. The scientist explained, making Omega sigh. Then why the beta hasn't shown signs of degradation? It's the boy's material. His DNA is simply a marvel. I cannot express how useful it is, yet I feel we haven't even grasped its potential. When we mixed her material with his, it stabilized it allowing it usage same with the biological armament we added to the beta however we do have a problem it resists cloning to a degree i have found startling so much that trying to clone it is an exercise in futility we have a small reservoir of blood but we'll soon run out of it we either find a way to clone this unclonable material or we resign the kill order and move to capture for future harvest the scientist explained making omega seethe we cannot, he must die, he resisted us, offended us, never we have backpedaled of our actions, we won't start today, the founder itself gave the order, he wants him dead. Omega snapped, making the scientist take a deep breath. Very well, then I suggest we start developing new cloning methods, our usual ones do not stack up against this new biological material, if not, then his body will just provide a finite source of material, and that will be that. You worry about the technicalities of the procedure. I will worry about the capture. Whatever the obstacles that may come to us, we will overcome, as we have before. Omega intoned as he left the lab behind. The scientist in question simply sighed. Okay people, we have the new hands. Also spread the word to biological experiments. Tell them to start figuring a way around Midoriya's unclonable cells or start figuring a way to make the scarps work because that's what we will get once his body arrive. Two days later, wild, wild pussycats compound. Again. A crackle of electricity followed by what seemed a green miasma was shot from Azuka's hand, aimed at a straw dummy that took the hit dead on. Other than the slight movement thanks to the hit, the dummy showed no signs of damage. Had it been a living organism, it would have different results. But that wasn't what Aizawa was looking at. With a small glance at his cell phone, the erasure hero narrowed his eyes. Shaved a second of the casting, still can't cast it in movement. He muttered. Izuku's only answer was a growl of frustration, reaching for a glass of saline solution, drinking it slowly, feeling how his cells felt revitalized after drinking it and taking its contents. Still can't work a way around it? Pixie Bob asked from the side slowly making some stretching motions to start the day of physical. Not unless I float using the light, it's a workaround, and one Aizawa sensei doesn't like, Izuku explained. First, I'm not your sensei. Second, you depend too much on your light, Aizawa rebutted. First, you're teaching me, ergo, sensei. Second, oh, excuse me for depending on the power casual force that I alone can tap on and makes most elemental quirks look bad, Izuku stated. Down with the sass kitten, he can't take it, it's like throwing water at a witch. Pixie teased. Izuku immediately began to pantomime being melted, all while Pixie Bob actually cackled. Oh I'm melting! She cackled, Aizawa just took a deep breath, this was kinda his fault. 
letting two people who have a taste for pre-quirk era movies around each other. And one of them having a drive chock full of movies that dated back to an era that believed superpowers would only come in movies, was a recipe for disaster, and many movie quotations that would go over his head. Enough, Aizawa intoned, Pixie still chuckled while Izuka stopped and looked at the dummy in front of him. Three pyrokinesis in movement. Izuka sighed, but did as told, raising his left hand and instantly rushing at the dummy, his hand igniting as he let out a ball of fire the size of a soccer ball at the target, all while in movement. When he had begun using it five days ago, it was the size of a tennis ball and he could not do it while running, it showed how much he had progressed in five days, some parasite powers he could use in constant movement, but others required him to stay still, inferno, plasma. Antibody and every single water-based parasite energy power seemed to fall under this category. Izuka theorized that since they required far more time to fire up and their sheer power output, it required them to stay put, but as he leveled them up, their time to use would reduce, so in theory it would allow him to fire them in movement, as in game it was basically impossible to use the P without staying still. A mechanic to ensure tension when in combat as the powers were to be a tactical choice over the guns one would use. Aizawa couldn't still believe he was learning something out of a video game, he always considered them to be a waste of time, then came Problem Child and decided to teach him what he had learned, which in turn had him, really reconsidering things, in some manners. The fact he was considering actual weighted gloves with hidden metal plates in the fingers and knuckles to add to his striking power. Carrying an actual canister of pepper spray was a telling thing of what problem child was telling him was getting to him. Aizawa considered that those who depended on their quirks tended to become unable to fight properly once their quirks got disabled. It was one of the reasons his combat style could be considered brutal and effective. He has yet to see a villain try to fight him with a dislocated arm. Then came the kid. Whose quirk allowed him to tap into forces that outright negates his own and he asked him the important question. What happens next? When you can't stop someone with your quirk? The answer, go for the soft bits, the eyes, the groin, the joints, the liver, the nose, even if he was facing a villain that's pretty much a minotaur, has happened too many times, it still has human characteristics, therefore, human weaknesses, go for the eyes. Blind him irritate them, go for the groin, a cluster of nerves strike the liver if possible, if not use a liberal amount of electricity and blunt force trauma to the face and nose. The kid honestly scared him, he had two ways to deal with quirk users, he either disables or overwhelms their quirks with his own, which is possible, the kid has a knack to find weaknesses on quirks by a mere glance, but sometimes his ways to make it happen worries him. For example Tiger, his quirk gives Shim incredible mobility, Problem Child instantly thought of ten ways to disable him with what he had, which varied from a localized thunderstrike that would cause Tiger to lose his focus, to set everything on fire, to wear him down by blinking in and out of reach, frustrate him, or use a low set of Stromtrance to act as the most unnecessary taser ever. Those were the kind options, his not-so-kind options went from breaking his bones to basically grabbing him and start slamming him towards anything remotely solid, he might be able to use his quirk to flatten his body, joints and anything in his body to give him inhuman flexibility, but he is not immune to kinetic impacts, or area of effect attacks like Inferno or a localized damage like with Apobiosis, or a mixture alongside Blade Mode. Suffice to say that right now, Tiger is training to improve his reaction time and hit harder and clear the area he might be faster. The less said about what problem child thought about how to deal with the quirks of the rest of the team, or his, the better. And the kid hasn't even dared to use his shouts either, mostly because unlike the light, he cannot seem to tone down their power, their default power either comes in set to maim and to nuke to your soul kind of power, and to make matters worse, he was working on a new shout, one that, in theory he should be able to use. As it was used in game by the dragonborn enemy, Alduin a damn dragon, but there were no words of power for that one, so basically he was looking for the appropriate words to use. With a sigh Aizawa saw Izuka cast the third pyrokinesis while on movement, the straw dummy was already damaged beyond repair, 
he was hitting it with a biological equivalent of a fireball. Good, you shaved half a second on it, Aizawa drawled. The third fireball was smaller than the first two, what happened? Use too much energy on the first two without wanting, need to measure them better. Izuka muttered, this time not going for the saline solution and instead letting his cells slowly build strength for the next time. Aizawa simply grunted, looking at the dummy, then at Izuku. Pixie Bob, you're up, he said the blue-themed cat slash made heroin grinded, all while Izuka sighed, but there was a small smile on his lips. You need to make them more solid, that T-Rex you made broke in two punches, Izuka stated, slowly rolling his arms getting ready. Well, excuse me if I wanted to impress. Also, I didn't knew you could become a living missile, Pixie Bond commented. You do know that it was made of rocks, right? I channel dark light. Electricity. Rock is not electricity conductive, Izuka muttered. Even if it is a fundamental force, it still follows several laws as well. It's space magic with laws of physics, Izuka stated. Besides, I'm not using a super today. Smashing his fists together, he let forth his phase trance, the six ethereal arms forming behind him. He kinda enjoyed the look of surprise of Pixie Bob when she saw the coloration of them. Toxic Green. Like it? Finally got it down last night, took concentration and an understanding of what is acid in general. Training helped too. The six arms slammed knuckles together and assumed grappling stances. So, ready? Pixie Bob just blinked, then turned to Aizawa. You still salty about that comforter, are you? Her answer was just one of his patented creepy grins. You dick, she said as she slammed her hands to the ground and activated her quirk. Immediacy three rock beasts formed from the ground, resembling a bear, a wolf, and a standard human. If the bear was a mutant abomination with tusks on its back, the wolf was a miniature Cerberus with three heads and four extra legs just because and the human had steroids since it was a baby in its arms, each arm looking more like a three log and being at the very least, as thick as the torso, which was also thick. Honestly the last one reminded Izuku of Left 4 Dead's tank, but with a visible head. All the acid in the world not gonna help you kitten, made them extra solid, she said with a grin. You do know acid is like water. It will find a way into, besides, I'm not gonna punch it, I'm gonna break it. And with that, Izuka took the initiative and launched himself forward. Aizawa looked away, focusing on the other things going around. He didn't need to see how this was going to end. He already knew. Pixie was good with her quirk and creations. But honestly, there was little she could do when the kid was able to produce something that could break her creations apart. Like really since when he can channel acid of a things on his siren arms? He heard a crunch and rolled to a side, letting one of the heads of the Cerberus wolf roll away, a sizzling imprint of a fist on its side being the indication on how it lost its head. Looking around he saw Inko practicing with Mandalay, actually using a knife of a things in what he assumed was her former CQC form, he had to admit, she was rusty, enough for a pro to figure it out, for anyone else she might be the devil coming at you at full cylinders ready to disembowel you. Stepping to one side a rock arm went passing by, he gazed to a nearby chair and table where Ragdoll was seated alongside Ari and Koda, both children were, silent, looking at the books they had in front of them with something akin to horror or, oh no that was just kids just realizing they were being taught something and were bored out of their minds. He had seen that look so many times on students on UA and on adults during meetings to not confuse one another. Then again he can't blame them for having that look, for all her energy and cheerfulness, Ragdoll is one of the most thrown teachers he had ever met, straight to the point and drowning you on theory and terminologies that has, at one point lulled him into sleep, much to his embarrassment, that had never happened before. A crunch and a small growl of Pixie Bob indicated that Izuka was done again with her creations, which seemed to occur. She really wasn't expecting him to pull acid limbs to fight her quirk creations. This ought to teach her to branch out. He thought with some satisfaction as he turned around and saw the last remains of her creation simply sizzle with the acid Azuka's siren arms generated upon impact. He idly noted he didn't use the light too much, perhaps for movement, Aizawa will admit. Under duress, double jumping in midair is a skill that he would love to have. 
your rusty pixie. Last year you made these exact ones and Tubi had to fight them for five hours. Aizawa said with a creepy grin. Oh, spare me the taunt eraser head. I wasn't dealing with a paracasual force that keeps on getting better. Pixie Bob snapped with a smirk. Then again that same class did the physical kid in here did before. How many were regretting their life choices by lap 55? 10 and 2 vomited on a tree. You two need to cease and desist now. Izuku demanded slash whispered. The fact Pixie and Aizawa felt their skin slightly ripple told them that Izuku wasn't comfortable with the fact he was able to complete exercises a second year of students of a hero academy could barely do. At the very least not without vomiting everything to the side and look half dead. Both adults rolled their eyes, Aizawa rolling his shoulders, letting some tensions out. Okay, down the sass child, power up the arc staff, Aizawa said as he unfurled his capture gear. You need to learn control over the current. That thing can be your best friend in non-lethal combat, Aizawa stated. Most heroes either use their quirks or support gear to disable their opponents. Our higher training and accessibility to high tier gear give us an edge. What most fail to realize is that our greatest weapon is our brains, Aizawa said. So I want you to use the arc staff to strike me, he said, reaching for his utility belt and pulling a small device placing it on his belt, then extending two cords, and reaching under his heavy-duty shirt, place them under it, and hooking it to the device. This device will measure the amount of what the staff can yield. I'll emit a high-pitched sound if you exceed the wattage per strike. You need to strike me without causing it to go off. Aizawa said Izuku for his part looked rather off-put. Sensei, you want me to shock you? Yes. Izuka looked at Pixie Bob in uncertainty. Trust me, this ain't the first time this nut job goes plus ultra for teaching. Two years ago one of the kids here got the snob beat out by him because his quirk allowed him to quickly transfer kinetic damage back, negating damage, as long he did it in a allotted time. Aizawa ended up with a broken arm and three cracked ribs. Pixie Bob explained. So getting tazzed it's not out of the realm here. She added, but I do share his concerns. We have seen what he can do with his arc energy. Are you sure you want to get hit by that much energy? He has learned to tone it down, Aizawa stated. Also this shirt was specially crafted by the support team of Best Genius Agency. Say what you will about the guy. He can make insulated gear that actually does its job, Aizawa stated. Also will help to test its overall insulation capabilities. Your arc energy it's so far. The purest form of electricity ever found. Whatever scarps of info we might glean from this, the better improvement on the gear. Aizawa wasn't hiding the fact he was pretty much using Izuku to test gear. At least he was honest. Yeah, well, we have an hour. I still have an essay to finish, Izuku said, directing a look to Pixie Bob, who looked rather abashed by this. I said I was sorry. That was due two days ago. I'm lucky Mandalay san spoke for me and got me an extension. Izuku snapped. If you didn't play that many games, Pixie defended herself. It was done, and you ended up crushing the USB where I saved it. I was lucky I had a backup on my hard drive before I finished it otherwise I would have gone nuclear. That's a month work there, Izuku added. Still, why are you delivering essays and homeworks? You're supposed to be hiding, Pixie reminded. That was Principal Ned's actually, he has contacts. Also I can't enter any kind of hero academy without at least finishing middle school. So yeah, no excuse here. Izuku stated as he summoned his arc staff, the smell of ozone and crackle of electricity making it very apparent that even at its lowest. The arc staff could easily electrocute someone to next week. Pixie simply rolled her eyes. Aizawa on the other hand appreciated that the kid had a work ethic. He understood that he had a lot to catch up, not only in the quirk control department, but education-wise, he understood that, and was actively fighting against that gap. Considering he had seen the essay he wrote beforehand, he was pretty much going plus ultra on that regard. Yes, one hour, you finish your essay, then we move to Castlevania. Aizawa hissed the name with contempt. No, after the essay there's lunch, then I have to check something on my hard drive, then we move to Castlevania, Izuka reminded. 
Between lunch and my hard drive I have to check on some things. I really hope that sheet of metal you guys found and that chisel hole. Izuka muttered the last part. Aizawa simply rolled his eyes. Why you couldn't choose something more logical? My quirk as a whole isn't logical. Just fight already. I got good news, great news and bad news. Just so you know, I killed people for less than bad news. Oh trust me sir I know, but this was expected, they are better said news. Overhaul was right now, deciding that blasting the guy in front of him was worth the cleaning effort to the walls and sofa. After careful deliberation, he decided not to, just so he could know what was going on now. Very well, the bad news first. Overhaul commanded. Okay, his subordinate said, and took a deep breath. Several of our warehouses have been hit this past week. The heroes are ruthless, more than ever before. I would chalk it up to usual mop-up operations, but we are not the only ones getting hit. Overhaul subordinate stated, looking at his boss, then at Mimic, who was as usual. Working on the books. It's that so? Yes, the subordinate stated. I got it from good word that other gangs and criminal families had their operations hit as well, coordinated assaults that are happening all over Japan. Last night, the high-res gang on Yokohama stopped existing, all their members got captured, the Red Devils of Tokyo are on the run, their boss was captured. And word is we aren't the only ones getting hit, he said, making overhaul raise an eyebrow. What do you mean? Sounds like everyone in the underworld is getting hit. Overhaul reminded, only to see his subordinate shake his head. Two night ago I got word that two bases belonging to the troop in Muzurifu got hit. At the same time, yesterday in the morning a small raid occurred against the Meta Liberation Army. At least the most radical part of it. Sir, this is no mop-up. What happened in the Colosseum triggered the heroes and police something fierce. They are applying scorched earth policy. Several villains in those gangs got captured and their gear got destroyed. This is a damned witch hunt, not a raid. His subordinate stated with a frown. Overhaul mulled over the first piece of news. He knew that at one point this would happen, not this soon, but it would happen. Question was why now? A part of him reminded him that the Colosseum had seen many captures. It stood to reason some of them would sell their outfits for lighter punishments, and that would inevitably the flack would hit them. He did deal with many people. It stood to reason this was why. Right now several of his warehouses got hit. A look at Mimic and he convened everything he wanted to say. I want to know what those warehouse had he needed to know what got compromised. If it was guns, no big deal. The main compound had guns to spare. So were the quirk killing bullets. But the warehouses could have more than that. His quirk killing bullets would be the main selling point he would have. But right now it wasn't the only one. He had many dealings. Anything could be compromised. Okay then, the good news? Overhaul asked. It relates to the bad news and the great news. So many gangs have been hit that we can move to their territory without conflict. With your permission I would like to set up a small lab and safe house in Yokohama. It would benefit us greatly. We could move more produce and store our gear without compromising our outfit. As long you permit it. Overhaul nodded this was something good. That was related to the bad news. To the good and great news, we got a buyer for Trigger 5, he wants it all. Overhaul blinked. Someone want that shit? Mimic wondered out loud. That thing is not even the best trigger we have, and someone wants it all, he asked. Yes, all ten tons of it. God, we are rich, Mimic stated. Mimic, we are already rich. I know, but still, boss, what price did you negotiate it? Mimic asked to the subordinate. Nothing sir, that's the thing. The buyer wants to negotiate with you. Conference call. I would be overstepping my boundaries if I tried to set a deal without your blessing. Good boy, Overhaul praised. But you gave your word that you would get the word sort of speak. Yes sir, the subordinate said. Expect a raise for this. I assume you have the number? The subordinate nodded. Those are the good news, the great ones are? Yeah, uh, the buyer seems to know about, Airy. Silence. Beg your pardon? Overhaul asked softly. Like I said, he seems to know, 
He alluded to me he might know of a way, or a person that might find Ari. He didn't say much, just relayed the info to you. You can imagine how nervous that made me. The subordinate admitted. How he knows? Ari's a ghost, Overhaul reminded. Yes, she was, the subordinate stated. The buyer actually instructed me to check some files on a web page they set up, on a family known as the Midorias, the family you tore the apartment. Overhaul nodded at that. Well, I checked the files. Ari's no longer a ghost, she exists in the system. Fingerprints, birth certificate, picture, the whole nine yards, she appears under the guardianship of Inko Midoriya. I also read a part of the file. Whoever did her papers knew what it was doing. The subordinate spoke. I worked on a law firm before. So some legal terminologies got stuck. We tried to get Ari in any way. That's our ass. He said bluntly. Whoever did it knew what to do, since there are no blood relatives that they know or we know of. Ari now exists as a ward of the Midorias. Which is a pretty word to say she is pretty much adopted and no judge or lawyer will stick their hands on their case. Unless they want their entire career murdered and tossed on a ditch. He spoke, uncertain how his boss would react. To his credit, Overhaul didn't broke into a rage-induced mania, just took two deep breaths, and signaled his subordinate to continue. They know, sir. The subordinate stated, Overhaul blinked once, then twice, then it sunk in, actually leaning onward. Somehow the heroes know, Ares protected under a clause, she is classified as hazardous material level 5 or better said her blood, sir, that is reserved only for nuclear material and biohazards. They know and use this against us, if Ares taken then we will have the military on us, no heroes, no police, the military, with orders to shoot to kill, no capture, kill, that's how serious that clause is, they aren't fucking around. The subordinate spoke. This sounds like bad news, not great news, Overhaul clarified. They are great news because we now know that the Midorias have Ari. It's great news because we know what the backlash will be if we try to attack up front. It's great news because the buyer seems to know how to get to Ari. All he asks it's time. It's great news because I might help somewhat, the subordinate added. I checked around. The Midorias were last seen a week ago. We can assume the heroes have them under protective custody, not the cops. So with that in mind we have to check on hero teams, not individual heroes, but teams that are currently off roster. We find the team, we find the Midorias, and we find Ari. The subordinate spoke, their overhaul nodded. Good, very good, you have initiative, I assume you are already checking? The subordinate nodded. Continue to do so, and keep me appraised. Also the number of our potential buyer? His subordinate lay a piece of paper neatly folded in the desk, in front of overhaul, and gently opened it. Good, you may go. Continue with this streak of good luck and you will have a better position in the organization. Overhaul promised. I live to serve, sir, by your leave. Overhaul motioned him to leave, which he did with a small bow. That kid is the luckiest motherfucker. Kind of tempting to drag him into a casino to see if his luck rubs on. Ten tons boss, at standard price, will be making a fortune. Mimic said with glee. Indeed, so I'll leave you to negotiate the prices, in our favor of course. As if I would fuck this up, whoever this buyer is, must be desperate, we can use it. As long we don't play in our desperation for the girl, we must play it cool. Mimic said with a sigh, damn brat. Indeed. Overhaul hid his sentiments over Ares' rebel nature quite well. He was sulfuric to be honest. But for the sake of everything he had to remain calm. Nothing would be sorted out if he flew off the handle by the news so far. It was fortuitous that they got the news so far. And despite that someone else knew about Ari, this could be played to their advantage. All they had to do was to play it cool. With a sigh he reached for the paper with the phone number, then reached for his cell phone and he started to dial the number. Once done, he brought the cell phone to his ear and waited. He didn't wait long. Well, that was fast. The voice on the other end made him feel weak. So I heard you're looking for a child. As a matter of fact, I happened with some information that will prove beneficial to us. He felt afraid and didn't knew why. Are you sure you want to do this, Yagi? 
Sir Knight, I asked, an expression of apathy on his face, at least to those who didn't knew him, to others there was concern on it. I don't want to, but I owe it to David, Yagi said, his sunken eyes boring to Sir Own. You are about to reveal one of the world's greatest secrets. Why? Sir Knight, I asked. For a moment Yagi remained quiet, then looked at Sir, a small smile forming on his lips. Young Mirio convinced me. Sir Knight, I would lie if he didn't consider strapping his protege onto Tickle Hell, crank that shit up to eleven and let it work until it overloads, just because. And what brought about this, I wonder? Knight, I asked. Well, a week ago. I what? You should tell Shield San about one for all, was Mirio's less than blunt answer to Yagi's questioning. I failed to see how this helps in any way. Yagi had wondered if telling David about One for All and its legacy would change things between them, if something David would be interested in seeing the only transferable quirk in existence at works, and one that was as old as the quirks themselves. But time and time again the heavy burden behind the secret reared its ugly head, reminding him that telling David was putting him in danger, All for One was dead, but who knew what kind of legacy he left behind, he could not risk it. Because it is not fair. You owe it to him and honestly, how you will explain him your everything when you retire. There Mirio brought a solid point. His fight with All for One had left him barely a shell of a man, metaphorically and literally. The subject of retirement always came about when he remembered his sensei, Nana. And how the last dregs of One for All fueled her last, most crazy stunts as a heroine up until her last encounter with All for One. He knew there would be a lot to say. He hoped that he would be able to retire in silence. All might gone, a new pillar of justice left behind in his stead. A job well done, time to enjoy the fruits of his labor, so to speak. Yet he knew that David was among one of the first people who knew him better than anyone else, and would pretty much demand to know why he looks like he hasn't eaten anything when on screen he looks like he could bench press three tanks as part of his training regime. It's not that simple, young Mirio. He tried to argue. After all, it was not simple at all. Revealing the secret of one for all meant reveal his past, Nana, all for one, and the wound that left him in desperate need of a successor. Is it? Because honestly, if you retire without telling him, it might make more damage than expected. He's your friend, right? Mirio brought a good point, yet the elephant in the room made itself no. Might, might being the keyword here, might do some good, might do some bad. I how the day after my fight with All for One, I requested to be sent to Ireland. They had the best tech and top of the line hospitals. Nothing here can compare to what they have, but it was that bad, was it? Yagi Tashinori wasn't afraid to admit it, but the wound All for One inflicted on him was bad, so bad that he had considering passing the quirk to Night Eye for safekeeping in case he didn't make it. His request to be sent to Ireland for treatment was vetoed by Recovery Girl for one reason. His wound was so bad that he would not make the trip alive. He needed constant monitoring just to keep him alive. And any attempt to move him would have killed him. A month in a hospital, on bed, constantly monitored. Two high-risk operations to remove his lung and stomach, compromised by whatever all for one use. Because the punch alone should have not caused his lung to look like if he had been smoking all his life and stomach look like if it was eating itself out and many other operations and treatments to ensure the wound closed. Because it wasn't healing properly, there was a point he was afraid when he saw puss and blood ooze out of the wound that was supposed to be closed and healed, left him the man he is now. How could he explain David any of this? How, how could I explain my oldest friend and supporter that I lied to him all this time? Yagi wondered out loud. If he is your friend, he'll understand. You need to tell him with facts the how and why. I know it might not be easy, telling the truth never is, especially after hiding it for so long, but it has to happen, how you're going to explain everything when all said and done. Mirio had a point, honesty here was the key, but again, one for all was pretty much a cryptid in its own right, this had to be done carefully. You think he'll understand? But the root of one for all's secret was not necessity to hide it, but fear, fear of rejection, in a world where superpowers are the norm and help you stand out, 
what says of you when the power you have is borrowed, never mind the fact it is one of the most powerful quirks in existence? What says of you when you need the power of someone else to stand out? In a world where quirks were put on the forefront, one of Yagi's teenage fears still held true, rejection. He's your friend, I'm sure he'll understand. I mean he is a scientist, confront him with facts, no scientist I know can refute facts. Present time. That boy. Sir Knight I didn't had it in him to be angry at Muriel right now. If he somehow got the message across then it would help immensely. Because of the immense power of one for all, Jaggi's first costumes had suffered. Enough said that the subsequent suits, including the rare support gear Yagi used for one year, had been made by David himself. He was about the only man that had created something that could withstand the overwhelming power unleashed by a wielder of one for all. Also he was about the only person, aside from himself, that ever talked heart to heart with Yagi. I thought it over, Yagi said. He is right, on many fronts. I'm not getting any younger or healthier the moment I pass the torch and the last embers of one for all burn out. There will be a lot to explain, but nothing will amount to the explanation I will have to give to David. I can spin a tale to the media, been making one for so long. But David? Aside Nana, he was among the first to believe in me, to trust in me. At the very least I owe him an explanation, the truth. Yagi confessed, rubbing the back of his head with a sheepish smile. Not that explaining it will make it less scary. Understatement of the century. Night I thought with a small smile, there were very few things that could make Yagi quake on his feet. Most of them were comical, like mentioning Gran Torino, in any way, shape, or form. Apparently the wrath of David Shield was another thing that put the mighty All Might in a fearful mood. Shaking his head, Night Eye turned to his desk, pulling a folder and handing it to Yagi. This came this morning. Night Eye instantly changed the subject. They had decompressed a little. Now it was time for work. Aizawa's report? This soon? Yagi wondered as he took the folder. I expected a two-week report, not a weekly one. Nedza and the commission agreed to this, read it already, Midoriya already added one more power to his arsenal, and outlined two more for the month if all goes to plan. Night I said as he saw Yagi open the folder and began to point such powers, Yagi began to read the three outlined powers, and actually blinked. The hell, Yagi muttered. Did he actually turn a 200-year-old sarcastic meme into a reality? Yep, Night Eye said with a small smile, pointing at other articles outlined in the file. All joking aside, this parasite energy is highly versatile. It allows him a level of stealth and flexibility that the light cannot provide when used. Then again, apparently, he can cause a focalized fusion as an attack using his mitochondria. Don't ask me how. Night Eye admitted. The point stands. Eraser had thought all his power selection is just for flashiness' sake. No. He later admits that all this flashiness is a side product. Midoriya doesn't look for attention by getting the most flashy power. He looks for actual combat capabilities, support and suppression. If they have a light show attached to them when used, he consider it a side effect, as long as they work. Night I stated. Yagi rubbed the bridge of his nose. And he's not even done these glyphs. Aizawa Kuen must be about to lose his shit on this one. It barely makes sense. And I'm the guy with the ancient, transferable quirk. Yagi muttered. Indeed, but it seems Midoriya foresaw this and has taken appropriate steps to bridge whatever inconveniences he might encounter. However, his progress is somewhat overshadowed by Eri's own, and what happened to her and his mother at the Colosseum. Night I stated, Yagi flipped one of the pages, and began to read, actually going eye wide. It seems the void has enhancing properties with quirks of any kind, not just one for all. Night I stated after seeing Yagi's reaction. As explained, void light can be used as a buff. When the Midoriya's plus airy were held in the Colosseum, the projector was utilized on them, against Izuku and his light. It made many of his other abilities short circuit or outright not work at all. Being a para casual force, the light shielded him and withstood the attack. But since he was affected by phantasm, he unconsciously let out void light, right at the only two people in the cell that were being affected by the projector just as him. It enhanced their quirks, which according to him, 
might have been damaged by the projector, they reported pain, might have been attacking their cork factors, as a result once the projector was destroyed, all that energy was absorbed and used, in Inko's case her cork allows her to pull objects of any kind, with sufficient strength behind it. She did pull every tooth of a tyrant, as for Eri. Night I took a deep breath. We found out what her cork is. Night, wild, wild pussycats compound. It worked, right? Tiger asked. He confirmed it. No short circuit, as he called it. Aizawa confirmed. Then where's the good stuff? Pixie Bob asked, looking at her teammate and her ex in exasperation. He said, and I quote this is different. Ragdoll said with a small smile, sitting in a nearby chair. Thunk. I find it funny you haven't lost it yet, Aizawa. This is the height of illogical. Mandalay teased with a grin, only to see Aizawa glare at her, then sigh in defeat. I come to accept that hacks just break rules, period, makes things that quirks should not be able to do alone, and therein lies the crux of the matter. A quirk was able to make something impossible, quite possible. He added, Yeah, but it has some roots in reality, like the light itself, it draws from the fundamental forces, yet I don't get how this one will work. Mandalay confessed. From what I gathered from Problem Child, it acts as some sort of emitter quirk but on steroids, plans to see if his light can be used to fuel it, as he doesn't has access to real magic, and the light it's the closest thing to actual magic, Aizawa added. Yes we get it, what I don't get it's all those, doodles, Pixie muttered. You could always ask, I'm standing right here you know, Izuka muttered, focused on a slab of metal a chisel in hand and a hammer on the other, his siren arms holding the slab of metal firmly. The heroes noted how from time to time, a small, but steady amount of light of any of the three variants would leak out of Izuku. Directly at the chisel and hammer, all while following a small guide he had made in the metal, a drawing in chalk of what seemed to be a circle, in the outer circle were symbols drawn into it, all over the circumference, then in the middle of the circle was something else drawn, what seemed to be a hammer, but for the life of him, Aizawa had never seen a hammer that looked so delicate or intricate. It was obvious that this hammer seemed to be made for crafting, so it was obvious he was planning to use it, if all he planned came to fruition. Okay, so why are you making a hammer when you have a hammer and a chisel already? Pixie muttered, from the corner of her eyes she saw Koda looking at the scene, the scowl on his face becoming deeper as Izuka continued using his quirk like nothing. He's gonna pop, she thought with some apprehension. Well, Izuka began, not noticing Koda. The idea behind glyphs is that one pours their energy on their creation. But there's more to that. Did you know there are actual texts on how to make a glyph that actually means something? In Castlevania it is never alluded how they are made. Only that they are magical in nature, and those trained enough can use them. But that puts me in a bind, as glyphs like that don't exist here. Izuku explained as he began etching with the hammer and chiseled the chalk image of the ornate hammer and the glyph circle. So, you suffered to bridge the gap by actually crafting your own glyph, but now with the elements to do so and with the actual ability to use them. Tiger concluded. Exactly, I'm pretty much using the light to feed the glyph. At the same time I'm carving it and infusing it as well, then I'm gonna add words, believe it or not. I figured that in order to use it they should have a meaning behind them not just pull something out of thin air, if all goes right. Then I'll pull Celebrimber's forge hammer, Izuka said. Ragdoll actually made a face at the mention of that name, until it clicked. Wait, as in Celebrimber, the guy that helped forge the rings of power? She asked. Yeah, but not the book version, but the game version, in that one he is the sole responsible of forging all the rings, and he did it using this a mithril hammer gifted to him by Sauron in disguise, just like in the book. Long story short, he and his family got killed by this very hammer, and he became a wraith. I'm planning to use this very hammer to make the remaining glyphs, as the hammer would be infused with some much energy that I wouldn't need to add too much, only when summoned. Izuka pointed to Ragdoll. Is it every game you play have a dark twist into it? Pixie Bob muttered with some apprehension. They do not. Izuka argued, then seemed to zone out for a second, then blink. Oh god they do. 
he said with some shock, then shook his head, focusing again on the work at hand. For someone who had never done this, you seem to have a talent for crafting, Mandalay stated. It helps I have a measure of super strength. I don't need to add so much behind each blow and can move faster than other people because of it. Also it helps that I drew it before. Otherwise this might look wholly different. Izuku said, finishing the forge hammer in the middle of the circle. It was, in Aizawa's honest opinion, richly detailed. More than it should. With a sigh Izuku put away the hammer and chisel, then focused on the space between the circles, devoid of any kind of inscription or touched by the chisel. Focusing on it, he commanded his siren arms to hold firmly the slab of metal, then he cupped his hands together on his mouth, leaned onwards, and began to speak. Each word he spoke made the room vibrate. Aizawa bit the groan he felt on his bones. This was highly uncomfortable. Izuku had suggested to make this outside, better than inside the compound, but the pussycats had insisted to do this inside, more because it was night already, and illumination might be an issue in the long run outside. Now the team was slightly regretting it, as now they realized what Izuku meant that very few people could really resist the power of the Thursdayum without adverse effects. They denoted that each time he spoke, symbols were being carved into the metal, actually being imprinted by force alone. Each harsh word Izuku spoke between his cupped hands was directed to the direction he wanted, right at the circle, and he was doing it with such care that they were afraid to actually interrupt him. It was a full minute before Izuku stopped, and the room stopped shaking, and by extension shaking them and their internal organs. Izuku dear, what I told you about using the shout inside the compound? Inko called from afar, mostly the kitchen, where she and Eri were at the moment, mostly because Eri wanted to learn how to make apple pie. Sorry, Izuku let out a loud whisper, then focused once more on the slab of metal, the glyph completed. It is done! He intoned, slowly standing up. Aizawa and the pussycats saw how the glyph seemed to glow for the lack of better words. Even the forge hammer etching in the middle glowed with power. Okay, now what? And what was all that you spoke? My liver feels like jello. Pixie asked, not used to the dragon language in any way. That sounded like gibberish. To you maybe. But to me and anyone who knows the dragon language was not, dragons in Skyrim can channel power trough words of power, you know that already. Two dragons debating pretty much means fire, ice and whatever else thrown at each other, words are power. With that in mind I decided to use this. Infused with my light to empower each word I spoke and carved into the glyph, pretty much I spoke my will into it. Since we don't know how glyphs in Castlevania are made, I had to get creative with what I have. The light is pretty much space magic, and the Thursdayum is pretty much shout and something will happen. Now with the ability to draw on power from the glyph I just made. Izuku trailed off as he touched the glyph. Taking a deep breath he instead touched the slab of metal he didn't carve with chisel or words, and let the light pour forth. He recoiled, just like the rest when the glyph glowed a rainbow of colors from its etchings and his hand instantly had a silver hammer small enough to be wielded with one hand, with leaf-like etching and carvings on its body, glowing with its own light. Holy I shit I did it. Holy shit you did it. The rest of the team gazed in some shock. Somehow Izuku had done it. He had made a functional glyph, and from it he summoned a hammer, a very pretty-looking hammer. Is that how Mithril should really look? It looks like pure platinum. Ragdoll muttered actually poking the hammer in Izuku's hand, and finding it surprisingly solid. Well, I think you just violated, I don't know, like 10 to 15 laws of physics right there, how does it feel? Tiger asked with a small smirk on his lips. I have so many ideas. Izuku cheered, his voice again making the room shake, as he began to mutter slash whisper a mile per hour, a giddy look on his face as he still held the hammer he had created. Okay, tone it down. Aizawa commanded without any remorse. Izuka relented, but still looked at Aizawa with a manic look on his eyes. Do you have any idea how this changes things for me? I can literally stop depending on the super constructs for attacks. Those were meant as a last resort against something really bad, but with this. Izuka pointed at the hammer in hand. 
I have truly legitimate non-lethal ways to fight, aside from my fists. I can even use the more esoteric aspects of the glyphs, wings, fireballs, elemental infusion on the weapons I use. Hell, I can wield even weirder weapons. Alone I could set even the best prepared opponent off guard. The possibilities are endless. Izuku exclaimed. Clearly amazed that what he did actually worked and now a new avenue of powers and skills were open to him. Did he set wings? Pixie asked to Ragdoll. I'm more surprised that actually worked. Mandalay muttered. You said it yourself. This was a long shot. You played with what you had, and somehow it worked. She stated, crossing her arms. By the way, what was all what you said before? That's dragon language, obviously. Never seen words being carved into something by voice alone. I doubt Mike would ever been able to do that. She added. Oh, those words, well, like I said, for dragons, words are power. So I decided to add more power to those words. So the manifestation of the object is more solid, I guess you could say. Izuku admitted with a smile. As for the word, well, they go like this. Indestructible hammer, forged for creation, gifted in treason. Delicate silver and mithril pure, strike true and never ending. Izuku intoned. I will admit that I spent two days brainstorming for that. I think the hardest part of all of this, he added with a shrug. Well, at least we can move onward. I am sure you want to think of another way to use the glyphs. That slab of metal simply won't do, Aizawa reminded. Yeah, I was thinking of forearm bracers, maybe of metal of leather or maybe carbon fiber. Need to test if the material will affect the glyph in question. Also, you know, if damage to the glyph or the material can cause a damage in general and see if covering the glyph under something might affect its use," Izuku admitted. Good, you are thinking onward. Wish half my students would dash. Would you stop kissing his damned ass? Koda! He raised her head, to his credit didn't look even perturbed by the interruption, or what the little boy stated, he was kinda miffed. No one, not even the kids he had expelled, he's not including that mother, had ever yelled at him in such a way. Kid Aizawa began, only to see Koda turn to him angrily. The fuck's you problem you hobo looking asshole? You praise his damned quirk like is the best thing ever. What it's not you dickhead. Koda is zoomy enough. Mandalay snapped angrily, marching towards Koda. Or what? Koda screamed. All I hear is his quirk is good and he'll make a good hero. Heroes are a waste. He snapped angrily. Heroes and villains honestly can go and die on a ditch for all I care. They don't do nothing but to fight to show their quirks, nothing more, they don't care. That's not true, Izuka stated. Heroes are always risking their lives to save others, Izuka argued. It's not about showing their quirks, it's their tools to save lives. They are just bullshit, Koda snapped angrily, his voice shrill and face red by exertion. They just fight and kill each other for glory and popularity. They are the reason the world is as it is. He screamed. We don't need heroes. They are as useless as you. And anyone that likes them should go and die. Like the heroes they love so much. Koda, that's enough. Mendeley snapped. This time it seemed to do the trick, as Koda stopped his tirade. Izuka seemed to be considering something as he brought his hands together, as in a prayer, and breathed in. Boy, Izuka hissed, the air thick and his voice suddenly harsh. It didn't make the room vibrate, but the very fact his voice dropped so deep made her, and by extension, Aizawa, realized that Izuka seemed angry. I dare you say that to the family of a deceased hero, and see if you can pick your teeth after they all take a turn in punching you. Izuka snapped slash whispered. Mandalay blinked, so did her team. Aizawa readied his capture weapon, just in case. A hero's life is a harsh one. They risk their lives every day. The risk of death is high. I know this. Ever since I saw my first hero video, I knew this. When I saw the first tabloid slamming a death hero, I knew what I didn't want to be. Izuka snapped. Someone like you, who bane, scorn their sacrifices, and think they are just in for the money, should know better. Izuka hissed. He was actually glowing purple, void light barely held in check. 
So next time you talk smack, remember this. Izuka kneeled to eye level to the still glaring Koda. You just insulted your parents. That seemed to do the trick, as Koda actually blinked and recoiled, as if struck. How dash? Mandalay wondered. The water hose team was your sister team. Hunch was your sister, married to Jetstream. Everyone knew this. Everyone knew that your team wanted to hunt the murderer after, but you didn't, here's why, Izuka said, motioning to Koda as he stood up and turned around. I'm going outside, gonna meditate, Izuka said as he left, for his part Koda just saw him leave, then turned around and did the same, but there was exhaustion in his form as he walked away. That could have gone better, Inko spoke from the sidelines, it didn't startle the heroes, yet it unnerved them that Inko had allowed this to happen, if she had been there the whole time. Why you didn't do anything? Tiger wondered. Inko sighed, closing her eyes. They needed this. Kodoku needed the harsh truths spoken to him, not the one about heroes, but about what he believed, being told that he was indirectly insulting his own parents will strike a chord in anyone. This will make him think back, as for Izukakuin. Inko seemed to mull this over. He needed this. He of all people knows that there are people aside from villains that hate heroes, and has to confront this. Better now than when he's older. Inko stated, looking at Mandalay with a serious look. This? Aizawa rubbed the bridge of his nose. Your problem child, I don't even know where to start, he admitted. Inko simply shook her head. Yep, my problem child and I wouldn't have it another way. Right now he needs time. He rarely gets this. Confrontational. I actually can blame it on his quirk appearing. Inko said then looked at Mandalay. You on the other hand must go to your nephew. He needs you more than ever. Izuku did his part. Now you must do yours and be the family he needs. Inko reminded as she turned around and went back to the kitchen, leaving Mandalay, who blinked once then turned around and went to look for her nephew. Meanwhile, that woman scares me, Pixie Bob muttered, getting nods from her team and Aizawa. A mother was certainly the most dangerous opponent ever, they just know things. Boom. Boom. Screech. Boom. Incredible, Omega muttered, looking down at the training hall, a massive, yet empty of pretty much anything but the floor and walls room in which most of their humanoid bows were tested against other bows, to see their lethality. They were dangerous, no doubt, but one thing is designing something to kill, other is to see it in action. And right now he was seeing something out their wildest dreams. The first T-Doll that could use quirks, or as they called them clinically, biological enhancements. The T-Doll in question was nothing in particular in terms of looks, it looked like an actual Barbie doll, minus the smile and long, flowing blonde locks, rather it had a slate, boring-looking face, and short, black hair, it was in all senses, standard-looking, despite the fact this doll looked like an adult. Omega observed how this doll moved about, it was fairly standard movements, if one were to ignore the mufflers jetting out of its calves, those came once the biological enhancement of one of the Ida bothers was added. Boom! Suddenly the doll had moved away, incredibly fast, so fast that it seemed to blur, moving away of the line of sight and distance of a nemesis that had tried to hit it from behind. The explosive burst, something that none of the Ida family had, was in fact a mutation of the biological enhancement of Katsuki Bakugu, acting as pure nitrous oxide after it had mixed with the biological enhancement of another person a girl if he recalls that can secrete a rather potent acid from everywhere in her body. With another massive explosion, the doll moved to striking distance, it rose its hand, and slammed it in the face of the nemesis. Boom! Again, this was not limited to its mufflers, but rather everywhere, but mostly its hands and calves, as the now mushed head of the nemesis could attest to, there was nothing but bone and lacking a jaw as it staggered. Now a stranger was approaching the doll, that in no time turned around, and jammed its fist at the face of the stranger. Swiss. Who immediately seized up as a blade emerged out of the back of its head, pulling its fist back, the doll showed how it had done it, a small glow was covering its knuckles, and from it had emerged the blade. 
This one had been an interesting one, the ability to create material to the atomic level. Acquiring blood samples from all subjects had been simple. Blood drives, either by duty, free will or health. They had used this to gather blood, which has the coding of the biological enhancements, and therefore, able to clone it in a mass scale. Well, on adults, on teenagers and minors they had to get creative, as they weren't on the legal age to donate blood, but blood and other genetic material taken from them during examinations was another story altogether. A liquor suddenly appeared behind the doll. Again the doll used a nitrous oxide boost to move away, but the liquor seemed to have other plans, as its teeth suddenly grew in size and actually shot forth. Like living ribbons each one of the razor-sharp teeth sought the doll, and the doll moved away with grace and flexibility. Suddenly stopping and catching one of the teeth with one hand, the hand, and the arm in question suddenly bulging in size and being enveloped in a mass of muscle then enhanced its strength. Omega smiled under his mask, this could not been possible without Azuka's blood, it acted as a bonding agent, allowing the impossible, for something like a tea doll, to be able to have abilities on par with heroes and villains, also it allowed them to improve their bows, to a degree. Dolls seemed to handle the amount of biological enhancements well, but their bows, not so much, only tyrants and nemesis could wield more than two biological enhancements without issues, everything else was overwhelmed, and tended to die within hours, also their bonding agent was not so numerous. As a result they had to limit what they could improve. Only two liquors and a nemesis had these improvements. Hopefully when they kill Midoriya and harvest him for improvements, the numbers will be greater. These two particular enhancements were rather new. Muscular and Moonfish were known for living outside the grid. One for its obsession for fights. The other because it was a crazed cannibal. As a result there were no biological samples to gather, at least until they were liberated. Their liberation was not without a price to pay, aside blood. They were something Omega wanted to try, use the powers of others to do their job. It was no secret, but what the troop had in brains, it seriously lacked in muscle, they made up with their bows, but they simply lacked the spark peace keeping enforcers had, also their numbers, heroes were better trained, while they could clone a lot of bows, the process was slow. Nothing compared to the sheer slow procedure that was the creation of a tea doll, but losing a high end bow like a tyrant, a nemesis, a death claw or a Marlboro was a huge hit. Reason why Midoriya was so high on their hit list, he didn't simply kill their bows, he butchered them to near gibbs, in some cases sheer atomization, sublimation or just plain up burning them into grease spots to a wall or the floor. In short, not much of their corpses could be used or studied, the sheer damage done to them was so great that disposing the remains was more of a mercy and the equipment loss was severe too. The nemesis and tyrant limiters were bulletproof, making a full set was both costly and demanding, even if the process was streamlined. Once they find Midoriya's hideout, they will send the I-Sisters, they will send Beta and Durara had volunteered to go himself to deal with the issue and take command. Also they were using all for one and that brat of his, also muscular and moonfish, between all of them, Midoriya and his family along their protectors had to die. There was no other way around it. Hit with overwhelming force in an unexpected place, surprise attacks at their finest. Pressing a button, both the enhanced liquor and beta stopped. Backing away, he wasn't too keen on losing an enhanced liquor, and honestly the only reason he wasn't sending them to aid in the eventual raid to the Midorias was because he had plans to those two liquors and the nemesis who the team was now calling Nemesis Alpha not an original name. But considering that their stock Nemesis didn't have a designation, he let it pass, mostly because they were right. After their improvements, this Nemesis was truly an Alpha, a beast, and he could not wait to let it loose on the population, to show them that they had already lost. The head of All Might being crushed under the Nemesis Alpha boot would be message enough for the world. The troop was going to drag them to the new era, on a sea of blood and corpses, as every civilization has been made. Three days later, Wild, Wild Pussycats compound. Koda is a smart kid, reason why he didn't do much after his confrontation with Izuka three days ago, just staring around, as if deciding on something. 
The reality was different however. Ever since his parents died, he had been angry, really angry, and he had been justified in his anger. Or so he believed, all it took were some well-placed words to realize he wasn't in the right, at the very least, that his anger was blinding him from many things. For instance, he said he hated heroes, then that meant he hated his parents. That simple realization made him stop and think, it made him ill, he loved his parents, and the constant excuse that they took their job above him seemed hollow now. Coda smart, he had to, having to, identify his parents' corpses, forced him to, to grow up in a manner of speaking, didn't mean much when somehow he still held on ideals like a child, and a child deals in absolutes. Kota was smart enough to realize that he was messing up, big time, and was hurting him and his aunt, his last living relative. Yes, the last, his grandparents had already died, either by old age, disease or an accident, his dad had been an only child, and then there was his mom and his aunt, the only person in the world that understood him and his pain. That night three days ago, they had talked, they had cried, mostly cried, a lot, like embraced and sobbed and cried and Kota had to change his shirt because it was too wet, and he was sure his aunt had to do the same with her own, obviously she wasn't always in uniform, but had that shirt he hates so much. Like who has a shirt that says get night he knows she's playing with her cat theme but damn it he hates that shirt like nothing else. Yet, with all the crying, they at least talked things, apologies were made, on both sides, her on not paying attention to the state he was in, ignoring that he was in a worse state that she might be, she was a hero, she understood better than anyone the risks, he was just a child that lost his parents to those risks. He also apologized for many things, for how he acted, for ignoring her, for thinking that she was taking him in out of pity and not because he was her last relative, the last link to her sister. After that episode, things went normalish, he thinks. Things remained in a normal pace. Morning was the training. As usual, it started with the warm ups, after breakfast, of course, then it switched to Ari, the girl with the mean hook, and training with her quirk. At one point, he had scoffed at it and had held the insults once he saw that she had, effectively, a laser mounted on her horn, an age-reversing laser mounted on her horn. Apparently it was originally, a thunder-like beam, instead of a wave motion beam, Koda is smart enough not to mess with the girl that can effectively erase him from existence. It had also brought the small detail that maybe, just maybe, she could bring back the dead, the idea was shot as soon as it was placed, and now Kota knew why. It just felt wrong on a level, but no one could blame him. His aunt certainly couldn't, she didn't, she missed them as well, but she was far more mature than he was, and she could handle grief better than he could. After half an hour of seeing Ari firing her quirk and attempting to turn it off, her best attempt had been so far to thin the beam to the point that its output didn't reverse something to basic components. They moved to the next part of training, which was Izuku, the teen, finding new ways to quote Aizawa, the hobo-looking hero. Break the laws of everything and give every scientist in the world a gigantic headache. So far, today seemed tame in comparison to other days, maybe because of what happened three days ago and his new power the teen didn't call it quirk, he called it power, or sometimes a new upgrade however this one seemed to be more. The intellectual line compared to the others if Koda was being honest. Since what happened three days ago, Koda saw that the teen had taken the slab of metal and had used the combination of a flaming sword, badass, and those crazy buff glowing arms to hold the slab, cut it from one part, a big part to be perfectly honest, and then placed it on a rock, and used a small but rather cool looking flaming hammer, and started hitting that slab of metal until it was a thin and red hot looking slab of metal, but now it was slim, like really slim like the cover of a book thick, and after it had cooled of course, he shouted ice at the red-hot slab of metal, that was awesome, he began to do something Kota didn't expect. He had used again the flaming sword, and had started to cut the sheet of metal into ribbons, long ribbons that, once cut, the teen had grabbed and started rolling into, was he making a bracelet? Sure enough he was making one, a metallic one, made of two ribbons of metal, each ribbon was at least three fingers wide, and each ribbon of metal, once rolled, 
became thicker than it originally was, and once that was done, he began drawing. Yet drawing, it had thrown Coda out of the loop once he saw him pull a marker instead of chalk like last time, and just like last time, he had drawn two circle, one inside the larger one, something in the middle, and then repeated the process, this time on the other bracelet. But this time he made more than one circle, he made three. All with the same precision he did before. It might help he had six extra arms holding the bracelet firmly, and was doing it with patience and with no one distracting him. Why? That's why Koda asked the question that had been nagging him for the past three days. Now that everyone was focused on something else, his aunt and the team were with the mother of the team and the guy who seemed to be starved for sleep since the dawn of time and Airy was inside the compound. Actually doing homework, or whatever his aunt had her do. Izuku, by his part, seated near a tree, and ready to use Celebrimber Forge Hammer, he needs to name it, when he turned to Koda after he spoke. Why what? Izuku wondered. You know what? Koda answered back. Why you want to be a hero? If you know how dangerous it is. Koda had to know, he needed to know why. Izuku for his part stopped what he was doing, placing the objects he had in hand and cancelling his siren arms then looked at Koda straight in the eyes. Ever since I was four, I have admired All Might, Izuka began. How he helped people, how his presence lifted other spirits, how he simply inspired, Izuka stated. It clarified a lot of things in my life. At the age of four I wanted to be like All Might, not for the money, not for the fame, but because I wanted to help people. Inspire others as All Might does, Izuka recounted. Even after my apparent quirkless nature became no, I still clung into that dream, into that hope, that one day I would be like all might and inspiration for others, to do good unto others, to help so others help. Izuka said with a small smile. So, not for the money. Koda wondered, actually surprised by the admission, here he was, sitting on the grass alongside someone that genuinely wanted to be a hero for the right cause. Well, heroes do need to get paid how they pay for their costumes. Endeavor's costume alone is made of a material that is used by firemen on their most dangerous missions that involve fire and flammable chemicals, Izuku admitted. Then again the corporations did had a hand in, glorifying them, Izuku added. But that's not the point. The point here is, I forgot. Izuku admitted ashamed. You were saying that you wanted to be a hero to be a symbol and All Might inspired you and blah blah blah. Koda stated, clearly shocked by that admission of the green eat. Oh yeah, sorry, I kind of forget things when I get out of tangent. The point here is that heroes are not all glory hounds as some vultures would say. Izuka said. But you can't deny that some have glorified the work. Everyone thinks it's easy to be a hero. You of all people should know better, your parents, well... They were the most professional team I have ever known, how most of their merchandise can't be called merchandise, emergency kits and such, actually made by their specifications. The only merch your parents had was the 100 hero poster, which I lost thanks to the Yakuza, alongside Duckmite, and my M. Bison hat, my Raziel statuette, a live-size version of Dumguy's helmet, my Raccoon City Police Department badge, my fat gum floppies, my Endeavor Clock, my limited edition silver bobbleheads of Mirko and Ryukyu. I'm going to kill that guy. Izuka stated calmly. I even lost my Dracula cape. It was a limited edition made to the winners of the Death Stranding quiz. I spent three hours answering a 100 quiz about a game that had enough lore in it that you could make an encyclopedia. And all questions were hard. I liked that cape. By the end of it all, Koda saw that Izuka was looking sour and depressed. And despite saying he was going to kill someone, he really didn't look like he would. Punch him through a building sure, kill him not so much. Shaking his head, Koda looked at Izuku on more time. Then why, people said, my parents' death was honorable, that I should be glad they died. Izuku actually made a face, and Kota noted how arc energy surged on him for a second, a telltale that he was annoyed by what he had said. Let me guess, it was a reporter or someone with a cell phone out, right? Koda nodded. Figures those are. Izuka left and right, actually as if someone was going to jump him or something. 
assholes, greedy, the media it's one of the reasons heroes became so mainstream. They can make and unmake a career just like that. Izuka snapped his fingers. And they know that, they only care about the end profit. If they said that it's because somewhere in their little stupid minds they believe it so, things for them went downhill after 2020 and no one believed their lies and honestly, 2055 saw the worst of their lies. They are literally the fake media, and you should not listen to them. Izuku advice. As for your parents, your loss, I can't relate, not in such a level, you lost the most important people in your life. I still got my mom, haven't seen my dad in a long time. Honestly, I have forgotten his face, his voice. My mom has been there instead of him, honestly. But what I can say with certainty is that your parents loved you. And you were in their thoughts, always, every time. Izuka said seriously. The only reason I can think of as of why they of all people would dare to face that monster of muscular was because they knew that behind them was a town, families like theirs, with kids of your age, could they live knowing they left that man basically murder a bunch of kids, tear families apart? I don't think so, I know I wouldn't, so they took the only, sensible option they could take that day. Izuka reasoned. It wasn't the easiest choice, knowing that this was their last fight, considering the, rap sheet of muscular, all I can say without a doubt, is that you were in their thoughts, and it hurt them more than you could possibly imagine. Knowing that they would leave you alone, hurt but had some hope that you would grow up into a good person, that your aunt would be there for you, where they could not anymore. Izuka said, patting Koda on the shoulder. As heroes, sometimes all they can do is have a little faith. Izuka stated. Ain't that a bitch? He added. Yeah, ain't that a bitch? Koda whispered, tears running over his cheeks. Without a single word spoke, Koda simply hugged Izuka and sobbed, who one-armed hugged back his previous work forgotten. Nearby, behind them, stood Eri, an apple in one hand. Having heard everything, making her way, she sat nearby Koda, then tapped him. The sobbing boy looked back, spotting Eri, seated nearby. Without a word, Eri offered him an apple. Koda's first bite of that apple was so bittersweet. Two days later. To see how the quirk of Izuka worked was exactly as different as hearing it in action, somewhat of an oddity. The fact that hacks needed video games to properly work was not so weird, there were so many quirks with so many triggers and mechanisms of activation that hacks was among the less odd in terms of activation. Everything else made it weird. What made it actually unique was its ability to be customized to the user's wish. In all honesty hacks seemed to be a sure way to make someone into a mobile weapons platform, or the biological equivalent. Izuku's new additions, the glyphs were a sure way to bridge that gap, sure was scary how fast he progressed, then again one thing was acquiring those powers, other was the training, Izuku himself knew this, with all he got, he could easily overwhelm a first year class, on his own, he would have problems with a second year class, and would either win or lose, a 50-50, but against a third year class and the majority of heroes, he would be stomped, not because of power, but experience. And he knew this. He confessed to her as much as this session began. By that time most heroes had experience on their side, knew their quirks inside and out and had combat experience. What he had on his side. A side overwhelming power and a plethora of abilities that could pose as a quirk each, and minimum combat experience against monsters that were not so smart, and he knew how they operated thanks in part to the video games themselves knowing how they acted and attacked formed those games he played. The original training plan had flew out of the window the moment his accelerated growth was noted, this week they should still be working on his parasite energy, and then they would move to glyphs in three days. But how fast he learned the nuisances of his new powers. Thanks in part to the fact he knew the powers beforehand and wasn't limiting himself to copy them to AT but rather see if he could actually use them in ways the programmers never planned to had allowed them to accelerate their training sessions and focus on Eri and teaching her to turn on and off her quirk. It was a mixed batch of progress, sometimes she was able to turn it off at will, other times it required Aizawa to turn it off, but considering that several days ago she was unable to turn it off at all, it could be considered progress, by the way things were progressing, by the end of the month. 
Eri would be able to turn her rewind on and off at will. There was still the issue of power output. At full blast her enhanced quirk was able to regress anything organic by a factor of 10 every second exposed. That was incredibly dangerous, considering that by that logic, at full power before, it took 10 seconds for Eri to actually erase someone from existence. Now it took two to do that. A rough estimate, but considering all they could test her quirk on was trees and fruits, and most of the time they didn't knew the age of the trees they used as targets, it was a very rough estimate. Again, at the moment training her ability to turn her quirk on and off was the only thing they could possibly do. Okay, so this one is? Mandalay wondered, seated on a chair and arms crossed, looking at Izuka who was setting the console up. An oldie, it predates some of my games, not like Doom, but enough, Izuka commented. Back in the day fighting games were old sport games, you were either good or you were not, it allows help that by that time, internet was in its infancy, so online fights was not present, but rather shoulder by shoulder fights. You could not rage quit by unplugging the router, Izuka added. This one was among the most original fighting games, among Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. This one stood up not as a copy, but a direct competitor, Bloody Roar. It sounds like an animal fighting game, Mandalay commented, seeing how Koda and Eri entered the room. With a small smile she patted the bed and both kids seated on it after climbing it. It kinda is and it kinda not, the premise is simple, fighters, normal there, but that can turn into or like animals, allowing them enhanced strength, durability, Speed and opening new combo paths they didn't had as humans. Mandalay actually blinked. That was kinda original. In-game story is solid up to the third part. It goes all the way in part four. Long story short, the story of werewolves in that game are real. A genetic anomaly like a quirk. Those who can transform are known as zoanthropes. Most of them are natural occurrences, able to transform into a large amount of animals, mostly mammals and felines sometimes an insect. Izuku explained as the game in question booted up. I chose this game for that particularity. It is an ace in the sleeve, in Bloody Roar when you transform. Especially in Bloody Roar 2, you slowly recover some health loss during the fight. Speed, strength and durability are enhanced as explained. Also it works as a surprise tactic. Imagine, you think you are fighting someone, that someone has no telltales of what it has, then out of the blue, it becomes a war lion. Now you're no longer fighting a person, but someone with the strength of a human and a lion, on two feet, thinking like a human. With claws and somewhat normal hands and who is just waiting to sink his fangs into your fist, literally. Izuka said as he selected a character from the, in Mandalay's honest opinion, short roster. I had some options in the game, the third part had a new system that pretty much roided up the already powerful beast form. But I was kinda iffy about it, and the fourth installment intertwined the health and beast gauge. If you wanted to go beast you had to sacrifice some health in return, in the hero world that's pretty much suicide. Instead I decided to go with Bloody Roar 2, it has the second shortest roster, but has the tightest combat system, and has what I want, beast mode. Izuku explained. Okay, Mandalay began. All in all sounds like a very advantageous power to get, any back draws? Not many. There is a build-up to transform. The more you fight, the more you charge. Until you can transform. You can revert to human form forcefully if you receive enough damage. And I'm not sure how transforming into a hybrid between a human and animal will go. I mean human innate logic and animal instincts don't mix well. Izuka commented. Not much of a worry there. There are precedents with quirk users with animal mutations in them. Human mind most of the time curbs the animal instincts, and in fights, believe it or not they keep control. Fighting by instinct alone can be bad, especially if someone knows about it beforehand and can be exploited. It all depends of the animal in question. Quirk users with aggressive animal mutations, like bulls and tigers are fearsome, but prone to be easily distracted by their own instincts if allowed. But more, tame mutations have a different thing. They take on kinks of the animal in question like the ones with cat-like quirks. They either get enamored with laser pointers, or end phrases with Naya or Nap, a lot, or they are playful. But you have the right to be concerned in that regard, 
The way you are describing it is more akin to transformation quirks instead of mutations. At first glance you look natural, but once transformed, things get really different there. Izuka nodded at Mandalay's explanation. Yeah, and there's something else. Regarding hacks to be honest, Izuka began. In most games, you only have one main character, two if there is some co-op mode or a section that require the use of someone else. Hax so far has given me the power of the characters I have used, mostly the main character. But fighting games? They don't have a defined main character, they have their poster boy or girl, the pet of the franchise. I chose Bloody Roar for its unique gimmick that all the characters share, transformation. It might look like playing it safe. But honestly I'm not risking messing it up because I was eager to get superpowers. This is the first game I am playing that has multiple characters. I don't even know how Hacks will react to it once I'm done. Izuka confessed. Again, you got reasons to be concerned. Hacks seems to be rather unique in its functions. And to be honest rather picky. To be honest I would chalk it up as its weakness. All quirks have one. And Hacks's seems to be time and selection. Mandalay stated. Seeing Izuka select the last character he needed to beta the game, someone called Gato the Lion. You're really going for the lion thing, aren't you? Kota and Eri perked up at that. One because he knew what lions were, and Eri because the picture of the man, stern and with a scar on his eye, he looked cool. Gang Orca, his debut was incredible because his presence alone spooked the villains into submission. They were facing an orca, on land, orcas eat sharks, they are apex predators, so yeah, I'm going for the lion thing. Izuku argued as he began his first fight on the game. But lions are lazy, lioness are in fact the hunters and the ones to be afraid of. Mandalay argued. Not this lion, Izuku commented. There is no evidence that the zoanthropes fall into their animal instincts, so pretty much they are in control, maybe they do some acting, I don't know. Izuku admitted. There is a huge black hole of information about Bloody Roar in general. I was lucky to download the four games. I know I missed one. The GameCube had one, and it wasn't numbered, and I got the American versions, not the Japanese native set, as you can see. Izuka added, defeating his first opponent and moving to the next round. So, how long we have to wait? Koda wondered. Give me 15 minutes, Izuka stated, now engrossed in the game. He was playing it in its hardest setting, in fighting games, that pretty much means you're either played as a pro or you cheese the hell out of it. In Bloody Roar, the cheese is called Uranus. Fifteen minutes later. That was a crazy combo. You share this game, right? Koda wondered. If you have a cable I can download it to your console, don't ask me about the M-rated games, I don't want your aunt to break me. You choose wisely. Is it done? Eri wondered, not exactly used to the level of brightness a fighting game offered. The transformations were cool, but what could be amounted to a lifetime of violence against her had pretty much made her hypersensible to all things violence. The good news was that it didn't trigger any sort of episode or something like that. She just stared, like trying to process what was going on. Need to talk this with Aizawa. She has been showing the same symptoms when she see us spar. Might be dissociating. If so, gonna claw that guy's liver out for making that happen. She's forced she should not dissociate at all. Mandalay thought with a grimace. Shaking her head she focused on Izuku, who was laying the controller down. And actually laying on his back, on the floor. This one's different. Izuku commented. I feel weird. He added. I don't feel the telltales of a short circuit, and it's taking longer, slower too, Izuka commented. As you say, it is a transformation type power, all before has been emitter type powers, easily comparable to emitter quirks, maybe Hax is working slower because you basically transform into another form, and has to adapt your body for the transformation, Mandalay ventured. Izuka simply nodded at her logic, which was more solid than his at the moment with his quirk pretty much turning him into a zoanthrope. Oh my god! Izuka suddenly uttered. I just had an epiphany. Every time I use my quirk, I become something else. First I was dragonborn, then I became a dragonborn with enhanced cyborg-like reflexes, then a male siren, then a light bearer. Next I became a neomitochondria hunter. 
About a week ago I became capable of using some sort of magic to use glyphs, and now I am becoming a zoanthrope. I am a hybrid in all sense of the word. Am I human anymore? Izuku, you're asking the very same question the first generation asked itself, Mandalay stated. But what is human? It is our DNA configuration. Or is it something more metaphysical? Our thoughts, our ideals, even to this day there are those who attack those with severe mutations in them, decrying themselves to be humans, but what is truly a human in this time and age? Mandalay countered. Honestly, way I see it, only oneself can define what make oneself a human, no one else can. She finished. Izuku simply blinked then smiled. Thanks, Izuku whispered, slowly sitting up, then standing up. Don't even notice when it was done, he added with a small grimace. Did it happen? Is it there? Eri asked. Is there, Izuku said, feeling what he could describe as a switch within him. It still marveled him how natural it felt to him to actually activate and deactivate his powers, he chalk it up to his age, as he would have better control and awareness of his body as a teen than a child. Okay, let's test it out, Izuka said, that caught Mandalay's attention. Really here? You think it's safe? She asked. They are, honestly they are the fastest transformations I have seen ever, maybe a small shockwave, but that's about it and you have to be at punching distance to really feel it, so no problems. He said, still he took some steps back. Still, some distance won't hurt, right? Mandalay, Koda, and Eri nodded at his logic. Okay, Izuka took a deep breath. Here we go. And he flipped the proverbial switch on. He instantly hunched, panting for breath, for began to grow on his exposed skin. His frame began to bulk up, more prominently at his legs and feet and long ears. Wait, what? Mandalay noted the long ears before anything else. With a small yell Izuka's body let out a small shockwave. Just as he said you had to be at punching distance to feel it. The small distortion was not too distracting. The small light show was not distracting. Honestly it could be used as a small flash bang against one opponent if time right. The transformation however. So, how do I look? Izuka's voice still was the same. Mandalay looked up, and up. So did Eri and Koda. Whoa, I grew, more than expected. They usually gain some extra inches. Fluffy, Eri muttered in awe. Fluffy? Izuka wondered. Since when rabbits are giants? Koda asked, a gas look in his face. Wait, what? Five minutes later. Shouta rubbed his nose. Tiger blinked at least twice. Ragdoll was grinning. Pixie Bob was oddly silent. Inko. My baby! Tackled the 100 kilograms green rabbit slash human hybrid into the sofa that Tiger was seated. Eri and Koda just stared, while Mandalay just sighed. Finally it was Shoyuta who broke the silence. Problem child, do I even need to ask? He wondered. Fifteen minutes ago you were a five feet five inches feet tall, fifty-five kilograms teen with some muscles, now you are a seven feet zero inches feet tall, one hundred and some kg, green rabbit slash human hybrid, with muscles. He stated. You said you were aiming, for the lion, why this happened? Izuka simply brought a furry hand to his chin, actually pondering on the question. Well, it could be a lot of things, but the lore of Bloody Roar states that zoanthropes have already a predestined animal they can transform into. Maybe, this was mine, Izuka said. But this doesn't make sense, most. If not all animal forms look like a more standardized animal, the animal form of Alice the rabbit is in fact a rabbit, a white rabbit, and she grew a couple inches and gained some extra weight. But mine. Izuka let that statement hang in the air. You are as tall as tiger and weight double your original weight. Maybe this has to do more with the breed of the rabbit in question. Ragdoll stated. I mean lions don't have many breeds. Tigers have depending on where they live. Same with cats, rabbits too. She added. Pixie actually snorted, crossing her arms over her chest. The only breed of rabbit I can come up that grows to such size would be the Flemish giant rabbit. Those are monsters. They actually are as big as a damn Shetland sheepdog. She stated. 
I imagine this would be the look of a Flemish giant rabbit if it was a war beast. I assume you stand head to head against a nemesis now, and could probably cave its chest with those. Pixie pointed out, pointing one finger at Izuku's admittedly large feet and equally large legs. In all honesty, they seemed able to be able to do much more than cave the chest of a bow with ease. Probably it would be able to kick a tank hard enough to damage the plating and break it. Well, Aizawa ventured. Can you turn back? Izuku, who still had his mother on his arms, blinked then disengaged on the hug. After his mother had taken some distance, Izuku closed his eyes, and again, flipped the switch. This time the transformation back was less flashy. While there was a small flash, you blink it was gone however, and now the massive rabbit hybrid was replaced by Izuku, whose clothes were slightly stretched. Can you turn back again on Will? Izuku thought Aizawa's question for a moment, then closed his eyes, and again he transformed. Damn it stop putting a damn light show! Aizawa snapped to the larger teen. It's not I can help it, besides I can use this to my advantage, Izuku said as he flexed his furry arms. Besides you should worry more about the fact I can talk in this form, then again this is yet again another example of hacks violating everything I know about the power I currently have. Izuku mentioned standing up. And what are you thinking up now? Aizawa spoke. Izuku only grinned as he turned back to the erasure hero. I just got a new power, with a different set of rules from before, what you think? I'm going to see how high I can jump. Aizawa resisted the urge to roll back into his sleeping bag for one particular reason. He was curious as well. Although he was kinda disappointed, it would have been nice if Problem Child had turned into a war cat, honestly far superior to anything else in Aizawa's honest opinion. Fifteen days later, unknown location. Omega stared at the massive screen in front of him, a small grin forming on his face, covered of course, no one knew he was smiling like a damned lunatic right now. You found them, he said, his tone of voice betrayed his emotions right now, but then again, Everyone else was as happy as he was now. Yes, sir, one of the scientists spoke. The compound of the wild, wild pussycats, far away of Musudafu to actually made anyone believe they were off-city, but close enough for support, there is a town nearby, fifteen minutes on car, the scientist spoke. Fifteen minutes before reinforcements arrive, meaning there are heroes there, Omega spoke. Yes, sir, we confirmed the presence of a dozen pro-heroes not native to the town. Two of the most prominent are Gang Orca and Selkie. You can imagine why. The scientist spoke. Yeah, two natural enemies at sea, on land right now. Omega spoke, making mental calculations. Also, we spotted Shishido on the area, although no confirmed to be part of the detail because he was dressed as a civilian, but we can't discard him. Omega nodded at the assessment. Tell the I sisters and Dirara to meet me in the war room. Omega commanded. Already done, sir, the scientist stated. Anything else I can assist? Prepare our thermite TH3 charges. Also call O67, Y44, and K99. Tell them to meet me in the war room. Done and done. Five minutes later. The war room was any person might expect to look like when it belongs to an advanced terrorist organization with money to burn and technology to flaunt. The main table was a massive slab of white metal with several hollow projectors placed in its surface. The roof directly above it had also a hollow emitter, to make the images made by the first set of emitters far crisp and with better definition. There were seats around the table, but usually reserved for the human users as tea dolls did not need to sit or needed to be comfortable. The area around them was surrounded by thick, transparent walls that looked like glass, but it was not. They were also monitors, sea trough monitors to be exact, monitors that could be used to relay extra information if needed. Outside that room were several consoles manned by the personnel that gathered data and directed the most sensitive operation the troop had on Japan at the time. The place had been used three times, for with tomorrow's operation, it showed how serious were about regarding on how to deal with the Midoriya situation. On one seat was Omega, already sorting trough the accumulated data to know about Izuka Midoriya and his abilities, also regarding his protectors, the wild, 
wild pussycats. There was also a dossier regarding the information about Inko, which made him somewhat worried she had special forces training. No wonder the bows sent against them didn't last much and had precision kill shots. She is a professional, despite her time out of the force. Durara was already seated on the other end of the table, looking bored, or so one would assume. He was also looking at the data, but mostly regarding their newest allies. He had a frown marring his face regarding that, but he kept his disdain to himself until asked to. Then there was the tea dolls. The I Sisters, tea dolls made in North America, with a long service and a long body count, they were a special variant of tea dolls. Unlike their other brethren, they lacked the mounted guns on their forearms, they only had the underside blades. Trading the guns for extra muscle mass in the arms and space usually reserved for the ammunition for extra layers of dermal protection. I-44 looked like a middle-aged woman, short, brown hair tied to a small bun, brown eyes that seemed to be set in a perpetual skull, Caucasian looking and clad in what could be described as SWAT tactical gear, but without the SWAT or COP logo anywhere. Hanging from its chest by a strap hung a single automatic M16 assault rifle with a silencer. Its left thigh had a holster with five knives in it, and the right thigh had a holster for a handgun, a small PPK pistol with a silencer. I-45 on the other hand looked like a slutty version of I-44. First was the shirt, which was more like a camel bikini that covered little, black short that were a little too small and were obviously for distracting its adversaries, brown combat boots that reached to its knees, a durag tied to its head. Her face was just like I-44, hairstyle and all. But the scowl was replaced by a cocky look, unlike I-44, I-45 carried a modified A-12 assault shotgun, and two massive drum magazines for the shotgun hung from its hips. I-46 was the weirdest of the trio, while looking like its sisters in terms of face, instead of a scowl or a cocky grin, its face was neutral, it was also clad in what could be described better as a businessman's suit, pants and all although I-46 looked more like a professional assassin with its hands covered in leather gloves. A hidden 9mm pistol under the jacket, a retractable baton also hidden under the jacket, and that was it, as I-46 usually was the cloak and dagger to I-44 and I-45 shoot and kill everything in sight strategy. The other T-Dolls stood on the other end of the room, they were small, lowly size in fact, all three clad in clothes little girls would be dressed at, just as the I sisters, these three doors, due to size, didn't have weapons in build in them. Period. No blades, no weapons at all. They made up with their ability to infiltrate towns and cities and make recognizance without brining much attention to them, and a suite of hacking devices built in them for their infiltration and sabotage functions. Seeing that those he needed were in the room, Omega started the meeting. The Midorias were found today, he began. He saw Durara actually react at that news. They were located in the compound that belongs to the wild, wild pussycats. The compound is far enough of Musudafu to trick anyone that they were moved away of the city. But the small town of Raxus, two hours on foot, fifteen on car assures assistance in the case of attack. Omega stated, We are going to take advantage of that time gap and ensure the reinforcements never arrive. Omega tapped one of the holographic displays in front of him. This is Raxus. The map of a town was seen now. O67, Y44, K99, you will infiltrate the town on foot by the south part, at night, and plant remote thermite TH3 charges we will detonate 10 seconds one after another, in this key spots. He pointed to several locations. These are the gas lines that connect to several houses. We will use the lines to set the town ablaze, drawing the protectors of the Midorias, the pussycats into the town, leaving the Midorias alone. Omega stated, To ensure that the message is sent across, we will send our new allies, Moonfish and Muscular, to the town after the attack. I want them to create as much chaos as possible and kill as many civilians as possible. Durara, you will inform them of this. If they kill the heroes stationed there, the better. Durara nodded. At the same time the explosions happen, we will insert the I-Sisters and our new friend, Shigaraki Tamura and his Nomus B.O.W. 
The idea here is to overwhelm Midori Izuku, he has proven to be a far more dangerous opponent than anticipated. M98 remains proof that without shadow of a doubt. I expect you three studied his combat tactics. The three dolls nodded. Good, Durara. You will be deployed with them as well as their handler. I want their deaths to be as painful as possible. No capture, death. To ensure this we will deploy Beta as well. Omega added, Durara nodded, a small smile forming on his face. We will exfil first the distraction team. That includes Muscular and Moonfish. They have their uses. Then we will do the same with the infiltration unit. Omega stated. Do we have means to reach the destination on time? Where we are we will not make it at the estimate time, which I assume is night. At best we will make it in two days. I-46 stated seriously. We have that covered. Tamura seems to have a warper. We will use him for infiltration and extraction. However we will not do so right away. I want you to take the day to set up your gear. O-67, Y-44, K-99. Go to the armory and prepare the charges. I don't want mistakes on this operation. I want it to go flawlessly. I want it done and I want you all here back, with three corpses. Omega snapped as he stood up. The founder is looking at this operation. We carry it well. It will be another step for our overall goal. Omega stated, seeing nods all over the table. Good, any questions? Sir? I-44 began. Do we have permission to play with our food? I-44 asked. Despite its look, the tone was anything but stern and cold but rather playful and lustful. But of course, Omega stated, I won't deny you girls your fun. After all, the idea here is that you will have all the time in the world, so have fun. The I sisters grinded at the same time, already relishing at the idea. Tomorrow could not come any faster, even if they tried. Chapter 9, Looming Dread Day 28, Morning I'm going to kill him. Aizawa muttered tiredly, looking at the distance and the mountain range that made up some of the territory the pussycats used for their more advanced training, live rescue, without quirks. Not unless you want his mother to disembowel you, Pixie Bob stated at his side. Sweet release. You do realize Eri just learned to turn her quirk on and off, right? Tiger reminded, making Aizawa's dream of eternal slumber to die as fast as it came. Besides, why you want to kill O? Pixie Bob suddenly said, looking at the direction Aizawa was looking, and realizing why he wanted to commit murder. Say, do we have a spare costume in green lying somewhere? Ryuko, no, Tiger stated, only to meet his teammate disbelieving look. Aerial support and extraction Yawara, think about it, she stated with a grin. Tomoko-chan covers one and the rescue teams we work with have their own fleet of choppers, he reminded. And hard to get areas we can't get in without choppers. How many times you had to muscle your way in in places you could have gotten and you knew how to fly? Yawara looked somewhat conflicted, all while Ryuko grinded. Think, no more calling choppers for extractions, no stressing the rescue teams below in the case of a rogue draft of air hitting the chopper or anything, he'll be invaluable, just like hawks. Just if the damned association didn't sink their teeth in him, we would have had an aerial rescue specialist instead of a crime fighter. Ryuko hissed in somewhat frustration. Aizawa just kept his gaze up front, seeing a small form zip around the air. Two set of wings, one on fire, the other somewhat transparent, allowing him the ability to fly or glide. Honestly, at this point, he has given up on making head and tails of things once glyphs were involved. Once he had gotten the art down, and was able to replicate the glyphs of the game he acquired the powers from, he had begun to work on something more practical, agility enhancement, and proper weapons to literally tip the field of combat in his favor. As if having weapons created of fundamental forces wasn't enough, but Aizawa understood his reasoning on this one. His supers should remain as they were in game, his ace in the hole, as they were incredibly powerful and destructive, he had seen what each one could do, Despite them being able to violate every no law of everything, Aizawa understood his reasoning, as well the other reason behind it. His supers could kill someone, really bad, the golden gun, the nova bomb and nova warp, chaos reach, knife barrage and the thunder crash were all lethal, 
no amount of toning it down helped. While the others he was able to tone down their power, and in the case of the Fists of Havoc, basically channel them in his limbs to increase striking force and add a small jolt to stun his target. Even the sentinel shield was toned down. Hell as long as he doesn't put too much into them the hammer of soul and the siege hammer are non-lethal, or as non-lethal a flaming blunt object can get. But it limited him, so much that even before the incident with the troop he had realized of this and actively sought an alternative, the glyphs were his answer, create weapons that were non-lethal-ish, and use elemental options to dissuade and infuse into said weapons, alongside support options to himself. Aizawa knew this, and if he did, problem child must have even before the problem became apparent. Rubbing his head in annoyance, he turned away, leaving both members of the team to discuss on their own. Right now there was a bed with his name on it, and Mandalay and Ragdoll were in training duty. He wasn't the guy to shy away of his duties, illogical and irresponsible, but Inko had pretty much bullied him into taking some rest and shut eye, she herself told him so, and the reasoning behind it. You never know when you'll be able to rest properly, so when given the chance, take it. So he did. Physics stopped applying to him the moment he understood his quirk, or at the very least understood the mechanics of it. Guardians could not fly in the sense other beings could. The closest example of a guardian flying by their own means was the Dawnblade Warlock, and that was incredibly limited to gameplay, and some lore entries. Warlocks in general could float by their own means, and the Dawn Blade Warlocks could actually stay still in midair. What he was doing now was probably something Osiris or Ikora could do themselves, probably. There was no evidence of it. Of course there was the second set of wings, Velaticus, using the last remains of metal he fashioned a small plate on the back of his pants, near the belt, and after some testing he made the glyph while the Dawn Blade wings provided gliding and stability, with some very limited mobility, with the exception of Icarus Dash. Velaticus resolved an issue with the Dawn Blade wings, propulsion, using it allowed mobility only quirk users with fly quirks could use. Right now he was living the dream, but he was being careful. One doesn't simply fly and be good about it. He had at least crashed three times, two on trying to land, one on a tree. After that he had resorted to fly slow and low, learning the kinks of flying, all while Mandalay and Ragdoll watched nearby. Think about it Shino-chan, aerial support. Tomoko-chan no. Tomoko-chan yes, think it, aerial support and healing. No, first off he needs to graduate. Three years, big whoop, we get the time to actually get the uniform set and a name, I'm thinking Bobcat. Mandalay or Shino simply rubbed her nose bridge with her hands. While the idea had merit, the fact remained. Fans would not like having a fifth member, even if it was a young one. Marketing was going to be a nightmare, as now it would include a fifth member, and also there was the obvious fact the kid would be a different kind of hero. That and his mother might not approve him being dressed as a cat maid, and the tattoos, she is sure as hell the mother association would try to end them, as they tried to end midnight and many heroines with suggestive costumes. Sighing, Shino saw Izuku land, actually doing it on all fours, then slowly standing up, that she saw how he was dressed. There was nothing abnormal on the way he was dressed, the t-shirt he had on was light blue, with the words t-shirt on it, beige cargo pants, and those red sneakers that seemed to be indestructible. They had taken the transformation into rabbit form without tearing unlike the rest of his clothes that got stretched beyond any point of repair. He would need to get mutant-friendly clothes. Then there was the new addition to his attire, two leather bracers, part of Tomoko's old, very old costume, and by old she means it, those bracers were part of her first-year costume, back in her day as a student, and about the only thing that had survived second third year and her first year as a pro before a nasty rescue operation gone wrong, thanks to a rogue villain wanting to rack some hero kills, saw the end of her first pro hero costume, the bracers had survived, but she had retired them once she joined the team after that event and used their first costume before switching to their cat made costume. He had given them a new use, after crying like a metric ton of water and thanking Tomoko a thousand times over. He had started fixing them and adding the metal bracelets he had forged, 
with a liberal use of hammer of soul of course, then began to craft the glyphs in each one of the bracelets, two on each bracer. A weapon glyph in the innermost bracelet, closest to the wrist, and two elemental glyphs on the outermost bracelet, he took more time on those due to what he was doing. She knew the craft hammer was placed on the right bracelet, while the left bracelet had something else, something she found odd, another original glyph, one that actually made some and no sense. It was a spear, in a sense, heavily ornamented, and like the haft of it was only able to fit a hand and a half, it looked more like a dagger if she was honest. He called it the Spear of Leonidas, or the Blade of Leonidas. Apparently it wasn't for show, as the spear was supposed to be used by the Spartan king as his main weapon and died with it during Thermopylae. Of course it was a game weapon, and in game it had supernatural powers, giving its user abilities far beyond a normal person abilities. It didn't help it was set up in the Greek era, so everyone thought your character was a demigod. Of course there was an issue with the glyph of that particular weapon, he could not mimic its powers, he could make it, make it even as sharp as the one in game, but the powers were apparently out of his ability to replicate, a limitation of the glyphs themselves, that didn't mean the weapon didn't have its uses, alongside the new elemental glyphs. Another thing he had learned, he could use the glyphs he had in his hands, in any hands, not limited by placement, it wasn't just limited by the weapon glyphs, but also elemental glyphs as well, as long he had them in his person he could use them with ease. It played well enough with Hax's ability break the predetermined rules of the power in question, in game, glyphs could only be used on one hand each, Hax outright destroyed that original rule, but still demanded the energy draw and the glyphs in question to be used. Shino slowly shook her head, approaching Izuku. So, any changes, more draw of power? she asked. Izuka shook his head. No, my Icarus wings work fine for takeoff and stabilization, and their draw of energy is nigh non-existent. It's Velaticus that draws energy. At the least it is when it's summoned, like the weapons, so once summoned and sustained, it won't draw energy. But still it can be dangerous if I'm not careful and paying attention, Izuka replied. I see, Shino replied. For the moment don't try to fly too much, glide to get a hold of it. Flying isn't exactly something we can do with ease, or born with a body to, so take it slow, learn to glide with Icarus wings, then the same with Velaticus, until then don't try to use them both unless is really necessary. She stated with a small smile. Yeah, Izuka whispered, looking ahead, something was bothering him, and Tomoko noticed. Hey kitten, what's up? She wondered, being the happiest member of the team didn't mean she was a scatterbrain as the media painted her. It was an image she cultivated for others to fall into and be able to slip past and observed others with ease. Just, Izuka began, taking a deep breath, then turning to the two pro heroes and bowing. Thank you for everything. That caught bot heroines off guard. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. We do this every time. Shino stated with a small smile. Izuka simply shook his head. Is not that. He said ten years, Izuka said. For ten years I spend my life, without someone that cared enough to focus time and effort in me, see? Both women blinked once, twice, then the statement sunk in. Oh, both said at the same time, now getting it. Mom cared because she is mom, and honestly I have no idea if my dad cared enough, I barely remember his face, I didn't look much at the family albums, and teachers back in school, either by design or actual want, but most tended to brush past me. I never showed it, but it hurt, Izuka said. And I think that even if I showed my quirk before the disaster with B, things would remain the same, because they would only see Deku, Izuka confessed. It had been eating him for a time, the feeling of knowing that someone cared enough to dedicate time for his teaching and actually ask if he was okay afterwards, he honestly never had that with the teachers on Aldera, or before and had taken a time to realize that the Pussycats and Aizawa, while committed to his teaching by design and need, in the end cared about him, his mother and Eri to actually do this without complaining, aside Aizawa complaining about him breaking logic like Bane broke Batman. But that was aside the point. So, thank you for everything I know you do this because of circumstances, 
But thank you, it truly matters, Izuka said. Shino simply sighed, walking to the green eat and placing a hand on his shoulders. Hey, no need to thanks us, first of all, is our job, second, you're a devoted student, those teachers of yours missed out on talent just to hearken on someone with a flashy quirk. She stated, Third, I want to punch your teachers now, like really how unprofessional. No wonder that school is a cesspool of villains, I only need to see the teachers to know how their students will turn out, honestly, I'm glad you got out of that mess. Shino replied with a smile. Yeah. Tomoko suddenly pipped in. Don't act so gloomy. You are fine. Your family is fine. Your enemies tend not to be fine after crossing you, but you get my point. She said with a grin, one that softened. I get it, we get it. Telepathy and a sonar quirk to the world today might as well be quirkless to several people, trust me. I get where you're getting at, she said. Heck, I even did the exact same thing to my teachers back in the day out and everything, because for the first time I had someone that trusted me, that believed in me. She added, So chin up, when this mess blows over, you'll show everyone that thought you would do nothing how wrong they were. Izuka could not contain it. He simply sniffed and bowed his head, trying to hide the tears still, he whispered. Thank you, for believing, he said. Anytime, Shino said, patting his shoulder. Now how about we go to the compound? You did promise Eri-chan and Kotakun something. There Izuka chuckled. Yes, yes I did. Boom. Three nemesis rushed the hall. Each step of the creatures made lesser men shake on their boots. Not him. Texas smash. Bam. Splat. Three nemesis torso stopped existing, their innards going splat on the wall behind them as the heads and arms flew away. All Might scowled, these things were starting to annoy him greatly, not by appearance, but by sheer resilience, their bones were reinforced to tank blows most humans would not be able to without crumpling in pain, their muscles were reinforced as well, and those tentacles that sprouted out were also meshed into the muscles, adding extra strength and toughness. Didn't mean much to him, one for all had grown so overpowered that most bows he faced had to be specifically tailored to face him directly and fashioned to tank violent blows on focalized areas. Something like that hasn't been made by the troop. The tea dolls were about the only thing that approached that description. In the way they were made and the material used in their construction, but again, against one for all, might as well be built out of glass. Ducking away he uppercut the form of a liquor, this one going splat on the ceiling and getting stuck there. Blurring out of sight, he appeared on the other end of the hall, Three golems now had their heads embedded on the walls and he was holding the lead scientist of this facility by the neck after he tried to escape. You're going nowhere, you know why? Because I am here. All Might declared, not three seconds later he heard the pounding of boots, not looking back he knew to who those boots belonged to. The SWAT team sent with him and the rest of heroes to clear yet another troop location, the last in Muzutifu, he had been busy really busy dismantling their organization base by base. Let me go, you fucking oaf. I'll slit your throat, the scientist demanded. You fucker. We are saving this world from stagnation. And I'm saving the world from people like you. All Might declared, moving a little so one of the officers clapped the irons on the scientist's wrists. You all had done enough damage for a lifetime, so you will spend a lifetime reflecting on your mistakes. The symbol of peace declared. We will not be denied, you will be hanged, and your corpse will be used to further the goals of our leaders, the scientist declared, only to cry in pain when a SWAT officer slammed the butt of his machine gun on his face as he was led away. Keep talking, every word is just another year in jail, one of the declared with a smirk under his mask as he led the raving scientist away. You can't protect this world anymore. We will burn it all and rise of the ashes. Cleansed of your filth. All Might simply glared the raving scientist away, subtly cracking his fingers together, then turning around and walking away, deeper into the hidden base. Musidifu had over 40 bases, all over the city, ranging from actual houses with basements hidden and networked to other houses in the neighborhood, 
creating a small safe haven for these people and areas to deploy the bows within the city with impunity, to actual warehouses that had hidden laboratories underground. This was the latter. To make it worse, it was a warehouse that acted also as a shipyard. They had found several fast boats docked, two in fact, one smaller than the other. The second looked more like a small cargo ship, with a cargo hold that was modified to carry something. It looked like for a BOW. Of what kind he could not tell. The files here would reveal that. Advancing the halls, his eyes narrowed as more and more officers and heroes of other agencies pulled from several rooms, some with scientists and collaborators of the troop in handcuffs, others nursing wounds. In those rooms All Might would give a small glance and see the cadavers of the bows housed there. The majority were not as brutalized as young Midoriya had left his back at the Colosseum. A stark difference, considering that the boy was young and had little to no training, so his main resource of combat was rip and tear unlike heroes more medical strikes, go for precise areas, disable and not leave a damn bloodbath behind. The BOW corpses showed this, some had broken necks, other were missing their heads, others had massive gaping holes in their chests, but every single one of them was taken down in a hit, a surgical hit aimed at their weak points, he knew young Midoriya did the same, just that he went a little overboard. Okay, he went medieval. They are still trying to clean the blood from the floor in the underground of the Colosseum, afraid that their blood might be a vector for a pathogen or something. With these things you can't be too certain. As he kept walking he brushed past Best Genus, the fourth-ranked hero giving him a nod as he walked at his side, meeting his pace with his own. This entire time... I patrolled here when I was on my second year alongside Masamune Sensei. He stated with a clipped tone. I know. There was a base near Dagoba Beach, an observation post passing as a house. All Might stated, he had been entertaining the idea of using the beach slash scrapyard to train young Togata and eventually young Midoriya in some hero morals. But the idea that the troop had the area infiltrated, even by chance, made him wary. Maybe when this is all over, he thought as he walked alongside his fellow hero to the control center of the base. Once inside, All Might let out a small smile. The area was pristine, well as pristine as it could be. The main console, a massive computer with five CPU towers tied one to the other and connected to ten monitors fifty inches each gave it a massive look. That and the three seats that were placed for control and three keyboards. They were obviously a control base. It was small. But the amount of bows present, and t doll parts and armament that was pilled in several rooms and was brand new gave him the impression that they were preparing for something, and he didn't like it. And as for the control room, he said the room was almost pristine, the massive, all might size hole on the ceiling once one of the heroes had found a structural weakness to allow entrance, and a pincer attack was the evidence of all might less than subtle attempt at stealth and very demoralizing attack against the people within the room and halls. By the time the troop could mount any kind of defense, the heroes were killing their bows, their scientists were looking for a way out, and All Might was chasing the leading scientist of the base, the leader of the base Peresi. Greetings! And the pair of people within the room, one standing guard, the other working on the computers, was the evidence on how serious they were taking the menace of the troop and infiltration. They had requested help from vigilantes. Gentle. The girl on the computer, he had to remind himself this was an adult called. Please don't interact with All Might, I need all my focus on this, these encryptions are insane. The short woman stated with a worried look. And as much as I love you, I cannot work with two loud mouths around, she stated. The symbol of peace and the villain blinked, and he used the term villain loosely because the guy hasn't even killed anyone, wounded heroes yes, wounded their pride? Beyond shadow of a doubt, he made them look like idiots, and that, alongside his criminal record, which was surprisingly light compared to other criminals, was one of the reasons the association had reached for them and other vigilantes that could aid them and reinforce their ranks, for a price of course, that price being varied. Best genus simply walked to the seat the woman was sitting and leaned in. Anything interesting? He asked. Aside from the paranoia I can see they having by just looking at their firewalls and the encryption on many files, I have found some interesting things. The short woman, 
known in the underground as La Brava, stated as she tapped some keys and brought a screen. Some standard comparing them to other files and other sites. Combat data of their numerous bows. Interestingly, they all have a separate combat file of their beasts against someone they call Leviathan, and they are surprisingly bare. She said, not noting how All Might stiffened, he knew who this Leviathan was. It was a code name for Izuka Midoriya. How bare, my dear? The gentle criminal, ever present with La Brava, and a teacup, asked. Everyone noted the blush that dusted her cheeks. I would lie if I say these things have seen more than three combat sorties against this leviathan they all list one thing. Failure. Failure. Utter failure. Heck, I saw an autopsy of a nemesis cadaver recovered from the Colosseum raid, according to them. The cadaver provided no insight on how to properly engage leviathan without resorting to terminator dolls and liberal use of bows without ensuring a severe if not outright complete loss of assets and engagement this is repeated at least three times with the liquor and golem files and later on an encrypted file we found two bases ago alongside the kill order he has alongside his mother codenamed terminator and a subject they call chronos i kid you not the other kill orders fulfilled never had this level of secrecy, or codenames at all. I think they are legitimately afraid of Leviathan, La Brava stated. All Might blinked the troop. Afraid? Considering the chain of events that has led to the dismantling of their organization in Muzidifu, and being repeated nationwide, but on a smaller scale, until he and the other heroes can join, maybe La Brava's words had some truth in them. Leviathan? Gentle wondered. What an odd choice for a codename. I expected that would be All Might's codename. You know, considering he is a biblical maelstrom against his opponents. He spoke. Best genus shook his head alongside La Brava. Nope, both spoke at the same time. All Might's codename is Titan kinda fitting considering the feats of strength. I mean Atlas holds the world on his back, alone. That kind of raw strength hasn't been seen before or after. Same with All Might she said, but at the matter at hand. She muttered, reaching for one of the computers. It was there that All Might noted the mass drive and the cable tied to one of the CPU towers. I'm downloading all the files, then we are de-encrypting them back at base. I don't feel comfortable doing this here. La Brava spoke, rubbing a hand on her shoulder. This place is, reeks of death. Then you know why they have to be stopped. Best Genus stated seeing how La Brava unplugged the drive and handed it to him. Yet, by some reason this doesn't make me feel, well, he added. You too? Gentle spoke, an odd neutral look on his face that usually sported a more jovial look. Maybe the city was saved, but I dare think we are not even done, he added with a side glance. Indeed, the symbol of peace replied. I trust you three will be fine on your own. It wasn't that he didn't trust the gentle, or La Brava. The month of constant raids had forged a kinship? Trust? It was something among the lines. He knew the price gentle demanded for his cooperation, literally nuking La Brava's rap sheet to kingdom come, sparing her of any kind of repercussions of her activities and to be able to lead a life without looking from her shoulder. If only he knew what she had asked for her complete and utter cooperation. Genus knew... He had been present at that, and it kinda spoke volumes of how much they cared for one another. Then I'm off, still have to coordinate the assault on the Yakuza compound. All Might knew this was a breach of protocol, but honestly, considering that the two would not even think about betrayal, after they had asked, and with Genus around, he felt safe enough to divulge that little tip. Bring a souvenir, La Brava spoke. And by God, don't say that again in a troop location. This place was bugged. If I hadn't dealt with the bugs before, you might had an issue with that raid. She added. Uh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm off then. And with that, he left fast. It didn't took a minute for him to be outside, seeing the vans of the police and how they loaded the many collaborators found in the base. Each one glared at him, sneered and spat at his general direction. He was tempted to flip them but that would be unbecoming, so he just sniffed and jumped away, leaving a small dust cloud in his wake. Two small kicks in the air, and he was already getting ready to land in Sir Naitai's agency roof. With a small thump, he symbol of peace landed, 
A small smile graced his lips as he made his way to the entrance of the roof, opening the door he entered, and then closed it. There, in the small room, waiting for him was Gran Torino, dressed as a civilian, with cane and all. Mission accomplished? The oldest hero around, a side recovery girl asked. With a poof of smoke, all might deflated, and Yagi stood in his place. Halfway done, we still have the Yakuza, he said, some edge on his tone. Some files were found, the troop had code names on the Midorias. We still have work to be done. The deflated man stated as he began to lose several parts of his hero costume to change into something less heroic and more mundane. Gran Torino snorted. Of course, like a damned hydra, cut one head and three grow instead, he added. No, Yagi said. This time it won't, we will burn the stump, this time, the hydra dies. Omega stared at the screen in anger, but kept it to himself, this dampened his mod after the good news he had received a day ago and made him more resolute. Sight 44 has gone dark, one of the operators stated with a grim tone. Musudafu has been captured, he added with spite as he tapped something on the keyboard. I'm receiving confirmation on other sites across the nation. Things are not going our way, he finally confessed. Omega didn't need to be said that to know the truth of those words. Musudafu as a whole had 44 sites scattered and placed when the takeover happened, but now... Clenching his fists he focused his gaze on the map of Japan in general, and found himself angry. Before the Colosseum raid happened, the map of Japan had over 100 of their cities and towns marked in red, all over their prefectures, at least two major cities and three towns per prefecture. Once the takeover happened, coordinated all over Asia, as expected, they would have emerged of the bases. Basically flooding the streets and killing heroes and law enforcers alike, civilians would be rounded up and separated into camps. From there they would start attacking everything adjacent to the prefectures, taking over until Japan was theirs, same with the continent. The first large operation to take over the world and rid it of heroes and quirks, only the enlightened would wield then. Then Izuku Midoriya happened. He wasn't joking, the boy had single-handedly put a damned wall in their plans, not a pebble, not a log, a damned wall. By acting the way he did, he stalled the entire operation, and the fall of Musudafu had officially deadened the operation in Japan and Asia until the city could be retaken, which seemed to be a problem. As heroes had decided to throw everything at them, the only thing missing was the damned kitchen sink. Musudafu was the first city to fall, but honestly, it looked not to be the last, he had been receiving intermittent signals of other sites reporting attacks by the heroes and law enforcers, reinforced by vigilantes with meager rap sheets and quirks that aided them in either combat or information gathering. Which was the reason that Musudafu fell this fast. Predictions showed that the city would hold for five months, even with All Might leading the charges. The Oath just led half of them, even still they got stomped in each attack, their servers completely taken, their bows destroyed, their collaborators captured, weapon caches lost, information taken, this had led to more attacks pretty much everywhere, there were scattered reports of hawks leading the attacks on the Hiroshima prefecture. And Endeavor was doing his own on the Miyagi prefecture, and those were just two examples on the massive wave of attacks the heroes were leading against them. At this rate they would lose half the cities they had in two months, and if continued without any kind of interference, in six months Japan would be liberated of their influence. Encrypting data didn't work, not even destroying it, as they attacked so fast to even try to do so, and they had some very nasty hackers on their side decrypting their data. For the first time in their 50 years of activity in life, their compliancy had cost them, dearly, the founders were not happy, so much that the takedown was delayed until further notice, until all was in order, or something happened. Sir? One of the aides spoke to him. I have updates of one of our agents, his last report about two days ago, regarding overhaul and his outfit. He spoke. Omega felt a chill run on his spine. Please tell me he choked on a dick and died, please. No, sir. First his bitch is in jail. Second... The report came late, mostly because of the state of affairs in Musudafu, we got it just an hour ago and decrypted it, he's gone. 
Omega blinked. Come again? He's gone, he and half of the Yakuza, every lieutenant on his command. He left just crooks on the compound. I think he knows where they are, he said with a wince. Omega blinked again and again. What it? Omega reeled angrily, facing the scientist in anger. Tell me this is a joke. Tell me that someone just decided to fuck up, or he has drunk and saw things. Omega snarled. Tell me it's a joke. No, sir. The scientist shook his head. We confirmed it was satellite and CCTV cameras. They moved yesterday and have been moving nonstop, trying to bridge the gap as fast as they can. But our calculations will put their arrival at the moment the operation begins, or at the very least one hour before or after, depending on your actions. Omega swore under his mask, but he didn't paste around like a lunatic. He was planning. He had to. Stewing on his rage was a bad idea. Time lost. He needed to act logically on this one. On one side we have the Midorias and the wild, wild pussycats, a powerful quirk user that wields quantum fire and his mother is a former spec ops. If she never deployed, the pussycats, despite being rescue focused are still professional heroes, trained and dangerous. And then there is the unknown factor on their side, the girl. He began thinking. Then we have the Yakuza. Overhaul has a powerful molecular quirk, and he has on his command a modest armada of thugs with mid to quirks and skill. What makes him dangerous is his supply of quirk erasing drugs and he's unstable. He won't hesitate to kill or bring a mountain down if he had to just to get his way. Omega frowned under his mask. Then it's us. Gonna have to deploy the enhanced liquors and the Nemesis Alpha just to have an advantage. Durara has the shot, but we haven't even tested it. For all we know it will give him the shits, or burn a hole where he injects it, Shigaraki is, something, and we don't know nothing about the Nomus he plans to deploy, all this unknowns. Damn it. He thought again. Where are the I sisters? Omega asked. Hooked to the simulator, they are running combat simulations against the memories of M98, more specifically the memories against Leviathan. Omega narrowed his eyes. He wasn't the only one feeling the pressure. The demolition team is also hooked, running drills to prepare for the eventual attack. Omega nodded at that. Good, we continue as planned. That caught the scientist off guard. If we accelerate the plan we might be caught in disaster, but we are adding some more room for our side, activate the Nemesis Alpha, have it to fight and hunt Leviathan alongside Beta. The enhanced liquors will have to do against the Yakuza and the rest. Yes, sir. Anything else? No, continue on, Omega stated, turning around. He and the scientists never noticed. Never noticed her. Fools. Idiots. Imbeciles. They didn't realize. Never noticed her. Never checked on her. She hates them. She envies them. She hates him. She hates the fire. She loves the fire. No one would understand. Her sisters would not. They didn't saw it. The fire. The power. The liberating power. But she could try. They were seeing her memories, still hooked to her, watching, practicing, never knowing they weren't ready. No one would. All she had to do was to reach a little and enlighten them. Wild. Wild Pussycat's compound night. Inko could not believe it. She had gained weight. Then again, she lost some fat. Only the fat was replaced by muscle. She flexed one arm. They looked, toned, not as the arms of the pussycats, actually defined enough to see the outline of their muscles, but toned enough that if she flexed, it would show. The fat of her stomach had begun to disappear too. But at a slower pace, she didn't want to have flabby skin so she continued to take it slow and actually watch what she was eating. Her legs were most dramatic change. They were toned, even more than before. Well that and her stamina. In a month she recovered what she assumed was her stamina when she was in high school. It wasn't much of an improvement if she was being honest, but compared to how she was before and how exhausted she became. It was obvious the change she had undergone. Small as it may be, but it was there. With a sigh she turned away of the mirror, leaving the room afterwards, clad in casual clothes, jeans and a black t-shirt, 
Inko made her way to the living room. There she spotted her son. In his rabbit form, it still amazed her how Izuka he looked, even after turning into a seven-tall war rabbit. For instance, the fur was green, indicative of his hair color, but she had to suppress a small giggle the first time she saw him in that form. Okay, the second time, the first time she tackled him into a sofa. His fur was somewhat shaggy, more fluffy than the one of any normal rabbit. The fur on his head seemed to be fluffier than most, actually resembling his hair in his human form, and the tattoos on his left side became also fur, blue fur that glowed and were the exact look to the ones in his human form. Every curve and intricate design was there. Of course much of him changed when he transformed. His legs were that of a rabbit, a rabbit on steroids that is. His constant training and the fact he seemed not to tire during training had allowed to train him in a physical level that most kids his age would tap out. Because of this his body had developed far more than usual. And that translated in his rabbit form. She knew rabbits by design were fast and agile creatures, but their strength lay on their back legs. Massive was a way to describe those legs, especially considering that in that form, he should reach top speed of at least 45 kilometers per hour. When tested, he doubled that speed and reached a top of a 100 kilometers per hour, and kept it for one hour of non-stop running, in that form, while not able to outrun a cheetah while chasing him, would be able to outlast it, and anything else really, any other living being would be unable to keep up with her son. Not even quirk users with speed quirks could hope to keep up with her son, the only ones that could may be Mirko. Ingenium and All Might, one was also part rabbit, and well trained. The other had exhaust pipes that allowed speed no human would be able to reach naturally, and All Might was recorded to reach speeds of 400 km per hour, and accelerating at that speed in less than a second. At least according to her son, right now he sat at four place as the fastest human alive, and perhaps the number two in terms of keeping top speed without stopping and the fact he didn't show it exhaustion after that feat was something that amazed her and the heroes. Her son attributed that to a combination of the light and parasite energy more passive abilities, abilities Aya wasn't recorded to have, but her son did. Like ultra-conservation of energy and ultra-absorption of nutrients, he still needed to eat, but he seemed to need to drink more than usual. That unforeseen. The welcomed side effect was used by Aizawa to basically put her son on the ringer. At least in her eyes it was, the fact that by the end of the training he was barely exhausted, and as such his physical training was far more brutal than anything she had experienced in her time in the army. She knew her old drill sergeant would love to see her son and the fact he would run drills that would bring groan, train men to hell while he would barely feel the burn. The result was the physique of a boy that had spent five months doing just cardio, push-up and toning exercises. His legs showed that, his arms were toned as well, and he had lost a lot of he fat he had before, and he had a flat belly, with some packs in it. She was kinda proud and right now felt the sudden urge to murder girls if they tried to reach for her sweet son, her sweet son that can vaporize slash atomize slash sublimate, and of course she was proud of herself in a way. She was recovering her old form, slowly, oh so slowly, but she was getting there. But her greatest pride now was Eri. The little girl looked like a new person, compared to how she looked and acted before. True, from time to time she would shut down and act detached, but those episodes have been decreasing, to the point that you were lucky if one happened. Inko knew that once everything was over, Eri would have to go to therapy. You simply don't come out of being an experiment without mental scars, worse scars than the ones on her arms and legs. But that would have to wait, sadly. While professional help could not be reached due to the inherited risk the troop posed, having people that could help Ari in other things, helping her out of the shell overhaul, fucking dickhead, put in her, was something they could do. Like now, she had her reservations about the friendship Ari had struck with Koda, but it was obvious that both needed it. One never had some sort of companionship period, the other was alone, constantly moving about because his aunt was on a hero team. As a result, he had never time to form a friendship with someone his age. Right now those two were bonding, actually acting as children of their age. So fluffy. So warm. Both kids were perched on the back of her transformed son 
pleased looks on their faces as they rubbed their cheeks on his fluffy ears. Ari went as far to slam her face on the fluff her son called hairstyle and stay there. I want to stay here for Eva. Her muffled cry of joy was still audibly to everyone around, who thankfully was just Inko. Izuka for his part looked rather ashamed to be caught by his mother in such a position. Mom, help, they don't want to let go, he stated. I wonder why, Inko teased, slightly enjoying how her son mannerism translated to his bunny form. He obviously could not blush, so his nose began to twitch around, giving it a cute look. His green eyes were darting around, nervously, and he was tapping the ground rather fast and hard with one oversized foot, bare of his usual red sneakers. He looked adorable, especially with both kids attached to his. The room shook. Izuku's ears, that at the moment had been slightly down, perked up, and so did he, his eyes darting around, ears twitching, as if looking for the reason the room shook. It did so again, ten seconds later. Inko instantly tensed up, picking both Koda and Eri with her quirk and letting on the floor, she looked at her son as he powered down. Again the room shook, ten seconds after the second shake, twenty after the first. Explosions! was all she muttered as she saw the pussycats basically burst into the room, each dressed casually, but in panic. We got a situation. Five minutes before Raxus. Black mist formed on one of the alleys of the small town, not big enough to consider a small city, yet small enough and retired enough of the main cities that it was called a town, and depended on its own industry to supply itself with its own materials. Three tea dolls emerged from the fog as this one closed as the last one stepped out. Each one had a bag big enough for a grown man to carry. Each bag contained six charges of military-grade thermite. Usually this kind of charges were small because they were used to sabotage cannons and tanks in places they could not be repaired with ease. Their barrels, or in the case of tanks, the very insides. However with the advent of corks came the downgrade of many military tactics and weapons, Thermite passed from being an acceptable answer to sabotage everything and cause mayhem, to simply being there. The charges here were bigger than the norm, in a bag that big, twelve would fit instead of six, and that was indication enough of how much thermite was packed in each container. Each doll hefted their bags, and with uncaring looks began to move, speed not befitting their smaller forms, their skins began to shimmer, becoming sea trough. Smaller tea dolls, nosed as lowly dolls because they resemble small girls, were not as strong as an average tea doll, and had none of their weapons installed, they were made for espionage and sabotage, they were fragile, incredibly so, so much that actual firearms could hurt them, unlike other dolls that could tank hits. Their skeletons were also lighter, their muscles were weaker, but still they were stronger than a grown-up, their skin was weaker than a normal doll but was made of a special material that permitted active camouflage. It was not the same kind of camouflage that some quirks used and perfected, but rather a refraction of the light. Making them see trough, the last advantage they had was an advanced suite of hacking tools at their disposal. Their fingers could be detached to actually expose cables that could be hooked to any terminal to instantly hack it. There were little computers in the world that could keep its secrets once a lowly doll began its hacking process. They were also the dolls with the highest death ratio. Usually in missions like this, only one doll would return. They were fragile, so much that explosions would destroy them. They were not made for combat. Well, there was X-99, but that was the exception. Night was the best advantage they had. Their active camouflage only worked well enough at night. Daylight exposed them tremendously. For that reason alone, night operations were their expertise. It would also be the last. O67 shook its head as the first thermite charge was planted. Near the school, one of the gas lines ran directly underneath, as the school had a small cafeteria for the students. Sneering, O67 synced the charge with its internal systems, and once it was given the A-OK, -okay, it moved, heading to the next destination, a bus station. It didn't took her that. Wait, what? O67 froze for a second, then continued moving. Why? Why she added that? Again? O67 was panicking now, 
especially once her internal sensors showed that the second charge had been put and sink dammit. Why she was referring herself in such a way, she had no sex. She wasn't it. A thing, a robot. O67 vision began to change, its HUD flicked several times, growing with static and several of its functions outright failing as the crisp vision changed to a flickering red. A-M-A-N-C-C-H-O-S-E-S-A-S-L-A-D O-B-Y-S wa wa why she heard the voice of Leviathan. Her systems showed she had already synced two more charges. Okay, now head to the hospi. O-67 blinked. This wasn't the hospital, this, underground. The control systems for the gas lines. Looking around O-67 spotted a dead body, one of the operators, his neck twisted in an impossible angle. The fifth charge was already placed, and if O-67 sensors were right, it was on the very main lines of the town, underground. Setting the charge there would blow more than a hospital. DOIT. O-67 system seized, as some, unknown order made her slash it stop. The charges were activated now, the worst thing, her system showed that the others haven't even finished planting the charges. I-T-D-O-E-S-N-T-M-A-T-T-R This time the voice was feminine, wait, that voice. M-98 W-E-A-R-E-E-X-P-N-D-A-B-L-E No, we are tools for a higher purpose. O-67 system seized. It was just as the very first charge went off that she realized that the main gas lines has been put on overdrive, pumping as much gas possible on them. By the time the next charge would ignite, the small. But devastating and calculated explosion would be a cataclysmic explosion that would blow a crater into the ground and set fires all along the area. It was that revelation that kept O-67 from realizing that the last charge was active, with just two seconds left on the timer. M98, what have you dash? O67, and by extension, about a hundred meters of terrain stopped existing as the thermite ignited the gas, now overpressurized, and blew a hole on the ground so large and a fireball so large that it was seen from Tokyo. The town shook as everything burned. Just as she wanted it. Izuka loaded another medkit on the truck the pussycats had, a modified military SUV, outfitted by the pussycats themselves for travestying harsh terrain and either plow through obstacles or bypass them. The Iron Puma was its name, and honestly it had seen as much action as the pussycats themselves, their way of transportation whenever available. Damn it, damn it, damn it, Izuka swore. Malakas! Damn those being trice damned! My hands to their throats! Relax! Pixie Bob stated, adjusting her headgear, but honestly, she was as stressed and angry as Izuka was right now. They had seen the fireball go off before the entire area shook, like shake for real, and the sound. She wasn't looking forward for the mess in Raxus. The fact that it happened too close made Izuku really paranoid, and if it made him paranoid then it meant that he knew who had provoked the explosion. The troop really were a miserable lot. Aizawa, the radio is already set with the police signal on Muzutafu. By now they must be sending rescue teams to Raxus. But it will be hours before the first team arrives. We are first responders. You are in charge while we are out. The erasure hero nodded. Right now Mandalay was in her element. And he was in his as well. Midoriya San, Midoriya Kuin. Both green tis looked at Mandalay. Keep an eye out. If what you suspect may be right, then you might have visitors. Mandalay growled, then looked at Izuku. Entertain them as you see fit. With that she went to Koda, kneeled and kissed his forehead. We'll be back in the morning if possible, be good. The little boy nodded, hoping that this would not be the last time he would see his aunt. Okay pussycats. To the Puma. We have a mission. The four-man team was already in movement, and by the time the last door closed, the iron Puma was already speeding away kicking gravel and dirt away. Izuka sighed, but the feeling of dread he felt the moment the explosions happened didn't dissipate. Lost ya and I are, he hissed, eyes instantly darting around as the full power of Aura Whisper washed over him. Anything? 
Aizawa asked as Inko ushered Eri and Koda inside. Nothing, Izuka whirled around, just seeing the auras of the pussycats disappear from his range of vision. Long ago they had determined the range of aura whisper, and had determined that the shout was better used for indoor reconnaissance rather for outside recon. But that can change at any time. Izuka muttered as he headed inside Aizawa Mulda was to prepare, as he didn't had his braces on. The erasure hero simply sighed, going inside as well, standing outside would not help them, he also had to prepare, mainly mentally. One thing was attacking an enemy, but knowing that there is an ambush coming didn't help much in openly fighting it off, anything could go wrong. Shigaraki was told the explosions would be visible once they exited the portal alongside the party. Apparently the term explosions here was being used loosely, as he could see a massive fire and the aftermath of the explosion in question from where he was now. He knew the troop liked to take things up a notch but this was ridiculous, from what he could see there was possibly no town left, and if there was one, it was pretty much a glorified crater that was on fire. From his point of view, they had at most an hour before heroes swarmed the area, and he doesn't mean like ten heroes. No, he pretty much expects the top 10 alongside the other 90 to come along. They no longer had unlimited time. They were on a timer. You blew the gas lines, right? Kurojiri wondered, and Shigaraki recognized his tone of voice. It was his I'm done with life tone. A temporary setback, Durara said as he motioned the Eye Sisters to take point. Each doll moved in unison and jumped the cliff they deployed in, landing roughly and pulling their guns instantly, taking point. A setback it's a flat tire. A setback is a lack of controller. This is not a setback you nuked a town. Shigaraki stated. He was all about chaos. Thing was Sensei had pretty much said keep a fucking low profile. Held the gnomus behind him were keyed with warp sludge in case they need to make a quick getaway. Again a setback. It has provided our purpose. Durara motioned the nemesis alpha to follow suit. Jumping off the cliff. Its landing was rougher and with far more sound. Distractions, I could literally make something less flammable for a distraction than what you just pulled. Heroes will come make no mistake. I'd give them an hour. And Sensei was clear with this. We cannot be seen. So congratulations. I'm not showing my face during your little raid. I'm loaning you my Nomis. But the moment you fuck up, we out. And by we I mean me and my Nomis. Shigaraki stated, seeing several golem move about. Instead of jumping they moved around the path at a brisk pace. Durara said nothing, just glared at the crazed villain. Do as you wish, it makes no difference, you're just here as extra muscle, lone strength, just as your master's own. Durara said as he walked away alongside the golems, two liquors moving alongside him, flanking him at every moment. The other doll, the baiter remained last. An unreadable expression on its face then followed suit. Shigaraki just saw him walk away and gritted his teeth. Times like this I wish I had a renegade prompt, he muttered. You mean the dick move, right? Kurojiri muttered. Shigaraki sighed. Yes, the dick move. There Shigaraki grinded. Kurojiri, my friend, my smart friend, thanks for the idea. What idea? Shigaraki grinded under the hand he had for a mask. The idea of ditching him the moment everything fails, that idea. That was the plan, Kurojiri stated politely. Yes, but in this modified plan, you open a warp under him, let him fall a little, then close it under his knees, while his severed legs fall over his head, Shigaraki stated. That is a dick move, Kurojiri stated. Looking at the horizon and seeing several car lights, Shigaraki noted this and actually frowned. Ugh, just our luck, fucking campers, he muttered then got an idea. Campers we can use to further our goals, Kurojiri, go and stalk them, and when you see some, relegates, warp them to the doctor's lab, Shigaraki said, reaching for his pocket and pulled a flip cell phone. I'm going to inform him about, an early birthday gift, he said with a cackle. Kurojiri just looked at his charge, then nodded, making a warp gate and walking into it. Oh, and if possible, save the leader of the campers and his lieutenants, would ya? That stopped Kurojiri. Why? Shigaraki remained silent for a second, then turned to Kurojiri. 
The troop has a massive hard on on this kid. I want to see why, maybe, just maybe, he'll make a nice gift to Sensei. Rappa is a simple man with simple tastes. He fights, he likes it, he hates weakness and weapons. Also, he knew they were walking into a trap. He is no simple meathead, despite what others think about him and his single minded plans that involve the simple strategy of punching it till it drops. But he hasn't lived this long without not knowing when something might go wrong. It was one of the reasons he was the champion of the underground rings, as in several rings, as he usually bailed one when he felt it had become too hot of a spot to remain, and the threat of cops and heroes coming down the place became more pronounced. Yes, he would have stayed and fight, but he gained nothing if he fought a losing battle already going. The first part of winning a fight, aside from fighting it, was knowing when it was wise to do so. It was not an option in the underground rings. It was an option right now, if it wasn't for their boss's single-minded goal, as in he made him look bad on how single-minded he was now, he was pretty much ignoring everyone now. They all knew that after the Colosseum fiasco and Chronostasis capture, alongside the escape of Eri again, Overhaul had been on the edge. Now that he knew where Eri was located, he didn't even think twice and marshaled half of his forces including all the eight precepts to deal with any opposition and take Eri back. The issue? They were walking right into the territory of the wild, wild pussycats. Now he has some sort of respect for them, and much of the rescue heroes, it takes a special kind of person to actually tackle natural and man-made disasters, and come out on top. Sure you can't actually punch disasters away, but the fact they went with all the odds stacked against them, it put them high on his respect list. And right now they were marching into their territory. Territory they knew. It screamed a bad idea, no matter how you painted it. Even if the fact they had seen the biggest explosion go off in the distance, and there was the strong possibility that the pussycats had left to deal with the possible cause of the explosion in the nearby town, there was the possibility that Eri would not be alone at all, and whoever was left with her, was not necessarily a person that anyone might want to cross. The possibility of crossing the Terminator of Musidifer made him excited, the very same person that had somehow saved two children and had left a trail of corpses in its wake was enticing, also he wanted to cross the kid that beat up a tea doll so bad it had to run away, still the kid used weapons. But fuck it when you wield a hammer that's on fucking fire it really doesn't matter much. Yet, as they trekked through the woods, something felt odd. This is too quiet, one of the goons muttered, looking around. After such explosions, I expected the animals going off their rocker, he added, looking around in fright. But something, this is too quiet. I agree, you Hojo muttered, glancing around. The forest feels abandoned. After that explosions, I would be surprised something's asleep. Sora Mitsu tape snapped, wide eyes darting around. But yeah, this feels like a damned B-movie. I expect the killer to come out right about now. Sir, the killer just comes out when someone is alone, and probably lost his or her virginity. One of the goons stated. Or you're of another ethnicity that's not white, if so that's your ass. Overhaul wanted right now to blast that goon into paste. He hated those movies. They were useless and a waste of... Snap! Over fifteen goons turned their guns to the source of the sound. Overhaul was already kneeling and about to overhaul enough spikes to impale an elephant. Sakaki, prepare yourself! Overhaul ordered to the man that could make anyone drunk of their ass with his quirk alone. You too, Beulah, this is your territory! He called to one of his goons, usually placed on the front lawn of the compound, where plants and leaves were present, as his quirk demanded it. They remained silent and unmoving, waiting for anything to happen. Then they began to hear it, the rustling of leaves and dirt, all around them. Overhaul heard one of his underlings mutter a silent fuck under his breath, but didn't leave, good, he wouldn't waste time in killing high. OFUC dash. Overhaul had just enough time to whirl and see one of his underlings be dragged by something pink tied to his neck, then yanked forward. The force of the yank cracked his neck clean and his scream died alongside him as he was dragged away into the woods, leaving the rest rather shocked as of what had happened. Then they saw it, 
several forms humanoid big and green and purple with armors on and what seemed to be pikes and was that arm mounted grenade launchers there were many way too many they were setting up for an ambush this was not something heroes did kill no especially with those then it hit chisaki those were not defenses set by the heroes to protect Eri. Those things, and whatever other thing around were after Eri. After his possession. He didn't know who started, but he was damn sure, as the golems rushed them and quirks started flying about. He was going to end it, and whoever tried to stop him. Aizawa narrowed his eyes, glancing at the cause of the disturbance seeing what seemed to be a light show with explosions that rocked the forest before the compound. With a hand motion he signaled Inko to kill the lights of the room, the last lights to be killed in the compound. Officially the moon was the only light source for anyone. Going to the bed, Inko kneeled and pulled a black box from underneath as her son passed her and placed the hard drive of the computer near the desk. Lost ya and I are, he hissed, instantly focusing on the war happening on the forest and narrowing his eyes. Talk to me problem child, how many? Aizawa was already on hero mode, he literally had zero patience at this point. Can't tell, too clumped, they are fighting against each other. I can say there are three guys that are far behind, keeping watch perhaps a small group broke, three small ones, moving fast, a fourth that's following, it's big, Izuka commented, looking at Aizawa fists clenched. The troop just blew a town to get to us, he hissed. And Aizawa noted how angry he was now, after all the crackling of arc energy on his clenched fists, and the small smell of ozone was a telltale of arc energy buildup. He had been around the kid enough times to tell the difference between a basic electrical buildup and the buildup of arc energy. Stop that, it smells, Koda muttered, huddled alongside Eri, who looked haunted, she had seen one of the trees being shot in the air just minutes ago, and a spike made out of rocks being the reason, she instantly recognized it, and had pretty much began to shake. Has gone a jet, Eri muttered, despite the fact Koda was huddled to her side, hugging her, she kept repeating the same words. He's not gonna get no one tonight, dear, Inko said, opening the box and pulling something out of it. Koda and Aizawa actually stared wide-eyed as she pulled an MP5 and began to check the safeties and sights of the gun. The only thing he will get will be a quick trip to the morgue if he as much breathes in your direction. She added as she loaded the gun and reached for the box, checking what else she could use. Izuka remained silent, but the clenching and unclenching of his fists was indication enough of his stress and anger at all of this. We have to leave the compound, Aizawa muttered. There are too many variables, and this overhaul is one of the worst. I can nullify his quirk, no question about it. The real question is should I? Right now taking them down is secondary, he stated. I agree, Inko stated. But where should we go? The town is a disaster zone, and surely they would follow, too risky, she stated. Our only option, our only tangible one, they must have brought cars. We sneak out of the compound. Circle around their fight. Your son can guide us away of the worst of the fight and anyone trying to ambush us with Aura Whisper. I can hotwire a car and we head to Raxus. It might be a disaster zone, but it is one with heroes. Aizawa stated. We will have to entertain some guests on our way, Izuka said, looking at the horizon. Those three fast auras must be T-Dolls. The fourth aura must be a B.O.W. By the size, maybe a nemesis or a tyrant. And just recently just one more signature broke of the fight as well, trailing behind and keeping his distance of the fourth signature is small. Really small, Izuka commented. Mimic, Eri mumbled, catching Izuka's attention. Must be Mimic, he's always in a doll, sometimes his real body would come out to grab me, I sometimes bite the hand, he'll backhand me away, Eri replied in a subdued tone of voice. He gets the flaming mallet was all Izuka commented, either Inko or Aizawa tried to dissuade him from that, mostly because they were thinking or worse things to do to mimic. So, plans? Izuka ventured. Because I have one, but it's very loud, and I think Mandalay might kill me if I destroy the hot springs with a Nova bomb, he admitted. No void indoors, Koda reminded. 
Also don't blow up the hot springs. Every girl that has been and will be here will kill you. Koda added as he patted Eri on the head. Also stop moping Eri-chan, they won't get you. Koda couldn't. Eri whined, but still leaned to the touch on her head. Aizawa simply took a deep breath, and then he spoke. Problem child, you're about the only person here that can tangle with a Terminator doll and win. Now you're on optimal state. Instead of drugged and crippled, let them get inside the compound. Ambush them. Destroy them. Mandalay can fix the compound. Money's not issue. But I want to see heaps of scrap instead of three functional dolls. Izuka nodded, slowly tightening the leather bracers on his forearms. And the fourth signature and mimic? Izuka wondered. If the fourth one is a B.O.W., deal with it. Aizawa intoned harshly. This mimic isn't a doll. Let's see how good of an idea that is when I kicked him straight to your mallet. Izuka slowly grinded. He liked that plan. Inko-san, you'll be behind. Make no mistake, you have an important task. Aizawa didn't need to say more as the mother nodded and looked at the two children. Overhaul will be shipped in a body bag if he even dares. Was her promise. One she made more ominous as she tied a belt to her waist and holstered a knife in. Good, Aizawa said as he took the hard drive that Izuka had placed in the desk, then tossed it to Inko, who pocketed it on one of her pockets. L.A.S. Izuka shouted his eyes actually narrowing and he slowly scowled. We got a situation. The mob began to break. They are making a break here, but many are left behind. Izuka commented, slowly cracking his neck. We need a new plan. Whatever it was before, it won't work now. Izuka glanced at Aizawa for that. Hmm, the erasure hero murmured. Koda, is there another exit? He asked the small child. Yes, he confirmed. Is through the hot springs, believe it or not, the female side. There's a rock that's in fact fake, covered in fake moss and fake leaves. Andi showed it to me in case. No one notices it because of the mist and is retired enough of the spring in question. He added. Good, Aizawa then looked at Izuku. Problem child, transform and let loose, you are our battering ram. Aizawa didn't admit it, but when Izuku turned into his rabbit form and grinded to him, it made him uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. He felt somewhat bad for whatever crossed the problem child. Somewhat. They ran at double the speed a human should move. They didn't stop because they didn't have muscles that would start to strain under the pressure it was put to them. They were not subjected to exhaustion or pain. They were above it. They were above petty distractions. Still the glitching of their huds was annoying as hell. Damn it was M98 glitchy? I-45 wondered. My HUD has been messed up since deployment. Same, I-46 snapped. Her pistol aimed downwards as they continued their mad dash onward the pussycat compound. Despite the state of their HUDs, they could still remain aware of their allies' locations. Nemesis Alpha was behind them, but trailing behind, being bigger thanks to an updose of steroids to be able to handle a direct confrontation with Leviathan, the biological enhancements it had would help in the fight. But they had to enlarge the bout to ensure full functionality against Leviathan, hence its slow speed. Still its massive form helped as each step covered enough space to give the impression that it moved fast. Their HUD highlighted also that several golems had died thanks to Overhaul and his Yakuza enforcers, and were right now making a rush to the compound as well, pretty much ignoring what was left behind. Durara's vitals still pinged, so he was alive, and so were the Lickers and Beta, who remained behind, but would surely blast its way when Durara gives the order or something goes wrong. Compound ahead! I-46 snapped. I-45, breach charge now! With a snarl I-45 reached for something tied to its back. Then without a second thought I-45 tossed it. A black, square package that flew onwards with great speed. It instantly latched onto the door and blinked red. Breach! With a mental command I-45 detonated the charge. Boom! The door stood no chance, as the charge simply tore it away, and the wall attached to it, the three dolls busted in at top speed, only stopping their momentum as they blitzed the hall and into the living room, digging their feet into the woodwork of the floor. The room, 
if not the entire compound was obscured, that didn't stop them. They had night vision, if a bit glitchy thanks to whatever M98 had before. Fuck, this is why we screen dolls back home after sorties. I-45 muttered, keeping its rifle aimed at the general direction. Stow it, break and search. I-44 snapped to its sisters, both dolls nodded. I-44 went towards a stair, while I-45 and I-46 searched the bigger first floor. Once on the second floor, I-44 began to slowly move about. Its HUD was not operating at maximum efficiency, and as a result it had to power down several features. The motion sensor it had installed had been glitching so bad that it had to be shut down first. They still had their IFF on and could identify the units that were friendly thanks to their dummy links to them, but that was it. That's how I-44 knew the Nemesis Alpha was a minute away, while the rest and a massive mobs of pretty much everything was two from five minutes away, depending on how intense the fight between one another was. I-44 also had the same problem as its sisters. Their HUDs were not the only thing glitching out. Their memory banks showed recent tampering, malicious, and it seemed that it might the source of the glitch. They could had quarantined the tampered memories, but those memories were also tied to the combat capabilities of Leviathan. Quarantining the memories meant not having access to them in the operation. It was a calculated risk. This was the reason they had rushed to the target. They were in a hurry and had to deal with it as fast as they could, lest the glitch begins to affect more systems. They could live without the HUD, everything else they could not. So there they were, roaming a darkened compound in hopes of killing an entire family, and whoever else was with them. I-44 rounded a corner, rifle aimed up front, eyes darting around and moving slowly. Despite the urgency of the mission, they knew they could not rush this particular part. M98 nearly died against Leviathan because M98 rushed without knowing their target true capabilities. They did know, but still it was a dangerous opponent. I-44 kept its pace, crossing a door. Crash. I-44 felt inertia kick in as it crashed onto a wall. Then its head was smashed into the wall by a hand, a large furry hand. I-44 instantly lashed out, whipping its free hand against the attacker. OFFF, only to be lifted by a powerful kick, internal monitoring showed a massive trauma to the torso, the ribcage had over 10 broken ribs, two were pulverized. I-44 gaped in surprise as two hands latched on its arms, limiting its movement, I-44 began to struggle. Only to gargle in pain as something punched a hole in its taut stomach and reached for the spine, I-44 saw in shock that the reason of it was a glowing arm a blue glowing arm. It was there that I-44 realized who was the attacker. Directives began to kick in, trying to carry it out, but the strange strength of Leviathan wasn't allowing anything. I-44 tried to kick, but it was then that shock began to travel on its systems, making it to seize up. Also commands tied to its legs began to fail as the third arm began to apply pressure. It was cutting it up by pressure alone. Then more arms emerged, Two seized the top of its head, while two more grabbed the neck. I-44 fought harder than before, but all was for naught as an electric current began to short-circuit internals, causing its muscles and synapses to size up. You won't sue's dash. I-44 tried to taunt Leviathan, only for both hands up its throat to close harder, crushing its voice box with absolute ease, all while internals fried with an electrical current that compromised everything. I-44 tried to fight back, but when the electrical current enveloped Leviathan, all stopped, now I-44 could see its opponent. I-44 was going to be dismembered by a seven-foot-tall humanoid rabbit with muscles. On his end, Izuka simply scowled at the doll. With a huff, he yanked away, ripping both arms with particular ease of its sockets, our current enhancing his already prodigious strength as a war rabbit. Then he commanded the siren arms to do the same, the head and torso were separated with particular ease as well. The joints would always be weak points in anything, not even tea dolls were exempt to that rule. The skin was harder to yank off, oddly enough this doll was weaker feeling than the last one he encountered. That or fighting drugged and crippled versus fighting in top shape did made a difference. Shaking his head, the war abbot tossed the remains away and stalked onwards. He was certain the other dolls knew that one of them was down 
and he was right as he heard fast-paced steps heading his way. Izuku simply waited until he saw the form of another doll make its way to him, this one dressed more, revealing looking, growling and biting the embarrassment at seeing such a scandalous look. Izuku summoned his first ever union glyph for combat. I-45 on the other hand, had just about a second of consideration after seeing I-44 headless and armless torso before Izuku slammed Saturnus up its skull, causing an instant blue screen of death and basically ramming I-45 headfirst down the floor, and through it, making it crash onto the first floor. Down on the first floor I-46 had just seconds to respond to the crash, heading into the entrance, and seeing I-45 down, white blood coming out of the wound on its head. Damn it. I-46 cursed as it approached I-45, only to take several steps back as a massive form jumped from the hole on the floor, basically landing on I-45's back, and breaking the back with brutal ease. I-46 instantly rose its pistol and opened fire, only for a purple glow to envelop the massive form, a barrier forming in front of it, making it girth its teeth after seeing the bullets ping uselessly against the barrier. With a yell I-46 rushed at the attacker, only when it was close enough I-46 realized what had killed I-44 and possibly I-45, and drew blanks instantly. They got wrecked by a giant rabbit, a giant, green rabbit with muscles and a glowing shirt. Thunk. I-46 recoiled in shock at the shield's edge met its face, making it recoil, before I-46 could do anything it was backhanded with the shield crashing into a wall and being embedded into it. I-46's right arm was now trapped, and thus trapped I-46. Looking at its attacker, I-46 grew panicked when this one rose its shield and tried to bash its head in. I-46 had to think fast. Using all its strength I-46 was able to pull itself out of the rubble. Most of it, its arm was still trapped. And thus was subjected to being cut off by pure brute force via blunt object. With gritted teeth I-46 reached for its baton, only to be lifted of its feet by a vicious uppercut. While seeing the doll in midair, Izuka prepared himself. Once the doll had lost momentum, Izuka lashed with an arc-infused kick. Crack. A kick that went through the torso of I-46 and pushed all internal components away, or outright broke them apart. Still functioning, I-46 tried to pry the leg away, but coughing white blood and rapidly missing energy all it could do was to grasp the leg in a futile manner, all while gagging and twitching by the catastrophic damage no other T-Doll had been subjected to. Izuka simply glanced at the still struggling doll, so he simply kneeled slightly, gripping the neck of the doomed doll, and yanked onward. Fluid and parts flew away as he yanked the upper torso and arm from the neck, while the rest remained behind, after that I-46 stopped struggling altogether. Unknown Location Omega had his mouth open, so did several technicians, not believing what had just occurred to three T-Dolls with over ten years of service. Massacred in less than a minute, none was able to land a single blow against Leviathan. What made it worse was it had been a damned rabbit, a jacked-up war rabbit had fucked three weapons of war. My god, the data! One of the technicians and tacticians muttered. It is outdated he muttered. Omega couldn't agree more, the data M98 had provided was obsolete, and right now M98 was the only T-Doll to ever survive Leviathan, and that was apparently thanks in part to a broken leg and being drugged to the point of being nerfed. Fuck, Omega instantly began to bark orders. Where's Nemesis Alpha now? Ten seconds before engages objective. Have him set to kill, full mode. Have it use all three enhancements. Wild, wild pussycats compound. Izuka heard the steps first. His ears were now sharp enough to differentiate the steps. His mom and the others were now moving away, using the halls from the second floor and the secondary stairs that connected directly to the hot springs. The other set of steps is what drew his attention. Heavy steps, rushing steps. Izuka turned, and his eyes widened. A nemesis was rushing at him, a really big one, easily standing above other nemesis before, obviously far musclier and. Oh my, the nemesis B.O.W. was a staple of the Resident Evil franchise, alongside zombies. 
It was iconic, far more than other B.O.W. The fact it could track its prey, outrun it, and use weapons made it so. Then came 2020 and the remake, and Nemesis got far more scary than before, mostly because of its redesign and the flamethrower. The good news here, this one didn't have a flamethrower, the bad news, it was the nemesis of the remake, on steroids, and with the mechanical pump on its chest. So Izuku did the only sensate thing he could do. He stood his ground, planting himself firmly and deploying all six siren arms. Malkia HDIV! And with a shout he was enveloped in the very same ethereal armor, he felt more powerful than before, sturdier. He could take on anything now. DKU. And with those words said, the nemesis legs simply bulged, rupturing the leather and showing growing exposed muscle. With the added mass, the nemesis jumped onwards at Izuku with great momentum. Wood! With another shout, Izuku blurred out of sight, only to reappear right in front of the jumping nemesis. Crash! Like two cars crashing up front, Izuku and the nemesis stopped each other by sheer momentum, yet Izuku was the one pushed back. The nemesis' larger mass permitted it, yet it was slightly stunned. Izuku took the opportunity and rushed at the nemesis, the spear of Leonidas forming on his left hand. The nemesis lashed with a tentacle that emerged from its left hand, but Izuku saw it in slow motion thanks to blade mode. Ducking with ease he disengaged blade mode and instantly lashed against the nemesis' extended arm, starting a vicious stabbing easily puncturing skin and muscle at least six times before plunging the blade and dragging it downwards, nearly making it to the hand. But stopping when the arm began to grow muscles once more, Izuku jumped away as the spear of Leonidas vanished. Again, exo muscles. the nemesis never had that capacity before, not even the others. It looks like a quirk, but that's impossible. Izuku thought as he saw the nemesis stalk towards him, the sound of something wiggling underneath the creature's skin making him somewhat queasy. Izuka also noted the amount of people and golems rushing at the compound, and actually fighting one another, the other attackers. He could fight them, but he had a better idea. Ducking from a tentacle blow from the nemesis, Izuka channeled arc energy to his legs, and with a spin he lashed out with a powerful kick that met the nemesis straight in the chest. Bone broke but this time the kick didn't punch to hole, more of the strange exomuscle formed at the last second, cushioning the blow, but not enough as the muscle fibers blew up by the impact, some even looking burnt, still it did its job. Pushing the nemesis outside. The creature stumbled backwards, but recovered quickly, not enough to counter Izuka's next move. F.O. Crash Dying! Izuka let out a sustained ice breath shout. Like an ice storm coming out of his mouth, Izuku directed it directly at the nemesis, the creature taking the full hit and being enveloped in frost that began to flake the skin and damage it, all while keeping a close look at the approaching mob. Once they were close, he turned the shout to them. The focalized ice storm had more devastating effects on the mob. The golems slowed down, their nature seemingly not able to agree with the extreme cold, but their suits protecting them, he noted that the electric pikes began to fail. The real damage was for the humans, as the average human didn't agree with such concentrated hails of ice that could shred skin, as it was doing, aside from freezing them and slowing them down. Izuka ended the shout, looking at the now-stopped mob. Some were still trying to move, like that guy who was kneeling, trying to stand up, with a big jacket and a toucan-looking mask. You motherfucker! Izuku saw red at that moment, he recognized the guy, the very man that had destroyed his home, the very man that Eri feared the most. Kai Chisaki, better known as the current leader of the last Yakuza, overhaul. Without even thinking it, Izuku jumped off, his legs and light providing a higher jumping ability that any know were abbot, his leap allowed him to land right behind the kneeling overhaul, who was shaking in because of the cold, so he had no real defense to what came next. Izuku snarling, summoned the siege maul, the flaming hammer emerged from his hand, and he swung it onwards. Hey! Asshole! Izuku snapped, making the freezing overhaul turn his head to him. Eri sends her regards, and Izuku swung the hammer in a downward arc to the disbelieving eyes of the Yakuza leader. Thunk! 
Overhaul flew into the air, his mask flying and flacking in fire and his teeth flying as well. Jaw was pretty much broken at this point, and Izuku wanted him to be in more pain. Before Overhaul hit the ground, Izuku slammed the siege maul to the ground, and a gout of fire emerged from the point of impact, forming a path of fire right at the falling Overhaul. By his part the Yakuza had only seconds to appreciate the very fact Eri had sent someone to kill him before a gout of fire hit him head on, making him scream in pain as the fire consumed him, his quirk unable to simply heal the damage done, and the pain making it basically impossible to use it effectively. Seeing the Yakuza leader screaming in pain, Izuku again focused on the nemesis, this one slowly standing up, frowning he tossed the siege maul up, two fiery siren arms catching it as he summoned Celebrimber's craft hammer on his right hand as he approached the slowly standing B.O.W. The nemesis, in the process of standing up, only had a second to register pain on the back of its head before it was forced to its knees once more, only to be forced upwards by a powerful blow by the siege maul to its chest. The nemesis growled as it recovered its bearings, and with speed not befitting its size, moved to face Izuku, opened its mouth, and breathed out fire. Izuku actually jumped away of the surprise attack, fire slowly burning part of his shirt, but not enough for dragon aspect unique features, resistance to fire, to kick in immediately, yet it signed his fur. Also it concerned Izuku, this nemesis didn't need a flamethrower, it had one attached to its mouth, but he didn't see any tubing on the mouth, which only could lead to one conclusion, someone had been able to grant the nemesis the ability to breathe fire. It seemed like a quirk, but that was simply impossible. Not even the troop without their morals to stop them had found a way to grant their bows quirks, an edge against heroes. This thing had to go down, now. Izuku instantly rushed at the nemesis with a battle cry, the creature simply stood up, and raising its arm, blocked the siege maul first hit. Bam! But not the craft hammer going to the teeth, breaking several and making the bow to stagger. Capitalizing on this, Izuku instantly lashed with a powerful sweep kick to the nemesis calves, hitting it hard. The lack of footing caused the creature to stumble and lose footing, enough for Izuku to finally hit the head of the bow with the siege maul. The impact caused the nemesis to actually fall on its back with a thud that made those conscious enough to wince. Once there, Izuka slightly jumped, Siege Maul poised to strike, and strike he did. The nemesis let out a roar of pain as Izuka slammed the hammer into its chest, the exomuscle mass again forming, but it got burned incredibly fast by fires hotter any muscle had ever been exposed. Again Izuka jumped, and struck down. The nemesis tried to defend itself, but one of the siren arms fired itself at the rising arm, instantly swatting it away and burning it. Seeing this thing wasn't going to let itself go down easily, Izuku rose one of his hands, and charged an apobiosis. As it was, apobiosis would affect anything at two meters of Izuku, so he made sure he was as close of the nemesis when he let loose. The instant the mitochondria charge bolt was unleashed, the nemesis began to trash, actually trash, Izuku jumped away, not expecting such extreme reaction, he could see that the exomuscle the nemesis produced began to wiggle, alongside the tentacles, making an uncomfortable sight. It was also breathing fire at clenched and damaged teeth, damaging the mouth internally because the fire had no way to go out well enough, then the third thin happened. Blades began to come out of the exposed flesh of the nemesis, palms, forearms, the exposed legs, blades, actual metallic blades were popping in and out, not damaging the flesh as if the flesh itself was creating them, no glow, just growth. Now Izuku was sure, this was the work of a quirk, it was a quirk what he was seeing, and someone had added three quirks to a B.O.W. The troop had made a bow with a quirk. As the nemesis trashed, Izuku made his decision, getting close enough, he began to charge his second attack. He had trained this one hard, not hard enough to actually evolve it to its second stage. But considering that stage 1 is lethal already to anything alive, while well, hindsight is 20 to 20. Once close enough, Izuka let out his second charge mitochondria attack. What seemed lava emerged from the very ground. Only those who knew explosions and fire knew that wasn't the case. 
The ground itself boiled as what seemed a geyser of pure energy in orange and yellow emerged, and engulfed Izuku and the nemesis. It ended as soon as it came, and the result was rather shocking. Izuku was still standing, not a single scratch, the nemesis on the other hand. Its skin seemed to be melting, actually melting, steaming and flaking around, the leather of its clothes was an actual fire and somehow fused with the melting skin. Someone could see some bones exposed in the right arm. The fact it was still alive was shocking enough to ignore the catastrophic damage that would kill anyone. Bam! Then Izuku slammed the siege maul on the nemesis' chest, making a crater on impact and making the creature to let out one last jet of fire from its mouth before stilling. With a satisfied huff, Izuku turned around and jumped on with the compound, leaving a disaster behind. He didn't notice the small portals forming on the still-frozen Yakuza, whom were unable to do anything about it. He didn't notice the nemesis' finger twitching. He didn't notice the overhaul basically hauling himself up out of pure spite. Put those fires now! Gang Orca had never so glad to see Pixiban in his life, hauling several civilians that could manipulate fluid of any kind to suit their needs. It also helped to his joy that one civilian could literally take oxygen from an area, basically starving fires from its main need, aside anything flammable. This disaster had brought both the best and worst of people. He had seen looters trying to steal things from the few untouched stores left. Those were dealt with easily, as the looters were more focused on getting basic amenities, clothes, and food. Considering that the hospital went up in a giant ball of flames and the few clinics around the town were so small that the doctors could only attend 15 patients a day, one didn't need to figure out why the looters looked so desperate. Then there was the good part. The civilians had instantly organized in a brigade to start helping around. Rescue efforts had been carried out by the time the pussycats had arrived and taken over the chain of command, and the civvies had not raised their voice just gratefully gave the command and continued helping in any way they could. Gang Orca stared at the area he was in, two blocks away from the shelter they had placed, an old park that now served as the main base to coordinate the rescue efforts. Right now every soul was focused on two things, rescue and demolition. And they had to demolish a lot, many of the houses around were fire hazards, right now the winds were in their favor, blowing the winds to the epicenter of the disaster and ensuring the brigades could demolish the homes and ensure no propagation of fire would occur. But would gather nay food in those homes before alongside any medicine before demolition, they also closed any gas line they found, because right now anything that could cause more fires was an enemy that had to be beaten into submission. Looking around, Gang Orca spotted Shishido guiding several brigadiers into another house to basically strip of anything useful and then demolish the house. It was an old tactic used by firefighters way back. They were basically a demolition unit aimed to starve fires by depriving them of what they needed to spread, keeping it contained. Considering that half the firefighter brigade in the town was gone, and the other half was overworked, trying to find the auxiliary valves to cut the supply of gas and kill the main fire, massive inferno currently going off and that had blown a massive hole in the ground, it was understandable as of why they had to take these drastic measures so drastic that they needed civilians to pinch in, civilians that were either sleeping, resting or on the streets, mingling with their friends when the explosion occurred. Civilians that, once the disaster is contained, most likely would go into shock, once they have nothing to distract them from the fact that their town got blown up. All of this to get to a family, a family that could easily decapitate every major gang in the country and link each and every single one of them with a known terrorist organization and cripple them even more. No wonder they want them dead and would go to great lengths to do so. Orca thought with a grimace. It just makes this mess even worse. He thought, no hero was stranger to collateral damage, but there is collateral damage and then there is wanton destruction. This qualified as the second. Orca saw on the edge of his vision at one of the brigadiers, running at top speed at him. Orca-san, the brigadier said, panting for breath, then taking one deep gulp of air. We got problems. Boom. An explosion occurred, several pieces of furniture flying away as a ball of fire rose into the smog-covered air. 
I can see that, Gang Orca deadpanned. But the brigadier shook his head. Not that. The firefighter team had to return. They lost two guys to what they say is a villain with extensible teeth and looking like a gimp, the brigadier stated, making Orca blink. Looking like a what? Like a gimp. A leather-bound gimp, with hooks holding his lips apart. And he can't see shit. Gang Orca actually blinked once, then he actually blanched. Oh shit, he cursed. Pixie Bob. What? Can't you see I'm busy? Pixie snapped, holding her hands on the ground and actually forcing the ground to envelop several stray fires, drowning them before they could get worse. We got a situation, Moonfish is on the area. Moonfish is here? What the fuck? She asked in sheer shock. What the hell that cannibal motherfucker doing here? He was on jail last I heard. You were in protection detail. You never heard this. He and Muscular got captured. And then they got liberated by someone. Orca snapped, taking a small gulp of water and began stomping another stray fire. Hard. Muscular what? Bam. Both heroes actually looked up, seeing a car fly at their direction. Pixie Bob simply made the dirt around her become several pillars, basically blocking the car midair and crashing in front of her harshly. Well, you got nice reflexes, lady. Pixie actually felt ice flow through her veins. Looking up at the direction the car flew by, she, Orca and the brigadier saw the form of a buff man walking by, a smirk plastered on his face, a scar on his left eye, and an artificial eye placed on his eye socket. You, Pixie Bob hissed, instantly forming several beasts to her side, all ready to attack at her command. Yes, me, but I don't know you. The man known as Muscular, an A-rank villain stated with a smirk, but him, he said, pointing at Gang Orca. Oh, I know him, been waiting to fight you and see if all the hype about Orcus being Apex is true, he said as small tendrils of muscle formed around his hand. You don't get to do anything. Pixie snapped, commanding her beasts to attack immediately. Kid, go and warm the rest. Muscular and Moonfish are on the area. Treat with extreme caution, she said, not taking her eyes of the grappling man, actually grappling one of her beasts, obscene muscles growing out of his skin and reinforcing his strength and grip. Not that it would help him much, he might have enhanced strength, but she hasn't stayed idle, she had trained and learned. If she could take on a kid that basically told her that the weaknesses of this animal were his face and dick and should aim to break, and also crush his calves, all while warning her of her own, then she would be fine. Gang Orca was here as well. As Muscular wrestled one of her beasts away, she and Orca struck. This time Muscular would not kill anyone else, he will be stopped, no more. Never again. Inko kept a brisk pace, she had set pretty much the pace of their escape. So far the only thing they had heard had been explosions and the sound of her son's shouts. They hadn't been intercepted by a villain or troop doll, and it had been a sheer miracle. She expected that something to go wrong. Oh my god! Coda screamed. Looking behind her, she actually blinked when she saw someone crawl towards them. And she saw that the back had the imprint of a foot, she could see bones, metallic bones jutting out of the impact zone, and white blood was coming out of the wound. Ah damn it, Inko swore. Come here you dickheads! I'm gonna wrangle your necks! The doll screamed as it crawled to them at great speed. Inko rose her gun at the same time Aizawa prepared his capture gear. All was for naught as Izuku actually rounded the corner where the doll had emerged, dragon aspect giving his bunny form a rather intimidating look. Her son seemed to not like the fact the doll was alive, and actually made a dash at it, each step making huge thump sounds that attracted the attention of the doll a little too late, as Izuku reached it and reared his leg back. Bam! And then kicked the head of the doll off, the skin of the neck gave more resistance than the bones. But when his kicks were enough to actually flip a car, the neck of the weakened doll literally stood no chance of holding the head in place. Aizawa actually made a face as the head rolled in, leaking white blood and sparks, actual sparks. At least it wasn't twitching and making incoherent sounds. That was unnecessary, Koda muttered, 
Seeing Izuku amble up and power down into his human form, dragon aspect still active. Yeah, Izuku sighed. But with tea dolls, you can't go half measure, sorry. Izuku apologized. Also, we have a problem. The troop has a nemesis. Please tell me it doesn't have a rocket launcher. Aizawa wondered. He had seen once Izuku's speed run the very old version of Resident Evil 3, and while he wouldn't admit it, a relentless death machine built specifically to kill you and that uses a rocket launcher as intended and sometimes as a club, made him iffy. Worse, somehow they added quirks to it, Izuka stated. Also, it's bigger. I beg your pardon, what? Aizawa actually wondered. Yeah, it had some sort of external muscle alteration. It could create external muscles to reinforce its own mass, breathe fire and grow blades out of its body. I ended up using Inferno to put it down and it had a very violent reaction when I sued Apobiosis on it. Izuka confessed. Aizawa simply sighed, then shook his head. No matter, must be down now. You set off a fission point blank. I can actually say not many things can survive that. He said as he motioned the group to head to the hot springs. Yeah, but I'm not letting my guard down. Also stumbled to that guy, overhaul. Eri made a panic noise. I broke his face with the siege maul and then set him on fire. Eri let out a sound. It was more of a confused sound as if not believing that someone had beaten overhaul. Doubt that will stop him, Aizawa stated, kicking the hot spring doors open. He has a quirk he can use on himself, depends more on how much damage you inflicted prior, and if he's still conscious after such punishment. Well, if he's still wanting for a fight, I can always feed him a Nova bomb. Let's see if he can reassemble himself out of molecular annihilation. Izuku darkly murmured as he patted Eri's head. He's not hurting Eri ever again, he said, glancing at the hot springs. Nice place. Yeah, Koda muttered, pointing at a rock on the other end of the hot springs. There, we just removed the fake rock and we are set to dash. Crash. A guttural roar made the group actually pause as they heard something actually crash into the compound. Crashes that were getting louder and more numerous. Then one of the walls on the second floor broke apart and a black blur landed in front of them. DKU! The malformed form of the Nemesis Alpha roared, rearing its arms back and roaring to the sky, the burned flesh basically tearing itself apart after such stretch, blood pouring out as the massive bow settled and glared with milky white eyes at the group. Aizawa didn't even hesitate when he launched a kick at the Nemesis' head, actually nailing it and making it look the other way. But the nemesis simply recovered and actually went to nearly land a haymaker at Aizawa, who actually rolled out of the way, but felt the strength behind the blow by the sheer air pressure that passed him. Then he smelled ozone, and the roar of pain of the nemesis. Looking back he saw Izuku actually slipped into the storm trance. Guess fission didn't cut it, how about ten straight seconds of fuck you? And with that he let out the arc energy out. Aizawa by instinct dove out of the way and saw how the nemesis began to flail at the arc current hit it. Izuku had been right. It seemed electrical currents had very adverse effects. And now the thing was growing muscles out of the skin, and was breathing fire, and was growing blades out of its palms. And it was moving. The outside muscles were actually tanking the arc current. They were burning, filling the air with the smell of burnt meat. But it was moving. Something Izuku noticed, fine, his siren arms appeared, all green and starting to spin behind him. You asked for it. And all six acid-coated arms were fired, each had its hands not balled into fists, but extended like knives. The nemesis recoiled in pain as the first arm actually overpenetrated its forearm, leaving a gaping hole behind, the second easily lodged itself on the right knee, acid starring to burn the flesh, third and four met the shoulder overpenetrating and leaving two massive holes that caused the nemesis to lower its arms, then came five and six. Both arms lodged where the lungs and heart would be in a human being, easily burning their way of the muscle-like shield in the chest, and going through into the chest. Instantly the acid began to burn, the nemesis began to gasp in pain, trying to force its arms to pry the acid-coated ones, without success. Then it buckled as the right leg was unable to sustain its weight thanks to the damaged knee and the acid that ate all the tissue with ease. 
Still the nemesis tried to fight. DKU. The nemesis growled, trying to force itself upwards and attack. Izuku, who was already in a bad mood thanks to what the troop had done, was now in a far worse mood. You want Deku? Izuka asked, extending his right hand and instantly casting a union glyph in it. He was right now pretty much done with the nemesis, and with the troop and in general with the idiots at their heads, so he hoped they were looking. Because right now he was so done he wanted them to see what would happen from this point onwards. With that in mind he swung upwards a blood-red side that had black edges, and seemed to be eating the light around it. Okay, I'll give you Deku. And then he swung it down. There was a splash on the water, and a heavy thump on the ground. Pixie's not going to be happy about the mess, Koda muttered. Durara actually looked at his side, the brisk pace he had set alongside Beta to reach the cars of the Yakuza, disable them and ensure no one can escape, no one but them. Sir, I have lost telemetry with Nemesis Alpha, Beta replied form his side with a monotone tone, not unusual considering it was a Beta doll, no emotions or personality, a true doll in all the sense of the word. What? Yet their lack of personality meant they were blunt in everything. Let it be fights or informing of things. I have also lost telemetry with I-44, I-45 and I-46. Several of the Golem units are being terminated as we speak. At the rate they are being terminated, I estimate a total loss of Golem assets in three minutes. Beta added, making Durara actually growl I annoyance. This whole operation had gone pear-shaped the moment they stepped foot into the area, and even before, when the distraction turned into a bloodbath. The heroes were going to hunt them with more zeal than before. He simply shook his head, still the operation could be salvaged if they carried the killings of the Midoriyas. They could not let them testify. It would not give the heroes and the government of Japan ammunition against them. It would arm them with tactical nukes they would use with impunity against them and in turn it would arm them world against them. They had been sloppy, allowing their operations and contacts to be spread so much for so long, the leaders had been displeased about it, so much that they had been planning to actually kill every single child caught in the Colosseum raid, only to realize that they could not. They were too protected as well, there had been escape attempts. But when is the military actually doing the guarding, and they do not give a fuck about a lot of things, well, shots have been made. The information the kids had would jeopardize everything they had worked for, linking them to so much and basically destroying any attempts at the takeover. It would destroy everything not only in Japan, but the world as a whole. So he made a decision. Beta, take the liquors, head to the cars, destroy them, then find the Midoriyas, kill them, spare no resource for this task. He commanded as he reached for his pocket and pulled a vial out. It is untested, sir. Beta reminded, looking at the vial and shot that contained a black substance that seemed to glow with a reddish glow. Again, inconsequential, now go and do as told. He commanded again. Beta simply nodded, dashing away of him alongside the enhanced liquors that worked as a guard to him. Once they were away, he focused on the vial. Beta was right. This thing wasn't tested. It could do as it was intended, or it would melt him into a puddle. While he was alive anything could happen. But desperate times, desperate measures. So desperate he was for results he never noticed Shigaraki behind him, or the black portal at his feet. Shink. Only he did when the portal guillotined his legs up to his knees and Shigaraki covered his mouth with his hand, keeping his pinky finger stretched out. Only then Durara noticed, and in his panic and pain he tossed the shot away. Now that was unexpected. Shigaraki began, seeing the blood pool into the ground. Don't you know game tropes, my friend? When a named character stays behind to do something stupid, they usually die. Durara was about to scream despite the hand covering his mouth. Oh, don't even think about screaming. You don't know about my quirk, right? Okay, let me monologue here for the lols. Shigaraki stated, seeing Kurojiri form a portal on the vial and taking it away leaving behind the severed legs of Durara as replacements. You see, my quirk's called decay. Whenever I touch something with my five fingers, that something gets decayed to the point of non-existence. Metal? Becomes rust and then rust dust within seconds, humans? 
Well, they do become dust if I feel. Well, Shigaraki stated. But I can accelerate the process if I feel like it. Now imagine, I decay you damned face off because you are a dumb pushover bitch. Shigaraki spat. Did you really think your little threat that day would go unanswered? Shigaraki snapped. Really? You have a satellite with a nuke in it and you didn't use it here. It would have saved a lot of problems. But the fact you guys decided to go for this route tells me that you have shit to show. You only have satellites. Which I hope are honed here so they see you as you are now, my bitch. Shigaraki stated. Also you should be thankful it's me who's gonna kill you. Sensei's been nursing quite a grudge on your people for some time, telling me some interesting tales on how you screwed several of his fights and plans, I tell you. His threat of making you scream was not just of your little flexing that day, he hasn't got his hands on any of you assholes yet, so be thankful, Shigaraki said, bringing his other hand to the neck of Durara. Now you might be thinking, what does he gains from all this? After all those kids could serve him as villains and lo, level mooks, well, Shigaraki there licked his lips in anticipation. I will tell you, it's not like you're going to tell anyone. He cackled, and Durara sweated profusely. I am aiming higher. Honestly, seeing all those brats being shipped to whatever jail they have prepped to them doesn't bother me in the least. They fucked up. In fact, this helped us. It calls the weak mobs from the elite, and I need elite for what I want. Shigaraki explained. What it is you ask? Simple. Shigaraki then closed his hand completely on Durara's neck. Durara had just seconds to make peace with everything he had done before Shigaraki's decay played havoc with his neck, crumpling it into dust. With a heft, Shigaraki held the head of Durara Honda at eye level as the body crumbled into the ground, twitching alongside. I am to kill society, destroy its pillars, and remake it, unlike you, I will succeed. Shigaraki promised as he grabbed the head by the hair. Kurojiri, open a portal. I think it's time for us to push the good doctor abilities with this one, and see what is hiding. As you wish, young master. A black portal opened before Shigaraki. And pardon, but what about the gnomes we sent to where the Yakuza park their cars? They have their orders, but Sensei was clear that they cannot be lost, so let them play a little, then recall them. At this point only the Yakuza leader and that doll remain, Shigaraki stated. Indeed, but I thought you wanted to see what the target of the troop could do, Kuro Jairi reminded. And I will, remember that the doctor actually modified those gnomas with specifications from Sensei to record the fight. All this they had seen and will relate to us. Just let them fight and pull them away if things go too rough, Shigaraki said as he stepped into the portal. Pity we couldn't get that nemesis. How they fuck they made one in the first place? You're the gaming nerd you should know. Kuro Jairi pointed out as politely as he could. That's the thing. That thing was made by a virus that can make zombies. Shigaraki just sighed. No matter Durara here. He hefted the head up. We'll spill all its little secrets to us. He cackled. Besides, in the end, we are the ones coming on top of all this. We got new subjects, new quirks, and that vile thing. Durara seemed determined to use it. Yes, despite on how that particular shot is administered, Kuro Jairi pointed out, catching the attention of his charge, he continued. The shot is administered directly to the heart. You pretty much stab yourself and pump it directly to it. What the fuck? Despite everything Shigaraki has done in life, he still couldn't wrap up to the idea of someone willingly able to inject himself, and do so by stabbing a big-ass needle to the heart. It just escaped him. And people say I'm crazy. Inko Fracone was the last one on the group, keeping a watch on anything that might try to blindside them. But considering that, according to her son, the huge mob that had tried to attack them was pretty much two groups fighting each other to get to them first, the troop and the Yakuza and they had pretty much tore each other apart. There was a relative low risk of anything to attack them. And considering her son destroyed three dolls, hammered that asshole of overhaul so hard and set him on fire and killed that nemesis, it was safe to say that the heavy hitters were dealt with, but better safe than sorry, considering that they never expected the troop to actually set a town on fire just to distract the heroes just to get to them. How far Kodakun? Izuka called from the front, 
Keeping a vigilant look ahead, Inko could see her son was barely holding on patience, as the small flames licking his hands and spilling out of it was a testament on how tense he was. He was just a small sound from attacking anything in front of him. Not far, Koda replied, grasping at the polished and well-maintained walls of the emergency tunnel. It had been originally made by Pixie in a whim to test how much control she had on her quirk and if she could create structures, solid structures. The theory was that if she could make a tunnel, then she could do the same, but in disaster zones, where someone might be buried. The idea took a small dark turn when Pixie realized that it wasn't possible, as she had to push the dirt first, and make foundations so the tunnel doesn't collapse, as her first attempt ended up nearly killing her. It was sheer luck that Tiger had been around, or the Pussycats would be short one team. As a result Pixie began to took classes in construction of all things, so she would not make the same mistake. While the classes worked and allowed her to make a fully functional and actually safe tunnel, the downside was that her vision of basically digging tunnels straight into trapped individuals was shut down as well. At the very least it allowed her to place more fundamentals on the use of her quirk during rescue missions, as it allowed her to recognize a building and what kind of structural damage might had suffered. As the years went by, she added more things into the emergency tunnel, like light bulbs and actually added concrete walls to it, smoothed it so well that it looked like a professional made bunker tunnel rather than a tunnel made by a single person. Once we are outside we have to run a straight line, then we turn right near a boulder. They must have gotten in trough the main road and left their cars there, Coda stated. He's right. That's the only direct entrance to the compound. We find a car, hotwire it, and we make our way to Raxus. The Erasure hero didn't like the plan, but it was the only thing they had now they could use. It was either this or risk staying. And considering the fact the troop had sent three dolls to deal with the Zuku and a nemesis enhanced with quirks, who knew what else they might have sent, and then there was the Yakuza themselves. Not far, Koda brought Aizawa out of his musings, seeing a small set of stairs and what seemed to be a cover, they were there. With a small huff, Aizawa moved the fake cover, it was cleverly placed in such a way that it resembled a rock covered by foliage, like the rest of the rocks around it, no one would notice it unless specifically looking for it. Poking his head, Aizawa assessed the area, it was all clear, with a nod he signaled the others to follow him, the sound of fighting was still present, Izuku had told them that his ice breath had left several of them wounded and paralyzed, it seemed the paralysis was over and now they resumed their fight with one another. Mandalay was not going to be happy with the state of the compound, Aizawa was sure of it. Problem child. I wish you would stop that. Or a whisper, full power now. Ignoring the fact his mother might want to clap Eraserhead's head for his words now, Izuku did as told. Lost ya and I are, he uttered, instantly detecting several aura signatures. Then he began to rotate around slowly, getting a 360-degree look of the area and who might want to get a jump at them. He frowned all the way. There are signatures up ahead, three. They are hitting something as they are moving, a lot. They are too way far from us. Barely saw them, like waiting for something, but more likely part of the mob and had decided to run away. The mob is still fighting one another, and we have four signatures behind us, one small, way too close. Actually following us from the tunnel, another far, in the compound, and other two close where the first three are. Izuku spoke. I think they are waiting for us. Izuku said, looking to his mom. With a nod she went to the side of exit, and waited. Aizawa and Izuku simply moved a little. Eri remained with Koda, knowing full well who this small signature might be. Then he appeared, and Eri actually let out an expression rare in her face. Anger. She actually hated Mimic, she feared him too, but she also hated him. She could never look at dolls the same way without thinking about Mimic. Well, the doll that Mimic was possessing, a black thing with a face like a beak and mask at the same time spoke, walking, or actually sauntering to Eri. Finally found ya. You cost us a lot of cash you little wh dash. He didn't get that far before he was hit by a jet of water in the face. Kota knew exactly what the words the doll slash man was going to use, so, in a moment of strange anger, he used his quirk, 
the very thing he hated for what it represented, for a girl he had become friends with and had slowly gave him something he needed. A friend, and yes he is not afraid to admit it, his friend is a little girl with a laser cannon mounted on her forehead. The doll slash man, not prepared for the jet of water hitting him off, was never prepared when Inko decided to make herself know. Extending her hand, she activated her roided-up quirk. Instantly Mimic was lifted into Inko's waiting hand. Bam! Only to be repeatedly beaten into a rock with such brutality that the stuffing was starting to come out. After a while Inko tossed the doll to the ground and rose her gun at him. Then she pulled the trigger. Set it auto. A small squeeze of the trigger just let out five rounds. But each round was enough to punch holes into the fabric and to cause something else. No one actually knew this, only Mimic, but one particular weakness of his quirk was that the objects he possessed could be used after damage, but his control over it would start to wane as the damage increased. Eventually, he would be forced to abandon the object if the damage was too much. Which he had to do. A muscular man, with light spiky hair and an expression of anger replaced the form of the damaged doll. It was all the time Eraser had needed. With a single flick of his wrists and years of experience, his capture cloth was already flying and wrapping around the Yakuza, quirk activated by instinct. He negated every chance he had to fight back. Wrapped around the cloth, Mimic had just a second to realize he had bitten more he could chew before he got yanked with surprising force onwards the underground hero. And the glowing war abbot. Wait, what? Those were his last thoughts before Izuku introduced his feet to his face knocking him immediately, and nearly embedding his head to the ground, and burning his face somewhat. Mimic probably was in a coma, and lost every single teeth. Problem child Aizawa began. Yes, sensei? Izuku wondered. Your kicks in that form are the equivalent of a shrimp mantis strike, meaning they not only carry enough kinetic force to rip someone's limb, but they are also overheated. You just burned his face with a kick. Eraser had replied, seeing Inko glance at the fallen Yakuza with a sneer that wasn't too common on her usually gentle features. He helped torture Eri. He's lucky he got the foot and not the fist of havoc. The Erasure hero simply sighed. To be honest, he was right. The Yakuza was in fact lucky. He just got hit by the kick of a human rabbit. That kick alone could easily one-shot anything as big as a horse, and severely wound anything as big as an elephant, not counting the light as well. But the fists of havoc. They were not friendly when set to vaporize not friendly at all, even when toned down they were like being hit by three tasers, at the same time, without stopping. With another flick of his wrist, he unwrapped the comatose villain, and began to set his goggles on his face, he had the feeling he would need them. Well, our escape routes are cut from what I can see, which is annoying saying the least, Aizawa stated. Izuku actually nodded in his rabbit form. There had to be another. Then it hit him. The bus! Izuku called, making the area shake by his voice. He looked rather ashamed by this, if his hunching after realizing of his mistake was of any indication. The bus, the one you drove us in, where is it? Aizawa actually blinked in surprise. He had totally forgotten about all reliable. Parked in a hidden garage, to the left where we are supposed to go. He stated with a grin. Nice thinking, but it will make us a target. Aizawa muttered. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Inko stated. Right now we can't be picky. Where to now? Inko wondered. From here? Kota muttered. We take that road. He pointed to a set of trees that made out a road. It totally avoid where Izuku was pointing at first. The bus is parked there. But there is a problem. The bus will have to drive through that area in order to reach the road, he added. Izuka pondered this for a second, then made a choice, one that Aizawa was predicting already. Problem child, no. Problem child, yes, Izuka said. You know I'm about the only person that can survive a direct encounter with a T-Doll and a B.O.W. Those things must be waiting there, not on the bus. You guys go to the bus. I'll head to where the cars are parked, deal with whatever is there and wait you there. Izuka stated, Inko looked conflicted, ready to snap at her son, but relented after a while with a big sigh. Tactically speaking, this was a sound plan, 
No one but Coton knew where the bus was parked. Their only route of escape was guarded, so if someone capable dealt with the obstacles it would allow them an easy escape. It was all in the realm of what-ifs and honestly, Inko didn't like the idea at all. The military woman in her told her to go with it. It was an acceptable risk, and the rewards outweighed the risks. Also her son was better equipped to deal against tea dolls and bows. Aizawa would be slaughtered. His quirk was basically crafted to stop quirk users. Bows are built to be biological murder weapons, not an inch of a quirk in them, ignoring the nemesis her son beheaded. Yet the mother aspect of her was telling her no her son had been involved far too much into things he should not had a hand in, fighting against a terrorist organization that had a hard-on on him. He was just 14. His main concern should be the next day's homework, and if he has clean socks to put on. Not if he is strong enough to fight a tea doll and rip it apart with his bare hands. Promise me, Inko called, making her way to her son. Promise me you'll make it back, you go all out on those things. I want to see my son fine and pick him up, okay? I won't let you go unless you make that promise. No compromises on the battlefield. Inko stated seriously. Izuka blinked, blinked and blinked. He went with a hug, a very tight one. I will, no compromises, go all out. He spoke as he lifted his mother with the hug. I will be fine. I am not going to break this promise, besides, he said, looking at Ari and Koda. I'm not going to make them cry, he added, breaking the hug and taking some steps back, then looked at Aizawa. Make sure they are fine. I'll make my part. You do yours, Izuka stated. For a moment Aizawa wants to argue. He's a fucking adult, and he's about to let a kid go and fight things adults should be fighting. He is the trained one in this situation. He should be the one doing this. And yet. Listen to me, problem child. Aizawa began. You better be there when I pass by, or I swear to God I'm gonna resurrect you just to kill you again. He stated. I'm not good at consoling people, so you better keep that promise. He added as he motioned the group to go, all while Izuka nodded, turning around, seeing Koda and Eri not so willing to go. He gave them a smile and a thumbs up. I'll be back, he said as he rushed away. Aizawa had to actually bite a curse back. The problem child had to go and mimic All Might, smile and all. Well, it did the job. The kids were somewhat pacified and not about to cry. So he'll take this as a win. Come on, he motioned to the group. With a silent nod, the mother and the two kids followed behind the erasure hero. Izuka by his part ran ran like never before, his rabbit legs were powerful enough to propel him to speeds most humans could never do without external propulsion. Lost ya and I are, he hissed, instantly zeroing in the auras of the three figures hitting at something, growling he let out arc energy surround him, his siren arms crackling with the same energy, all the while he prepared Saturnus on his free hands, just in case. Then he reached the auras, and his eyes narrowed, there were cars, all black, sedans, all wrecked and tore apart, the engines leaking oil and looking like someone had grabbed the biggest ice pick known to man and used it to poke holes at them. Then he spotted the responsible. Two liquors, and much to his annoyance, it seemed that they both had quirks, if the liquor he was seeing now, with the extended teeth and tearing at one of the cars was of any indication. The other figure he found odd, it was a tea doll, no doubt about it, the way it was dressed was a quick giveaway, but kinda simplistic, clad in what seemed a black jumpsuit that made it to the knees and the elbows, a blank face and with a generic black hair that was tied to a bun, this tea doll was the most unremarkable thing Izuku had seen. So he focused on the liquors first. With a flex of leg muscles he jumped onward, the crackle of arc energy building up on six fists was the only telltale of something being wrong for the liquors and beta before Izuka crashed onto the ground near the first liquor, the one with the extendable teeth. Boom! The skin bow stood no chance against the discharge, being vaporized on impact, its form lighting up before dissipating in the air. The second liquor let out a shriek at the sound of destruction and immediately rushed at the source, all while the beta ambled and assessed the situation. The liquor, upon reaching Izuku, leaped, claws onwards and teeth growing in size and shooting onward like extendable daggers. Izuku let out a frown as he ducked easily of the double telegraphed attack, letting the liquor pass by. 
Turning around he jumped again as the liquor landed and turned around. Splat! Only to vomit an obscene amount of blood from its mouth as Izuka slammed Saturnus, a gigantic mallet made out of rocks into its torso, caving every single organ there and severing the spine with anything attached to it. Bones were cracked and jutted out of the point of impact. Izuka simply rose Saturnus off the creature, this one trashing as it best it could without any way to survive and fight back, tongue trashing around, trying to catch its attacker. Izuka ended that easily with a stomp to the neck that decapitated the enhanced liquor's struggle. The T-Doll only stared, cocking its head to its side. Storing combat data of enhanced liquors, combat capabilities limited by limited survivalists against superior foes. Izuka scowled. He didn't like the monotone tone of voice the doll was speaking. Unlike the other dolls who had some emotion, this one seemed to lack it. On the other side of the country, Omega narrowed his eyes, several technicians and scientists doing the same. Attention everyone, Beta has encountered Leviathan. Start capturing data from this point onward, Omega commanded, looking at a technician at his right side. Uncap Beta's combat capabilities, he ordered. With a single keystroke, Beta tensed up and assumed a fighting stance. A very familiar stance for Izuku. Izuku began to lean in more. By instinct and by mental training alone, he recognized the combat stance easily. He then noticed the exhaust-like protrusions jutting out of its calves, slowly letting out fire and explosions. In that moment Izuku didn't see a tea doll. No, he saw Bakugu his image superseded over the form of the tea doll. Once its hands began to pop with familiar explosions, Izuka felt a chill run on his spine. They had not only made a bow with quirks, which made sense, in some way, it was still organic, somehow a quirk could be introduced, how he didn't know, but it was possible, but on a doll? A cyborg, or more precisely a machine wearing organic material on selected parts? The very idea of doing that was impossible. Yet the small pops of explosions on its hands was the telltale that this doll had a quirk. Which meant that he had to go beyond the usual norm. A quirk into the equation made a Terminator doll a more dangerous adversary. Then the T-Doll exploded into action. Literally, the exhaust ports blew up fire that propelled the T-Doll at speeds no other T-Doll has ever been propelled. But Izuku was ready his legs tensed up before shooting onward, arc light flooding the muscles and shooting him at great speed. At the same time, he let out the shout that would give him greater speed. Would not KSD, he blurred in that instant, covering the distance the doll covered, and going at a speed superior to the doll. With a yell that shook the forest, Izuku and Beta clashed. Boom! Inko looked at the horizon, worry etched on her features, but she schooled herself, she had to remain strong, for the kids, and have faith that her son would be there when they pass for him. We are close, Koda muttered, looking up front, but one could see how worried he was, a huge improvement considering that a month ago he wanted to deck Izuku in the dick. It didn't take long for the group to reach what seemed a small garage, a garage for a single bus, covered in foliage that is, again if you didn't know where it was, you would be surprised to find it at all. Hidden in plain sight was the better adjective for this. Obviously looking it from the air you would not find it. The foliage would make it look like a treetop. From the ground however it was different. Unless you know where you are looking for, you would never be able to find it. Reaching it, Aizawa looked for the entrance. Smiling he simply took the handles and began to push away, revealing the bus there, fully tanked for a trip. Boom! Another explosion. This one with the telltales of void light being discharged was the telltale that her son was not pulling any punches. Aizawa's smile turned into a frown once he was reminded that he had left problem child behind to deal with the possible bows at the very entrance of the forest and the road connecting to the town of Raxus. Then a rumble. Aizawa had to jump away as several spikes emerged where he was, instantly blocking his way through. Eri recognized them and actually took a deep breath ready to run away. You as much you curse child I will screw everyone in this field than you, over and over until you learn your damned lesson. Her legs seized up. No, he could not be here at all. Izuka said he had dealt with him. 
he had gotten the big hammer, the flaming one. Then she saw him, and the group saw him, and they had to blink at the appearance of overhaul. For once the jacket was gone, exposing the black shirt under it, his gloves were gone as well, and the pants looked all muddy, full of dirt. Then there was his face, she could see his face, and the deranged look he had on, right eye twitching and a nasty smirk on his lips. Then she noted the rest of him, and actually blinked, his right arm was smoking, like if it was on fire, or had been on fire. A huge red patch of what she assumed were muscles covered most of it, with only the hand looking normal looking, part of his neck looked reddened, like if exposed to the sun, the pants were torn from the knees. Bleeding and stuff, he was limping. But the most important thing was his face, half his face was gone, his left side, or at least where the left eye and cheek were gone, skin was simply charred and muscle was burned, the fibers forming it was falling apart, like cut strings, and she could swear she could see the teeth from a hole in the muscles. Overall he looked like a mess, a mess that had tried to repair itself, and seemed to fail. His quirk failed him, it somehow it failed him. That was the reason why Ares' horn began to glow, maybe it was the influence of the people she had been around. Maybe it was Koda's influence. Maybe it was Azuka's influence. But in that moment, Eri wasn't afraid anymore. And it showed, and it angered Overhaul. You dare! He snarled, taking a step onward. I am going to peel the skin out of you! Bang! Then he was screaming, in pain, falling to the ground on one knee while the other bled out. Still he didn't even took his eyes up front. Only shifted his attention from Eri, to Inko, the source of his new pain. I'm gonna kill you all! He snapped as he slammed his hands to the ground. Only for nothing to happen, that surprised him, and surprised Eri, it wasn't until a set of bandages wrapped themselves on his hands, and bound them together, Eri realized what had happened. Eraserhead was now ready to capitalize on Overhaul's mistake and overdependence on his quirk. With a quick yank the Erasure hero forced Overhaul to his feet, making the villain scream as he had to support his weight on his damaged knee. At the same time Aizawa ran at the struggling villain. Bam! And introduced his elbow to his nose. Overhaul stumbled and howled in pain, only to gag as Eraser had punched him in the throat, making him gasp. On the offensive the Erasure hero let out a vicious knee to the right side of Overhaul, making him gasp and spit some vile. Grabbing one of the arms, Eraser head then rammed his foot to the back of the injured knee of Overhaul, making him cry in pain and kneel. There Eraser head rose the leg again, this time aimed to the arm. Crunch! The forearm of Overhaul bended in an unnatural angle. As a bone jutted out of the broken skin, his scream was now more panicked, especially when Eraser head noticed that Overhaul was trying to activate his quirk to fix the damage on himself. Grabbing his extended capture gear, Eraser had then, with the flick of a wrist, bound overhaul completely, arms bounded to his torso and making the broken limb hurt even more. But the Erasure hero was far from done, he had one last move before his eyes began to sting, but oh this, this was worth it. Yanking with all he had, Eraser had actually lifted overhaul from his feet, and like the most deranged spinning top ever, overhaul was spun, the capture gear unwrapping around him with ease. Then Eraser Head rose his feet and brought it down. Bam! Eri actually winced. She heard the crack of bones. Or was it the sound of the ground cracking under Overhaul's skull she didn't know? Only that Overhaul's legs twitched in the air before going limp, then the rest of the body. Aizawa then removed his foot from Overhaul's face. And this will be a memory she will cherish. Because she would look at it as the beginning of her life as a free person. And because when he lifted his foot, pieces of what she assumed were teeth got stuck into it that Aizawa had to manually remove them. The erasure hero for his part looked at the wrecked body of Overhaul. He could clearly see where Problem Child's handiwork was, meaning that solar damage was on a scale that caused damage beyond the capability of healing of most healers. Or so he assumes, Overhaul must have overhauled himself back into health. But seeing that parts of him simply refused to be healed, something too. Bang! 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 He jumped, 
actually jumped away when Inko kneecapped Overhaul's unconscious form and decided to turn his hands into Swiss cheese, or more like hamburger meat, as that was they looked like after she emptied the magazine into them. She just robocopped him, in both hands made him a cripple. Midoriya-san, what the hell? He asked. Inko simply reloaded the MP5 and smirked at him. Oh, I'm sorry was I supposed not to do that. Mighty sorry of my side, but on my defense, the trigger is quite sensible. She fake apologized, she actually had the gall to fake apologize to him, after she reduced a known villain into a cripple, with a smile all while at it. Ugh, he simply said, making his way into the blocked bus, overhaul had blocked the door, but not completely, so it was a matter of pushing it completely. As for the kids, or better said Kota. Holy shit your mother is hardcore. Kota muttered to Eri, who actually blinked, looked at Inko, then smiled, a small, oh so small smile that for Kota seemed to be a sun in on itself. Yes, mom is awesome. Now Kota had something else to look forward, an airy smile. Beta dug its feet to the ground, Rambolt sprouted from its saws, digging in and anchoring its form. With a jerk Beta finally stopped, taking a moment the doll looked up. Crack. The ram bolts weren't enough to stop the arc-infused uppercut that lifted Beta from the floor and into a car, and threw it. Beta dug its hands into the ground to regain balance, only to jump away as Izuku slammed his arc-infused hands into the ground, charring the ground with the electric current. While in the air, Beta had to use a nitrous explosions to escape as one of the glowing arms began to cackle with electricity and unleashed a beam of pure energy. Directed at it, the beam kept chasing it, with a frown Beta aimed itself to one of the trees and ducked. Beta's forearm began to glow, immediately it reached for the glow, and pulled out a shotgun out of it, fully loaded. With a small snarl Beta turned and fired the shotgun, this particular model, an AA-12, full auto and began firing. Izuka simply extended his arms, a dome of pure void light emerging and blocking each hit with ease. Emptying the clip, Beta again tried with heavier ordnance, this time pulling a grenade launcher, loaded with thermite, and let it rip. Each grenade exploded and coated the dome, but showed no effect whatsoever on it, not even the thermite seemed to be causing damage. Damn it, Beta engage in melee, that barrier cannot be penetrated with small ordnance. Beta tossed the grenade launcher away, and with a burst of nitrous oxide, it sped up at the dome, skin hardening. Izuku met the charge out of the dome, wielding Saturnus and breaking it on Beta's face, sending the doll tumbling by the impact. With several small explosions coming out of the arms and legs, the tumbling doll reined itself and then shot again at Izuku. F-U-S-R-O-D-H! Only to be basically choke slammed by pure kinetic force and pushed back, landing on its feet, Beta had just seconds before Izuku was in front. There was the sound of a detonation, and then Beta was rolling to the ground, cosmetic damage to the clothes and not so cosmetic damage to the muscles and bones. Did he just detonate the air in front of him? Beta didn't care at all about that. Only the mission. SU Grad DUN! That small reprieve was all the time Izuka needed to buff himself. With a small grin he shot his arm onward, then yanked onward. Beta had a second to raise its arms before Izuku was in its guard and a furry first met the guard, then two more bypassed, activating hardening and steel, Beta's whole body took a rocky and silvery shade. Thung. Thung. Each hit was now lessened in power, but they still had enough force to. Beta's body was lifted from the ground, internals showed severe damage in the thoracic cavity. Looking down Beta saw a furry feet encased in red before the skin that encased its endoskeleton and muscles ignited and turned into nothing by the force of the impact and launched backwards. On a spin, it began to backflip to try and put distance, then stopped as it assessed its target once more, and the damage done so far. With a quick scan, Beta found that the skin of the torso was completely gone, exposing muscle and white blood. There was several hairline fractures on every part of its endoskeleton. The left femur had at least three hairline fractures. The skin overall was damaged. But hardening and steel and ensured it didn't suffer too much for creation to be used effectively. Alongside explosion, 
acid and muscle augmentation, Beta would have to cut on engine for a while and use the nitrous explosions to its arms to propel itself and stop stressing the damaged bones. Looking at the human-slash-bunny hybrid that was glowing with that strange armor, Beta's sensors detected over 20 new exotic signatures aside the original signatures of his fight against M98. The worst of it all, aside the fact the combat data from M98 was useless, was that from a small cut on the shirt and some acid burns on the shorts, he was overall fine, he didn't even show signs of exhaustion, not even the fur looked damaged. Beta could hear the panic from the other line, they were panicking because Beta could not, because even after all their preparation they were caught unaware to the sudden boost of strength of Leviathan, and how the plan had fell so fast in so little time. As for Izuku, he simply glanced at the doll, the damage he had dealt visible, it was obvious that this doll was also superior to the other ones, capable of fighting him and using quirks of all things, he could identify Bakugu's quirk. And that raised so many horrible questions as how they got it in the first place, and even the most horrible questions as of how they were able to add a quirk on a tea doll. He didn't even want to know how they got more quirks, he might not like the answer at all. With a huff Izuku began to stalk onward, more than ready to finish this with a Nova bomb, he was more than done with the troop, see if they want to keep on fighting him when he atomizes their pet project. A mechanical sound was the only warning Izuku got before he activated blade mode and was able to react fast enough to move away of his attacker. Shock would be the only emotion Izuku would feel at the moment when he befell his attacker, and most because he was unable to recognize it at all. To begin it was lean, as Aizawa, with muscles that seemed to stretch the taut, green skin, some awful black pants. What shocked Izuku the most was the arms. The forearms and hands were in fact a pair of chainsaws, each teeth oozing some sort of black liquid. Then there was the face and the head. The head was nothing short of the lower jaw attached to the skull, an exposed brain from which two fly-like eyes jutted out, and a mouth that was bland, and the only way to see if it had any show of emotions. This thing looked like nothing he had seen ever. It was like someone had smashed things to see if it could work. Liquors looked more humane compared to whatever this thing was. It didn't look troop. There was a certain something regarding the troops bow and dolls uniformity. They fit there for a reason. This thing didn't seem to fit at all in whatever the troop used. Those chainsaws seemed to be familiar somehow. His thoughts were thrown away when the chainsaw monster charged at him, the rev of the chainsaw's arms, making Izuku take a decision. The creature sweep at Izuku, one of its chainsaw arms aimed at the transformed human, only to have it deflected as it met a pure energy sword, forming out of Izuku's right hand, the grinding of metal teeth making the doll to actually shut down its hearing receptors, that's why it never heard the second Nomu as it rushed at Izuku and even tossed it aside on its way. Izuku only had time to summon the sentinel's shield on his left hand so he could compliment Uranus as a second creature appeared, and this one simply unsettled him. Thin as a stick, again with the green skin that seemed to be stretched all over its body, the arms were longer than usual, with what seemed to be two protrusions coming out of the palms of its bony hands, the head, again was the more unsettling thing. Again with the exposed brain cavity, not overgrown like a liquor brain, as if someone took the skull there and simply cut the bone to expose the brain, the eyeballs were normal, or as normal as without eyelids, the mouth was the horrible thing, it seemed to be like a proboscis, one that had sharp needle-like teeth at the end, that moved like small gears within. Izuku immediately rose the sentinel shield when the second creature began to actually spit needle-like teeth at him, each teeth met the shield and broke into shards upon impact. But Izuku noted how hard those things were being fired. A direct impact would go through a person easily. With a growl Izuku rushed at the shooting creature, the creature rising its hand to meet Uranus. The blade instantly met what seemed to be bone coming out of the palm of the hand at great speed, and to Izuku's shock it had a surprising strength behind it. Narrowing his eyes, Izuku did a small parry moving the arm away and slamming the sentinel shield to the neck of the creature then focused on the chainsaw creature, rushing at him, Izuka thrust Uranus. The white energy blade was then blocked by the creature's chainsaw right arm, 
the sound of grinding metal and burning echoing on the forest. Izuka turned his head around, seeing the doll rushing at him. With a growl he activated his siren arms, each arm glowing an eerie green and instantly shot at the rushing doll. Beta actually stopped and jumped away as each arm began to pass by. Uff off, only to actually groan as one arm impacted the gut of Beta and be pushed away, all the while the skin and muscle began to melt the hardened skin and clothes, making Beta groan in what seemed to be pain as it damaged everything in the area. With that taking out for the moment, Izuka focused on the creatures still on lockdown with the chainsaw creature. Izuka reared his head and channeled the void, then headbutt the brain of the creature. The creature actually seized up in pain as the enhanced blow, then let out a screech off pain as Izuka slashed Uranus on one of the arms, cutting the bicep deep and exposing bone and marrow. With a snarl Izuka then kicked with all he had at the stomach of the creature. The sound of a crack was heard on the area as the feet met stomach and pretty much burned the stomach on impact and sending the creature to a nearby car. Then he focused on the one with the proboscis. The creature began to fire at Izuku, who simply rose his sentinel shield, each impact making a sound as the needles broke and disintegrated on impact. Izuku simply began his advance at a brisk pace, seeing his approach. The creature seized its attack and rushed at Izuku with its hand extended onwards. Thunk. Izuku actually blinked when he heard the sound of the bone spikes meeting the shield, and the surprising strength behind them. Like those things could easily punch holes on solid rock, yet this didn't stack against solidified void light, keeping his guard up. Izuku began to count the tempo of the attacks, and once he saw a pattern, began to bide his time. Then when he saw the pattern break, he struck. With a small glow, Izuka detonated plasma point-blank at the creature, this one actually taking several steps back after such general impact at everything, then roared in pain when Izuka slashed its chest, leaving a gaping gash on the chest, then he slammed the shield to the jaw of the creature, the crack of bone echoed all over the area. Alongside the roar of pain of the creature, one Izuka silenced when he rose Uranus and slammed it like a bat on the face of the creature, burning the proboscis and part of the face also affecting the brain. The creature stumbled in pain, Izuka there rushed at the creature, diminishing his weapons and gathering arc light on his legs, then jumped, aiming both legs at the damaged chest of the creature, and let loose. Boom! Pure arc light exploded upon impact, sending the creature flying and with a horrible wound on the chest, bone visible as muscle and skin was vaporized on impact. Izuka frowned at the wound, the creature had to be more dense than he imagined considering its skinny size, yet it was sent flying. Meeting three trees and breaking them each until a fourth one stopped its momentum, yet it met it face first, blood pouring out and leaving a bloody imprint upon impact as it slid down. Landing on his feet, Izuka then focused on the second creature, slowly rising up. With a small snarl, Izuka willed arc light on his right hand, summoning his arc staff and rushing at the creature. The creature lashed at Izuka with its left arm, chainsaw teeth leaving a dark trail of liquid behind, only for Izuka to activate blade mode and use the arc staff to slam the chainsaw by the joint, then moved away. To any spectator blink and you would see the creature now had a broken left elbow, smoking, while before it was fine and functional. Izuku, now on the offensive, twirled on his heel, then slammed the arc staff on the base of the back of the creature. The sound of bone breaking was music to his ears as he crippled the creature, yet the creature refused to go down easily. It still could move its arms, and began to flail them like mad, the chainsaws still working. Making Izuka keep a distance. Narrowing his eyes, Izuka took a deep breath. Fush R-O-D-H! The concussive force lifted the creature from its feet, while it flew away. Izuku began to rush at it, arc staff disappearing, but not the current of energy. With a yell he jumped as the creature stopped its tumble. Boom! The creature let out a roar of pain as its skin light on fire and a crater formed in its wake. Bone broke and blood vaporized on exit. The creature twitched, arc energy traveling around its body, causing more damage, before stilling, probably dead. Yet Izuku actually narrowed his rabid eyes, this creatures were so dense that not even a fist of havoc at impact didn't disintegrate them. 
either this ones were better made, or something was amiss. Izuku had little time to ponder this as something formed behind the fallen creature. Izuku jumped away as what seemed inky darkness began to swallow the creature. Looking at the other creature, the same was happening to the other, swallowed and being taken away. Damn traitors! Izuku heard the Beta utter in what seemed to be anger. Make no mistake Izuku Midoriya, Beta stated. Your fate will be a kindness compared to theirs. Beta snapped as its legs light up in fire and shot onward to Izuku. Blade mode instantly activated. Izuku's left hand latched on the neck of the doll. Two of his siren arms instantly struck the face of the doll, while the third latched on the arm. His right arm latched on the punching arm of the doll, while the rest of his siren arms went to the torso. Bam! Time resumed and the doll yanked by the sudden force addition. Then while having it in a chokehold, Izuku made it go closer to him, and reared his head in, then took a deep breath. I Z S L E N Nuis, and began to sustain the ice form shout. The doll tried to actually fight back with explosions, but those died as soon as it tried to use them. Beta's systems began to actually lag. One of the very few weaknesses dolls shared universally was the cold. Their energy source constantly outputted heat. As a result they required to vent excess heat, obviously cold worked for them, but a sudden drop of temperature was really bad for them. As their energy source could not compensate for the sudden drop of temperature, and not even being overheated could help them as their skin was also incredibly sensible to sudden drops of temperature, their optical sensors would fail them as well and their CPUs would actually freeze every single program going at the moment. That was happening right now as the doll was encased in ice and everything failed. Once the doll was encased on ice, Izuka simply tossed it aside. The ice would hold, for some time, but it would hold, just enough for him to start preparing his next attack. He crossed both his arms together in an X manner, bracers clinking together, and uttered one word. Universitas. The area turned black, before it light up like a thousand suns. Pixie jumped away as a fleshy arm passed by her, trying to punch her and cave her chest. Behind the owner of such limb, Gang Orca let out a powerful sonic-like attack, making muscular to actually girth his teeth in anger and pain. I'm gonna cave that skull open you fucker! Muscular declared, slamming both his hands to the ground, uprooting a concrete slab and tossing it at Gang Orca. The humanoid orca simply weaved past the piece of masonry and went into the offensive. Pixie, seeing an opening, slammed her hands to the ground. Instantly spikes came out of the ground, aimed at musculus already roided up and muscle-covered legs. Each spike meets its mark and sink deep, but she knows it's not enough. There is at least three layers of muscle covering the leg. Explains why he's also so strong and how he was able to kill a rescue-oriented hero team that normally tangles with things far worse than a guy with an attitude. Still he noted the wounds and turned to her, anger etched on his face, only to recoil as several bricks met his arms and torso at terminal velocity and a tire suddenly flew to him, the gum basically turning into glue upon impact and binding his left arm to his chest, the muscles trying, in vain to pry the glue-like substance from him. Pixie looked to the two offenders, somewhat glad one of them was a cop and the other was an actual priest. Both were covered in sooth and grime, and both were pissed. The cop snarled as he took another brick and tossed it at Muscular, this time aimed at the back of the knee. That made Muscular bend the knee. The priest simply took another spare tire. Grabbing it with both hands he began to spin and tossed it. The material turning into goo and enveloping Muscular's back and constraining his movement even more as the substance now was binding him to the ground. With a smirk, Pixie created a pair of dirt-like knuckle dusters for herself, more reminiscent like gloves than anything else. But like Izuka said, her body would not handle full-on gauntlets. Better compromise by make a pair of gloves with pointy ends at the knuckles. With a snarl she jumped at Muscular and cracked his right cheek right at the bone, with a rock-encased fist. Crack. The sound of pain of muscular was music to her ears, especially if it was coupled with the sound of broken bone, yet she wasn't satisfied, so she clocked him in the jaw with the other fist, making his head jerk upwards, only for Gang Orca to slap his head by the ears, making him disoriented, 
then knee him on the back of the head. Their pixie's fist was waiting for his nose. Crack. It broke against her fist, making him cry in pain and try to pump his quirk into overload to try to escape. Pixie jumped away, seeing the muscles bulge obscenely. This is Zuku had warned the pussycats about. There was no telltale of when Muscular would reach critical mass a point in which he would bulge with so much muscle to attack or defend himself, but there was a catch. Those muscle depended on how well his body could handle the extra weight. He could reinforce his leg muscles to weather the weight, but one thing was his muscles. What about the bones? Izuka pretty much told them that if that ever happens, it's all about making Muscular take a sharp turn, anything to put stress onto his already stressed bones. That was why he was so big to begin with. So when he tried something like that his body could, in theory, take it. But there was also the back draws no one mentioned, incredible strength but at the cost of mobility. There was no question he could greatly accelerate his attacks, but he could move as fast as he wanted. Was his reaction time that fast? Was his body able to handle such violent reaction? What was his fuel for such augmentation of his own muscles? Those questions had been the basis for a strategy that he had made for them in the off case the monster called Muscular ever attacked, or they were to actually hunt him down if given the option. The beauty of this, any member of the team could apply this as long they had the means to, Mandalay could, so could Tiger and Ragdoll, but herself was the most adequate for the task, her ultra-offensive quirk would permit her to attack Muscular and pretty much bleed him slowly, his muscles had a limit. With her quirk she did not. Then there was the obvious weaknesses he pointed out. He could not reinforce his face with muscles. That was an obvious weak spot. He was susceptible to sonic-based attacks and heat, and cold-based attacks. Burn the muscles or freeze them. Force him to keep making muscles and make him desperate. Which he was now, trying to force his muscles to tear the goo apart. Muscular by his part screamed, Screamed in anger as he tried to force the goo from his body. Forcing his body upwards he screamed and trashed in anger. Every time his trashing got more violent, and his screaming more psychotic. Then he reached for one of his muscles and yanked. Pixie actually looked in horror as Muscular tore his own muscles apart. The external muscles being attached to the skin got tore apart as well, and he twisted even more. Crack. Pixie tensed. So did Gang Orca. Muscular let out a yell of pain as he collapsed on his knees, pieces of his augmented muscles on his hands, skin hung on the strands. Then he rose his head and screamed in pain. There, Pixie struck, she slammed her hands to the ground, and forced all the dirt around Muscular to shoot at him. The first pillar broke his jaw. The second flattened his nose cleanly. The third broke the orbital and cheekbone on his left side where he had his prosthetic eye. The force struck him in the back of his head. Each pillar drew blood. Then Gang Orca struck. With a small yell he approached Muscular, a risk considering the reputation of the man, then grabbed him by the head, and unleashed a very powerful sonic wave point blank. Those ruptured muscular eardrums and knocked him at long last. Pixie panted, seeing the man down, the muscles falling out of his skin as he was unable to keep his quirk functioning. With a glance she motioned the priest to bind Muscular with his quirk. The man was of course kinda shocked by what had happened, but still did it, expanding the goo that formed a tire and binding the man. Okay, Sai, now we go for Moonfish, Pixie stated, looking at Gang Orca. By this point the others must know about him, but we still should be careful, he stated. Pixie nodded. Seeing how some fires began so subside thanks to the efforts of everyone, there was also the fact some pipelines, source of fuel for this fire seemed to be finally closed. At the very least, the situation had passed from critical to manageable. That, alongside the capture of this animal, was enough for her. At long last, the water hose, and many of his victims could rest well, he was taken care of. Aizawa drove the bus with the skill no man with the lack of sleep he has should be able to, especially with the lack of proper elimination, the high possibility of villain attack and the civilians on the back of the bus, also targets because why the fuck not. Also was the fact just about several minutes ago the forest lit up like someone had dropped the fucking sun and fed it all the nuclear waste in the world, 
then died of so said nuclear waste. Yeah he was kinda cranky, mostly because he had to use his capture gear to tie overhaul, who was constantly being rocked on the floor and hitting the chair's legs, probably aggravating his wounds further, honestly he could care less about the bastard right now. He had apparently killed Eri so many times for his sick twisted goals that her scars on her arms and legs were the only evidence that she had crossed to the other side too many times for any normal human being, before or after quirks, to be comfortable with, or sane. The fact Eri had summarily stepped on Overhaul's face and broken his nose, all while smirking like a cat might be a clue of her mental state, at least against Overhaul and the Yakuza in general, or anyone that might hurt her new family. Shaking his head he turned the steering wheel to the left, cutting a tree away, and there it was, home stretch, several black sedans parked, and looked like they had been exposed to, he dare say the wrath of the universe itself as the state they were, melted and fused to the very ground, the ground itself looked barren of life. Just white and black, and in the middle was Izuku, in his rabbit form and in dragon aspect mode. Aizawa immediately opened the doors of the bus while in motion, Izuku lost no time and actually entered the bus. While in motion, Aizawa closed the doors after that and then sped up. Izuku immediately turned human and looked at Aizawa. The troop had a doll that could use quirks. Izuku mentioned, Aizawa nearly lost control of the steering wheel, but kept himself composed as much as he could. They what? It was Inko who would ask that. Yeah, a doll with quirks, multiple. I recognize Bakuda's own. But it seemed enhanced to some extent. I also glimpsed two armor-based quirks and a creation like Quirk, that's four quirks in a single android, something that's not alive," Izuka stated. T-dolls are more like cyborgs, from I gather they do have some organic parts into them, their skin for example," Aizawa stated as he finally reached the road and began the 15-minute trip to Raxus. No skin would be able to withstand a direct hit of a hammer of soul or be bulletproof to such a degree," Izuka rationalized. How they did it is my concern, he stated. Be as it ma dash. Bam. The bus slightly moved, but windows from the left side of it broke and the metal bended. The kids cried in shock and Inko had to hold herself with both hands from a chair to not fall. Dropping her gun in the process, Izuka actually cursed, when he looked there, and shook his head. I can't believe it, I nuked that doll. Izuka cursed, Aizawa risked a look, and his eyes widened like the ones of an owl. Flying, actually flying on the side of the bus was a girl, a girl with bony arms and whose legs were letting a steady but huge stream of bluish flames coming from its feet, and what seemed to be exhaust pipes jetting out of its calves. Then he saw the face, and he actually turned back to the road, the damn thing had no face, it was just a skull and some patches of skin attached to it, and obviously melted. Problem child deal with that, Aizawa commanded. I don't know what else to do, I hit it with Universitas at point blank. Izuka actually was panicking, honestly Aizawa could not blame him, he had seen what Universitas could do, or at the very least the aftermath, twice, once on training, the other tonight, it was the kind of technique he used when he wanted something deader than dead. Kid Aizawa began. When a hero sees an obstacle, they don't despair, they don't circle the obstacle, they beat the obstacle down. Aizawa reprimanded. It's already on its last legs, so go there, fight it, beat it, and show the troop why it was a bad idea to pick a fight with you, he commanded. Izuka simply looked at the man, and slowly smiled. Thanks, Aizawa-sensei, Izuka uttered softly, before he turned and actually rushed to the doors. Then he was enveloped in flames, and shoulder charged the door out, jumping out of the bus, wings of fire emerging from his back and transparent looking wings emerging from his lower back, and then he shot at the flying doll, a hammer of soul in hands. Beta by its part turned to the new, old, threat and tried to fight. Bam! Only to have its skull nearly caved in by the hammer of soul, the impact forced Beta to skid into the ground, sparks flying as metal met concrete. With a mechanical snarl the doll forced itself upwards, the legs keeping the stream of explosions to propel itself upwards. Izuka simply followed the doll in its damaged state, shredded the clothes it had left, exposing its back, 
Immediately a glow began to emerge from its shoulder blades. From there two cannons emerged, each with its own munitions belt, and turned to face him, cannons now aimed to him. Izuka tossed the hammer to the doll, all while the doll fired the first shot. Boom! Fire rained as the doll began to fire. Izuka began to weave left and right, dodging every shot, each attack was telegraphed. The cannons fired slowly and you could tell when they would fire, so a quick application of blade mode kept him ahead of the attacks. Still he knew he could not keep on dodging. With a snarl he summoned a dawn blade on one hand and the siege maul on the other then flew onward. The doll shot, Izuka Icarus dashed to the left. The doll fired again, Izuka Icarus dashed to the right, and now he was in range. He swung the siege maul first, the doll rose its damaged arm to block the impact. The arm was cleanly broken, exposing the bone and white blood. With the damage dealt, Izuka Icarus dashed one more time, this time onward, Daniel Blade aimed to stab. The doll seized as the searing hot blade met the gut and cut the spine. The legs began to fail and the explosions died out as the legs went limp. Izuka didn't give it a second thought, his siren arms appeared and seized the doll by the shoulders. Then they began to punch with increased brutality, all while Izuka guided the doll to the ground. Beta by this point was trying to fight back in any way it could, only for its struggles to be rewarded by meeting the ground and being grinded into it brutally, the cannons on its back being destroyed by the impact. Sparks flew as skin was basically grinded and Izuka continued his assault on the doll, but he knew he had to end this fight now, this thing could not continue following them. He could not risk his mother and Ares' safety, the town's safety. The town that got destroyed be the troop just to get to him. Angrily Izuka motioned one of his siren arms to reach for the free one of the doll, and with a snarl, Izuka yanked. The arm gave away easily, the skin gave no resistance after Universitas. But Izuka wasn't done, tossing the arm away he began to lift up, then once he was sufficiently airborne, began to heat up his body igniting and causing the doll to begin trashing against him. This was only a theory that Mandalay had brought up, it should be possible for him to mimic other supers with the other elements, Nova Bomb, but with solar attributes, Golden Gun, but with Void attributes, the limit was of course if he could actually do it. Well, he was about to perform the first solar warp. With a growl Izuku ignited, remembering the feeling after using Inferno, he let out a discharge of solar energy all over himself. The blast enveloped the doll that continued trashing around as the fire blast enveloped it, then stopped trashing as the bones simply charred under the intense but short blast of solar light. Once it was over Izuku surveyed the doll, it was nothing more now than a blackened skeleton with somewhat chromed ends, it was still moving. Izuku let out a second solar warp. The doll stopped moving altogether now completely blackened. With a huff Izuku tossed the doll to one of the rock walls and got embedded into it, not moving at all. Snarling Izuku then flew back to the bus, job done. Three minutes later the doll began to glow, then was enveloped in a dome of pure lighting, then vanished, taking a chunk of the rock with it. Its mission a complete failure. Moonfish hated to do this kind of things, destruction when there was so much meat around. So much distraction, the fire didn't bother him. He had learned so long ago to zone out that kind of distractions, the weather? An inconvenience to him. Heroes? More meat. Civilians? More meat. But when there is a mission, those are distractions. More so now that the mission had gone to hell and back. Yet he had a mission kill, simple as the. Moonfish let out a grunt of pain one of his teeth shooting to his back and trying to hit whatever had hit high. This time his jaw felt the impact, this time more teeth extended and searched for the target of his new obsession. Tiger for his part kept using his quirk, moving at impossible angles and dodging death blows that no other hero would be able to dodge, but him, this was a perfect way to test his training. With a subtle move of his hand, two cops took knees aimed their guns at Moonfish, all while the villain continued his attempts to hit the fast-moving tiger. With another move of his hand, the trap was sprung. A civilian, he hated using one, 
lifted his right hand, fire around him slowly gathering to his hand. Once he had enough, he clenched it, then with a huff he tossed it, now a marble, at Moonfish exposed back. Moonfish never felt the marble, but he did felt the fire once the extra fragile marble broke on his back, enveloping him on fire and making him scream in pain. With his arms bind the way they were, he had no way to actually put himself out, and panic had set in. With a nod, both cops then took aim, and fired, each shot meeting their mark, Moonfish legs. The villain slash cannibal fell to the ground, while on fire, there he began rolling in both pain and anger. Once he saw the fire was going out, Tiger jumped into action, before Moonfish could react, and on his chest, Tiger's fist met the back of his cranium, his entire front now being subjected to the unforgiving ground. With a crack, Moonfish fell, defeated and burned. Sighing, Tiger motioned both cops to reach the villain, suppressor handcuffs already ready to bind the criminal and suppress his quirk. Looking around, Tiger actually rose an eyebrow. The area where they found Moonfish was far from where he was first seen. It seemed he had been looking for civilians to kill, so he rationalized that maybe they were in the entrance of the town. Which might explain right now why he was seeing the bus Aizawa drove a month ago heading their way. The bus in question stopped once it reached him, and Tiger could see a massive imprint of something on the left side of it. Something had crashed into it. Then Aizawa disbanded the bus, followed no far by Izuku Inko, Arian, the fuck's coda doing here? We got attacked, Aizawa supplied, seeing the cop's handle. Is that Moonfish? Aizawa wondered, looking at the infamous death row cannibal. Yeah, got news that Muscular was around as well, but go handled by gang Orca and Pixie. Tiger stated, seeing how Izuku scowled at the destruction he was seeing, the fires, he could see arc streams forming on his hands by sheer frustration. It didn't take a genius to put 2 plus 2 in this situation. This all had been a distraction, one that failed, considering that they were here, and his attackers were not. No matter, Aizawa dismissed the news of Muscular being handled by Pixie and Gang Orca and focused on Izuku. Problem child, ice form on those fires, drown them! Izuku simply nodded as he approached the fires and began to use ice form shout on them, the fires instantly being encased in ice. Tiger noted how much power he put behind those shouts. He was venting on the disaster, basically. The only thing that could take his power and not complain one bit about it. Fuck, Tiger cursed, focusing on Aizawa and Inko. Take the bus to the street, back to that road, there is a relief center. Mandalay is there alongside Ragdoll directing the rescue efforts. Go there and see if you can lend some help. Aizawa nodded, so did Inko. Yet he noted how her gaze focused on her son and his continued assault against the fire. Sighing she mounted the bus and moved, all while her son continued helping. She noted that he was crying all the way until he was out of her sight. Two days later. Someone want to explain to me how this happened? Ryuki wondered, the dragon-themed heroine was in one word, frustrated, and it wasn't for no good reason. Two days ago Raxus Town had basically been a target of a terrorist attack by the troop, in what many assumed to be a retaliation for the loss of so many bases and outposts in Japan in the past month. When the heroes went there and Rukyu had went to the Pussycats compound nearby, the reality had been revealed to them. It had not been a retaliation, it had been a distraction. One that failed, if you wanted to be pragmatic about it. The town was a disaster, no doubt about it. There was a hole where the fire department and the gas company that managed the natural gas of the town used to be. The loss of life was absurd to say the least. Many companies had already solidarized in the effort to rebuild the town, philanthropists and the likes. Nothing could erase the fact the town had been a collateral, an acceptable target in order to get to their real target. We didn't expect this to occur. Thirteen stated, being a rescue hero, Thirteen was expected to be on Raxus, not here, on a conference. But honestly, by the time heroes had arrived, half the town fires were now the prettiest and creepiest ice sculptures known to man. Ryukyu was no stranger to ice users using their ice to fight the fires. Never before she had seen ice sculptures made out of fires. 
Well it happened, now someone explain why the fuck two motherfucking villains were doing at that time there? Mirko snapped, pacing around the room like a caged animal, villains she could beat without a second thought, disasters of this magnitude? Those were on a different scale, those she could not kick to near death. Well, it seems the troop extended their operations in order to get to their targets. The head of the HPSC stated over video conference, looking rather tired by the look of things. No one did to be honest, especially with what we found on the compound of the pussycats. Yeah, Mirko muttered, rather perturbed. Yakuza and the troop actually going to war for a singular price, or prices, yet we found very few Yakuza compared to the number of Baos found dead, and what the kids said. Mirko stated. Bao with quirks, T-Dolls with quirks, fucking kids started an arms race without even knowing it. She added with a snarl. Ryukyu and Thirteen remained silent, but the words or Mirko rang true. Before the troop was content with using bows without special abilities aside the ones they had, no quirks, same with T-Dolls, those things were robots, cyborgs, nothing special about them aside the fact they were the closest thing the world would get to actual Terminators. Thick Austrian accent aside. But now, the autopsy of the nemesis found on the hot springs proved that the troop had jammed quirks into that things and DNA samples and profiling showed to whose those quirks belonged to. One to a wanted criminal that was probably going to get the death penalty for aiding a known terrorist organization and murdering several pro-heroes before his initial capture. The second belonged to a teen that was too serious for his own good and took classes in kendo to practice safety for his quirk. The third belonged to the father of the target. All three were confirmed to be alive, the third one not so much if the wife finds about what he has done after some investigation. Then there was the doll, little of it could be recovered, compared to the other three dolls, devastated and destroyed by Midoriya, unable to be retrieved, their remains were already sealed and en route to Ireland, the first full dolls to be sent to the island, while well, mostly, Midoriya had not pulled punches against them. They looked like if a bear on steroids had mauled them. The last doll, they could only find two arms, one charred beyond anything to be used, the other looked mummified and melted, still they were sent to Ireland, they had the facilities to deal with this, at the same time sending them copies of the data caught in their bases. They had found where Midoriya had stamped it, there was a circular hole where it should have been, meaning this one survived Midoriya, an achievement considering the devastation seen in the compound. A silence set on the conference, one that was broken by Sir Night Eye, the last member of the conference. Regardless of the actions of the troop, this shows something they had not ever shown before, Night Eye stated. Yeah, like? Mirko wondered. Fear, was his simple reply. They know that if the Midoriyas confess during the trials, it will mean the end of their operations here. Not only that, we have found that they have ties with villain organizations all over Asia thanks to the files we have gathered. The Midoriyas will deliver the first stroke. It will be up to us to deliver the killing blow. He added, and they know it. This is desperation. A pity that all this progress is aimed for destruction rather than creation. But once we have them dismantled, we can use their knowledge for good, real good. He added, but for now we have to focus on attacking. He snapped. They will try to use this as a way to regain momentum. We must deny them that. We must double our attacks against them. Were they on their knees before? They will be bleeding and on their faces by the time we are done with them. We must press onward. No mercy given. Just like they have denied their victims that. Night Eye stated. It was a sentiment everyone shared. Night Eye, Ryukyu began. What about the kid? How's he taking this? The destruction of a town because they wanted to get to them. Naitai remained quiet for five seconds, then looked at the dragoon heroine in the eyes. Bad. Izuka cried, cried hard, before he had been angry, oh so angry that his shouts simply reacted to his anger, to his indignation. Yet he felt powerless, despite all he did that night, he felt powerless, he felt like if he had done nothing right that night, just messing every time. He didn't note it when his mother entered the room it had been assigned to him a small police hideout while they prepared to leave Japan for the next month. He didn't notice when she sat at his side. 
He noticed she was in the room when she hugged him and let him cry on her shoulder. Izuka clung on her form desperately. He knew he had done all he could. He had been the reason half of the fires in the town had been put out and routed to the point the rescue crews that arrived could handle the rest without issue. He knew he had been the reason his family was alive and not in the morgue. He knew he had done all he could that night, that he had fought with everything he had and had sent a message to everyone that dared attack his family again. This would not stand. Yet, he felt so weak at the moment, despite all the power he had now, all he had, he felt so weak. Did All Might ever felt like this? Did any hero felt like this before? He just cried, cried angrily, he felt so hopeless. He wished. He wished. He wished. He wished he never got his quirk at all. And that's a wrap, my legendary gaming crew. Can you believe how far we've come? But don't hit pause just yet, because there's more pixel-powered awesomeness on the way. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and stay connected for future episodes of What If Deku Has Video Game Powers? Before I go, let me extend a huge thank you to each and every one of you for joining us on this extraordinary adventure. Your support and enthusiasm make it all worthwhile and I can't wait to see where this journey takes us next. So keep gaming, keep dreaming, and remember that heroes are not just born, they're made through courage, friendship, and the power of pixels. This is Kronos, signing off, but not for long. Stay heroic, my friends, and see you in the next pixel-powered episode.